Good morning and welcome to our online convention 2021. I'd like to introduce RSGB President Stuart Bryan, G3 YSX, to tell us a bit more about the day. Yeah, thank you, Steve, and welcome everyone to the second RSGB online convention. It's with some sadness that we're holding this event online um, because we, we all welcome the face-to-face -face contact that we have when the event is in person. However, if we manage to reach the 3,500 people that saw this online last year from 24 different countries, we will be delighted. The challenge is for next year, because next year we're going to have to have a hybrid event that enables both the people who, who like to meet online and also the many, many people who uh, can only attend the convention through the techno internet technology. We're here today at the RSGB National Radio Centre, which welcomes thousands, tens of thousands of people to uh, through the door every year and introduces them to amateur radio. Now the NRC is part of a museum here at Bletchley Park, um, which reminds people about the some of the important contribution that amateur radio made to European history. Yes, but amateur radio itself is not a museum. And whilst we need to make space in our spectrum and our publications for people who want to continue to use traditional modes and, tradi do, and do amateur radio in traditional ways, we need to also move forward to develop new techniques uh, and experiment with new methods and learn more about the science and uh, engineering of, um, of radio communications. A huge amount of spectrum is, in, uh, is invested in us, worth a lot of money, and it is only by moving amateur radio forward and doing new things that we can justify that. This is illustrated very well by the work that Catherine Mitchell, M0IBG, is going to talk to us about, where she integrates amateur radio into her professional research. And I'm really looking forward to seeing Catherine's talk. We've got two live streams running throughout the day, and we're trying to, to mix in uh, interesting and um, new topics for both experienced and for new radio amateurs. Yes, and, and I hope that everyone, regardless of experience and competence, um, learns something new today. They learn something that, that, that inspires them to go away and try new things. By working together, we increase the pool of knowledge about uh, amateur radio and wireless uh, technology, and, 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 and that leads to new developments, which is exciting for everyone. Now, normally, Stuart, we run the construction competition here at the convention um, and we award the prizes at the end of the convention normally, but this year it's going to be a little bit different. Can you tell us something about that? Yes, last year we experimented with a virtual construction competition and we're doing the same this year. Details will, uh, will, will be published um, soon, but, the, but, but basically we want people to have the opportunity to build things over their Christmas uh, break mm -hmm. and uh, to present them to us um, via the internet um, next year. This will allow lots of people, uh, many of whom can't get to the convention, to take part in this important event. Amateur radio construction is really important to amateur radio and, and it covers not just physical construction but also software and systems and uh, other forms of engineering and we encourage people no matter what uh, they regard as construction to take part. And I, I really look forward to seeing some of those projects. Returning back to the convention now Stuart, what part are you going to play during the rest of the day? 
Uh, well, sometimes during the day I'm going to be using the facilities here at the NRC to use the President's call sign GB4RS. And I look forward to talking to members and non-members, fellow amateur radio uh, enthusiasts, around, about um, whatever uh, we want to talk about. Now, at the, at the NRC will be also using our usual call sign GB3RS, so there will be a unique opportunity for people to get both call signs in the log if they want to. Um, throughout the day, we'll be announcing what frequencies we're using, probably on the DX cluster and certainly on the social media channels. Now, while uh, everybody gets their coffee ready, Stuart, what else do people need to know about the day? Well, firstly, everything that all the talks today will be re are being recorded, and uh, there will be an opportunity to catch up with any that you missed for any reason on the RSGB uh, YouTube channel. Uh, this is a huge archive of material that uh, I hope uh, people will explore if they haven't already done so. Uh, by putting the talks on the YouTube channel, if there's anything you want to refresh your mind on when you try some of these ideas in your own shack, then you, it's available to you. If 20, October 2022 is too long to wait for more of this, then I'd like to remind everyone that the popular RSGB Tonight at 8 series will continue to run, uh, and there, that is also um, archived. Before I close, I would like to thank the speakers who have uh, put together uh, their talks for today. I would like to thank the production team who have volunteered their time to put this, uh, this uh, streaming event on, and I would also like to thank the RSGB staff who put the program together. I'll be back at the end of the day to talk to you uh, again, and meanwhile, um, please enjoy the convention today. Well, thank you very much, Stuart, and as uh, Stuart said, we'll be hearing more from him later. Uh, also, as he said, the RSGB Convention Online is about to get underway and uh, just under an hour from now, just before 10 a.m. UK time, we'll split into the two streams. Uh, one hosted by David, G7URP, that's the introduction to stream. And I'll start with Dan McGraw, M0WUT, offering hints and tips to improve your soldering skills. I'll be hosting the Learn More About stream where first off, Alan, EA3HSO, will be sharing his experiences of an IOTA de-expedition to the Arctic, uh, Prince Carl Forland Island, to be precise. Now, if you have any questions for our speakers today, feel free to write them on the YouTube chat facility. We'll do our best to pick them up, up and uh, depending on time available, put them to the guests on your behalf. So get them in early if possible. And it would be nice if you include your name, call sign and your location as well. So it's time to meet our keynote speaker. Professor Catherine Mitchell, M0IBG, is a multi-award winning scientist and the academic director of the University of Bath Doctoral College, whose work over the years has offered a completely new perspective on the Earth's ionosphere in response to extreme space weather. And as radio amateurs, most of us are interested in what's going on in the ionosphere. We'll meet Catherine live and put your questions to her. As I mentioned just now, you can write them on the YouTube chat facility. And that's after her presentation, Radio Technology and Space Science, a perfect partnership. Many of you know I'm a professor at the University of Bath, but I'm a newcomer to amateur radio. I've been a radio scientist for all of my career, but I only came across the amateur radio community in 2015, and I felt really challenged to understand radio from a different perspective. I took the amateur radio course and I obtained my call sign in 2016. My talk will start with an introduction to the space weather environment, and then we'll go into some connections between radio and space science. I'll talk about some recent work where amateur radio and citizen science are adding great value to the observational data that we have and to the scientific community. I'll also talk about how people can get involved I've had the privilege to work with some really interesting and inspiring students over the years, and I've caught up with some of them recently to get their perspectives to share with you. The people we'll hear from later on are Zama Katamzi Joseph, Talini Pinto Jayawardena, and Chris Deacon. Zama is a research scientist at the South African National Space Agency. 
She researches into the Earth's ionised upper atmosphere and is interested in dynamical behaviour. Tallini is interested in the engineering aspects of space and radio. She built a space weather payload for a small CubeSat and has applied her engineering skills with navigation company Spirant Communications. And we'll also hear from Chris Deacon, who's an inspiration to many of us with his six metre work and his deep knowledge of sporadic e-propagation. All of them have different stories about how they came to radio or space science, but the commonality that shines through is their enthusiasm, as we'll see later on. But first, let's turn to thinking about space. This picture shows the Earth in space, and it depicts the emptiness in the 93 million miles between the Sun and the Earth. But in reality, there's much going on, with all sorts of interesting physics in that void. There are electromagnetic waves, light, yes, but shorter and longer wavelengths outside of the visible range too. Sometimes we have radio waves of varying frequencies that emit their energy in more intense and variable forms. They're called solar radio bursts. There's ionization in the form of charged particles, atoms and molecules that stream out in the interplanetary magnetic field. This visualization from the New Horizons mission to Pluto, created by NASA's Scientific Visualization Studio, presents a slice of the data through the ecliptic plane, the plane in which the satellites of our solar system orbit. Remember, Pluto is a bit above this plane, so they've projected it down into the ecliptic plane for the picture we're seeing. Three different variables are presented in this model, temperature, density, and pressure gradient, all simultaneously, but using the red, green, and blue color channels of the color image. I love this visualization. It reminds me of the starting titles to the Alfred Hitchcock film Vertigo. But what I find useful about the animation is the visualization provides a depiction of the outflow of the spinning sun, a bit like the outflow of spinning water from a water sprinkler. This is helpful because it explains part of the complexity that we have in the prediction of a big solar storm hitting the Earth. This next NASA animation shows a large solar storm event with coronal mass ejection of particles streaming through space and bombarding the Earth's magnetic field that shields us from a radiation storm. As the interplanetary magnetic field streaming out from the Sun encounters the Earth, the Earth's magnetosphere erodes on the day side and reconnects on the night side in a cycle that drives the magnetospheric convection and disrupts our polar regions. You can see in the animation the polar outflow of neutral atoms into the magnetotail and the precipitation of particles causing the aurora. The diagram is also useful to show more of the overall picture at the same time as we watch the movie. Now most of the amateur radio community will be very familiar with space weather because it affects our HF propagation. For example, the solar cycle effects on propagation that changes the bands that are supported for our HF communication. And this brings us to the all important topic of the onosphere, the bit of space weather that I'm most interested in. The onosphere is the ionized region of our upper atmosphere. It's where our atmosphere meets space at about 80 kilometers altitude and extends upwards to many hundreds of kilometers. It's the region of our atmosphere that lights up when we have the aurora. Right at the lower edge of the onosphere is a very interesting region that you can sometimes see in the late twilight in the form of noctilucent clouds. These ice crystal clouds are up at similar heights to the ionospheric E layer. There's more coming up on about the, the sporadic E layer later on in this talk. But for now, the important point is that there are traces of waves in the photograph that are indeed indicative of real atmospheric waves that drive into the lower part of the onosphere and they make it very dynamic and variable and they affect our communications. It's a very interesting region to study. 
but next we'll turn away from optical observations and back to radio. Ever since Sputnik in 1957, we've had satellite radio signals available to collect on the ground. It's estimated that there are now over 3,000 satellites in orbit, and we know that there are planned to be a very large increase with the financial cost of the access to space rapidly coming down. Most of these satellites are using radio links to communicate back to Earth, and in particular, the navigation satellites provide excellent signals to sense the onosphere. The diagram here shows the sort of coverage you can get with the radio signal shown in yellow and one of the radio signals from satellite to receiver highlighted in magenta pink. We'll look at that one in more detail now. Each radio link makes a separate satellite to ground path and the measurement itself is the delay of the signal propagation as it passes through the ionised region. Effectively, the more ionisation, the slower the signal travels. So if you can measure the time delay from when the satellite signal set off from when it, to when it arrives, you can work out the excess path time over and above what it would have been if the same signal had travelled through a vacuum. However, this is not quite so straightforward because the timing synchronisation you would need is very difficult to achieve between the satellite and the receiver. So there's another better way. If you have two radio frequencies, the lower frequency travels slower than the higher frequency. This is dispersion. And you can use this property to work out the total ionization along the path. The wonderful thing about this is that it allows for cancellation of a lot of the error terms. Now this brings me to how I entered this field of research. As a physics undergraduate in Aberystwyth, I was interested in mathematical puzzles and the topic of medical imaging was one such type of problem. Aberystwyth was pioneering a new idea that had been proposed by KCA in America to apply medical imaging methods to UHF VHF transit satellite radio signals to image the Earth's ionosphere. And I was lucky enough to win a PhD place to pursue that research, and hence I started my career in the new field of ionospheric research and experimental radio tomography. After I moved to Bath, it was becoming clear that the future of radio tomography was moving into ionospheric data assimilation and that we could use the new GPS signals. This picture shows us the sort of information that this can provide using GPS radio observations to image the 3D ionospheric electron density in the space weather Halloween storm of 2003. So that's my entry into radio science. Now we'll meet some others who came along different paths. I'm delighted to introduce to you Dr. Zami Katanzi Joseph. I first met Zama at a space weather school in South Africa. She came to Bath to pursue her PhD and then returned as a radio scientist to the South African National Space Agency. I asked Zama to share with us how she decided to study space science. I was actually exposed to the field um, when I was a teenager in high school and I watched the movies um, Armageddon and Deep Impact. Okay. And <laughs> astrophysics was so cool and it was vastly different from um, any of the careers that I was exposed to in high school like medicine, engineering and accounting. So that appealed to me that not only was I going to do something that was um, exciting but also very different to what my peers um, were exposed to. That sounds, that sounds really fantastic. And how did you actually get into radio science? Um, so I, I um, started in radio science when the, a new program in my country in, in South Africa was, um, was created to train the new crop of um, astrophysicists and um, space scientists. And the host of the university that hosted the program was actually the university where I did my undergraduate. And one of the courses that we were offered was um, radio science. And 
um, I related to it better and it seemed more applicable to me than um, the astrophysics side, which I was initially interested in, so that I decided to switch. We'll hear more from Zama later. The best known space weather event happened in 1859 and was documented by the astronomer Richard Carrington, who made the connection between sunspots, the aurora, and the magnetic field events on the Earth with what has become known as the Carrington event. This was the largest solar storm in modern history, although we now know that the Sun still puts out events of this magnitude because there's been several large events since that one. One in particular narrowly missed the Earth in 2012 as it was recorded on one of the stereo spacecraft. But back to 1859, from the New York Times on September the 3rd, 1859. There was another display of the aurora last night, so brilliant that at about one o'clock, ordinary print could be read by the light. The effect continued throughout this forenoon, considerably affecting the working of the telegraph lines. The auroral currents from east to west were so regular that operators on the eastern lines were able to hold communication and transmit messages over the line between this city and Portland, the usual batteries being disconnected from the wire. The same effects were experienced upon the Cape Cod and other lines. Of course, there are important applications to space weather where it affects our technology today. We can see weather by looking out of the window, but it could look like a beautiful calm day and yet a Space weather storm could be raging overhead. So we need other ways to monitor and predict space weather because it does have important effects on our modern technology. The major effects are on the power grid where transformers can be overloaded and burn out and where communication systems are disrupted. Radio amateurs know very well about radio blackout from solar storm events. But a recent paper highlights the complex vulnerability of our modern technology, where intercontinental optical fibre communication links have a vulnerability because of their electrical cabled power lines and repeaters. If these were taken out by a large storm, the loss of the major internet services would be at a severe risk and it could last for considerable periods of time. This is of interest and discussion in the community at the moment. My main area of interest has been on the effect to navigation services, such as GPS, Galileo and GLONASS, which are affected in multiple ways. Solar radio bursts were first found to affect GPS by Cornell University researchers in 2006. The effect is similar to radio jamming but this is direct radio interference from the sun and it affects the part of the earth that's facing the sun. And it can result in a sat nav having a temporary loss of service. Another important ionospheric effect is radio scintillation. This is the breakup of radio signals by diffraction and refraction, and it can result in both rapid amplitude and phase changes to the signals. Understanding these effects on navigation signals is really important. I caught up with expert Dr. Talini pinto Jawadina. She has applied her knowledge of radio engineering and electronics to the navigation industry, working at Spirant Communications on an Innovate UK knowledge transfer partnership. I asked her how she entered this field, and I asked her how training as a radio amateur has helped her. Um, I think from the very beginning, it was the uh, unknown and the mystery surrounding it. Uh, but I think I really got into space science um, when I first spotted Jupiter through binoculars during a school project. And I was amazed that I could actually see another planet um, through my own eyes. Uh, radio amateur course is very much focused on the RF communication side of engineering. And you can do it at your, at your own pace as well. Uh, the, an engineering degree would, be a, would cover a broader range of topics, 
and it will span for three to four years. So this is very much a focused uh, um, area in communications. And what was specifically really useful about the radio amateur course? Uh, what I found useful was, was that the course is very practical. So um, it helps you understand how a radio works, how to build or set up your own radio, uh, and also how the uh, different external elements like the ionosphere can affect a communication link. So it was this hands-on practical experience and applying it directly from what you learn into practice is, is what I really found useful. I also asked Spirant about the industry need for people with radio skills and how they can get started. And they said, we need more people like Tallini with a real interest in radio and with practical skills. We offer a range of different early career opportunities at Spirant from work placements and ways to gain in industry experience. Exciting career opportunities like internships, apprenticeships and graduate opportunities. At Spirant, there's an opportunity for everyone. Now, most people are going from a start as a radio amateur into a radio science career, not the other way around like me. So I asked Chris Deacon about his journey into amateur radio. There was just that fun in, in sort of making something work, you know, and that sort of appealed to me, just sort of press a button and the light comes on or whatever it is. But one of the kits there, uh, one of the sort of one of the circuits that you could make was, um, was a medium wave radio. And I remember doing that and playing it. I mean, I think the small kit, you had to plug an earpiece in and the larger kit, you had a speaker. Um, and that, and so that, that sort of, I mean, the interesting thing is that at school, I was more interested in chemistry when I was sort of in my early teens, but gradually over time became more into physics. Uh, and I think amateur radio had some part to play in that. Um, but then the, the sort of the community side of amateur radio comes into it. I had a couple of friends who were in my class at school. Um, I'm thinking now about 15 years old, something like that, 14, 15, 16. Um, and um, they sort of brought me along to the local radio club. And also there were a couple of local radio amateurs who lent me a receiver. Um, an old military thing um and that got me listening on the on the on the radio so i had the sort of classic um shortwave listener um introduction to um uh to amateur radio and i got my first license which was a, a class b license the g8 license no morse code in those days um when i was 16. um i well remember my first contact my friend lives in a tower block um, I was <laughs> up the, near the top of this towel block using his radio, um, and that was my first contact on, on two metres, I remember very well. Many of you will know Chris. Chris talked about his entry into amateur radio, but recently he's taken the step into applying his lifelong experience of radio to study details of sporadic E propagation using the six metre band. He's interested to find out whether the reflection mechanism is specular, like a reflection from a mirror, or magneto-ionic, where the signal is continuously being refracted by the onosphere. I became interested in how the signal gets from one place to another. That's the most interesting thing about radio to me. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, other people are different. Um, and, and the, the sort of miracle almost of a sporadic E signal that it just appears out of nowhere. Now, one of the things that I wondered about was, well, actually sporadic E signals are well known for varying up and down like crazy. They, they, they can appear out of nowhere, they can disappear um, within minutes. Um, and I, I came across a little bit of not, perhaps not thoroughly sort of rigorous research, but some various people talking about um, the effect of polarization on the signals that we receive. So that if the polarization is aligned with our antenna, we get a strong signal. If it's at right angles, um, we, we don't. Thanks, Chris. We now turn to look at another project where radio science is getting help from the amateur radio community. Sam Lowe was starting his PhD at the time that my research group were becoming connected to the amateur radio community. 
Sam was one of the students who started the amateur radio course with me. In America, the amateur radio groups work with the radio scientists in a group called HAMSI, which is led by Nathaniel Frizzle. This connection to HAMSI brought us a really interesting project for Sam's research. Sam's project is fascinating. It builds on the revolutionary advances through software radio and the internet, where it's now possible to record millions of radio links every hour across global networks. One of these networks, the weak signal propagation network, Whisper, was used by Sam. Sam looked at some of the frequencies that are commonly propagating between the United Kingdom and New Zealand. The question that Sam was interested in was to see how we could use whisper data for science and what it could tell us about propagation over long distances. In particular, we wanted to test the hypothesis that signals would be clustered around the terminator times. Sam and I worked alongside with Ben Whitfleet to investigate this grey line propagation phenomena. The figure shows the time of year on the horizontal axis and the time of day on the vertical axis. If you look at the solid shading, the pink colour is the UK daytime and the blue is the New Zealand daytime. The yellow is common daytime and the white is common nighttime. You can see when you look at the figure that the number of radio links from the UK to New Zealand are overplotted on the background. The results clearly show a terminator grey line clustering. This is all very good and it's what we hope to see. However, the really surprising result that Sam found was that the propagation in the opposite direction is not symmetric. So the New Zealand signals are received in the UK morning at sunrise, but they're not received in the UK evening at sunset. And we're not really sure why this is. This all led on to more questions as research often does. What we were able to find out was to confirm that the grey line times do indeed exist. So there's a clustering around sunrise and sunset. But of course, we don't know the full propagation path of the signal. What we know is the transmission point and the reception point. In the future, we want to investigate the full effects of the diurnal HF noise variation at either ends of the path. The PhD student who did this research, Sam Lowe said, my project started through Hamsai UK, an NERC responsored event to bring radio scientists and radio amateurs together. It's been very easy to access the whisper data which was collected at many year, over many years at multiple locations and multiple frequencies. This has been a tremendously useful resource for my research and I want to say thank you to everybody who's contributed to it. I want to end now with a big warm welcome to the community and a warm invitation to everybody to get involved. A hand over to Zama for her words first. My advice would be to actually talk to as wide um, a, a community as possible um, because space science is very diverse, um, not only in the topics that people actually research into, but also in its nature. So you have more theoretical people who maybe like thinking things in abstract or philosoph philosophical, and you had other people who are more um, like uh, analyzing data and, you know, trying to um, find, you know, explanation for what they're seeing in the data and more maybe hands-on people, more engineering type people who are more in instrumental. So if you talk to a diverse um, people, then you get to actually find out what each um, area of space science or radio science is all about and you get more information so you can make it a more informed decision. And um, I, I, I want to say to, um, to especially young people that 
Um, usually when you think about a scientist, you think about a, you know, a person who is more narrow-minded and only focused on their work. But actually scientists are very friendly and they like nothing better than, you know, um, convincing another young mind to join the field. So talking to, to them will be actually um, not only advantageous to the young person, but also um, to, to the scientist. I've personally found amateur radio to have a tremendous resource of technology, of knowledge and of open and friendly discussion. I'd specifically like to mention Steve Hartley, who was my teacher on the amateur radio course. But there are many others to whom I'm very grateful for their generosity, their encouragement and their kindness. Amateur radio offers an introduction to a huge range of careers that are underpinned by radio technology and communications. Whatever is your interest or your ambition, from radio tracking of migrating birds to next generation spacecraft communications, or even listening for extraterrestrial signals using radio telescopes. There's something for everyone in radio and opportunities for everyone to get interested in and inspired by it. I encourage you to join the community of radio amateurs. Now is the time, it's never too late and it's never too early. Get involved by collecting radio signals for Whisper or go and get some work experience at a local company and maybe they'll sponsor your degree or apply to university or for an apprenticeship. My career has taken me literally to the ends of the earth. This is me at the South Pole Station in Antarctica on field work in 2010. What a huge privilege and what a job it is. There's a lot of fun, hard work and satisfaction working in radio science. And as Zama said, it really does offer a range of opportunities. There's something for everyone, so please do get in touch. Combining a US amateur radio extra class license with a PhD from Stanford University in electrical engineering has permitted access to the world's most powerful HF transmitters, ISCAT in Norway, HARP in Alaska and Arecibo in Puerto Rico. That's from Paul Bernhardt. For me, one of the highlights of my radio career was operating a high power UHF space weather radar in Northern Scandinavia. With a transmitter with a 1.2 megawatt klystron, an 80 kilovolt power supply, big stuff. I even learned that you can move the 32 meter dish antenna by hand when the drive motor broke. That's Bob Meggs. I was participating to an examination for gaining a permanent position at INGV and they suggested to be prepared on the ionosonde. At that time, I thought to be a balloon sonde, similar to those used for atmospheric sounding. I enjoyed and still enjoy to work on polar sciences in the frame of Sun-Earth interactions and space weather and I participated to several expeditions in Antarctica and the Arctic. My favourite part of space science is collecting and seeing new data on the onosphere. That's from Alex Chartier. And for the past few years, I've been working with images of Saturn's auroras captured by the Hubble Space Telescope and Cassini missions. It's a privilege getting to see something so very far away and so different from home in such intimate detail. And I never take it for granted. And that's Joe Kinraid from Lancaster University, and both Joe and Alex went to the South Pole Station in Antarctica. And Joe adds, no call sign sadly, but I really want one now. And Larry Paxton from Johns Hopkins University. The thing I most enjoy about my job is the excitement, intellectual stimulation and fulfillment that comes from working with a diverse community to solve a challenging problem. Chris Budd, mathematician from the University of Bath. I've worked in radio all of my career since starting at Marconi in 1979, and I was a radio amateur before then. 
and I'm still active in amateur radio. I love the technical challenges that it poses and the way that I've been able to solve many of them using mathematics. Gemma Attrill from DSTL. I really enjoy working at the interface where science meets engineering. I'm continually learning. Phil Erickson from MIT Haystack in America. Radio science allows me to collaborate across the world on discovery investigations for issues that could not be more important to society. Space weather, communications and other environmental issues. Lucilla Alfonsi. What I like more is the interaction with students and early career scientists when they discover how multidisciplinary is our job, especially for space weather applications. Mike Hapgood at Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. Working with so many people across the world and at all working levels from the simplest jobs to some of the most distinguished people in our field, it's shown me the importance of diversity and of understanding other people's needs. Pierre Cilia from South Africa. Undoubtedly, what I enjoy most about my job in space science is the excellent collaboration and sharing of expertise and resources across space scientists, which has proven to be a great stepping stone in my career in this field. And with it, the opportunities it provided me to travel to conferences and to meet like-minded colleagues and to work with them. Chris Scott from Reading says, if I had to choose one thing, working with amazing people from all around the world, and Nathaniel Frizzle from Scranton in America. The thing I enjoy most is meeting and working with the many different fascinating people in the radio science and the amateur radio community. I think it's a great community to work with. And many of you will know Nathaniel as the Hamsai lead. And a radio astronomer, Carol Mundell, I love that, as a radio astronomer, I collaborate with brilliant radio scientists and engineers around the globe, transcending national boundaries and making lasting friendships, whatever the political climate of the day. And we end up with Paul Cannon from the University of Birmingham. The excitement of discovery, making a difference, teamwork, travel, and perhaps above all, friendship. Well, Catherine joins us live now. Catherine, welcome to the RSGB Online Convention 2021. And you'll have to imagine the huge round of applause you normally get at this point, I'm afraid. Uh, I've got some questions for you, but I'd like to start with one that's, that's a bit personal. I mean, uh, you've had your amateur license for a few years now, I think you said 2016. Away from your space research, do you actually ever go on and have a chat on 80 metres or chase awards or go in contests? That's a, that's a brilliant question, Jim, and I was expecting that somebody might <laughs> ask me that. Um, I have to say that um, I don't go and chat on, on, um, on, on the radio, and I'll tell you that I think this is a really good example of how it has something to offer for everybody. I'm quite a, um, let's say, quite a private person in some ways. I get a huge amount of input from intellectual stimulation, from reading, from from technology, from playing with technology, from interacting with, with, with people as well. But my real driving interest in radio is really the technology side. Um, and I think that one of the things I've massively benefited from in working with the amateur radio community is to actually understand the personal experience of people. And I'll give you a specific example of that. So we, all, we heard from, uh, from Chris Deacon and Chris is pursuing a, a PhD at the moment. Chris and I obviously have got to know each other through his um, sporadic e work. And one of the things that's, that's happened is that with Sam's work, when we were looking at those radio signals and looking at the times that those signals arrived, obviously, you know, a big database like, like Whisper can tell us the answer to when that happens. But actually, just a quick word with Chris. Chris was able to tell me, yeah, they come through in the morning from New Zealand, you know, just two minutes. The knowledge and the expertise in the community is absolutely phenomenal. 
Um, and I massively respect that. But um, but yes, I have. Let, let me just say I've got um, a few amateur radio friends who are determined that they're going to get me on the air. Um, so I think it is going to happen. Um, in particular, I can tell you that uh, that Bob Meggs, um, who you heard um, a quote from earlier, Bob Meggs, I think, has some some ambition to get me get me chatting. And I think I think it will happen. Definitely. Are, are, are you and Talini and, and, and Sam, are, are you rare in the scientific community to realise the value of uh, amateur radio, do you think? I think that it's um, it's something that had quite a divide about uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. So when I entered this field for my PhD, um, I didn't really know anything about amateur radio. Um, I mean, weirdly, the, one of the strangest things is that my father and my uncle were actually um, part of the uh, radio listeners uh, during World War II, the voluntary interceptors. And when I started my PhD, my uncle said to me, oh, you're going to study the heavy side layer. And I had no idea that it was called the heavy side layer. Um, so th there was this there's, there was this historical family connection to radio, which was which was very bizarre that I ended up because of my interest in really in mathematics and puzzles. I ended up in a field doing something actually very similar to what they did as, as, as volunteers um, when they were younger. Um, but I think that that generally in terms of where things are now, um, it's really all changed with the Hamsai work in America that's led by Nathaniel Frizzle, because what, what they've done over there and what we've really adapted here to start to do as well is to understand how valuable the amateur radio community resource is. Um, and also, it's not just about collecting the signals and using the, the data, that the depth and breadth of knowledge amongst the community is phenomenal because it's, it's not just, it, there is practical experience, there's amazing practical experience, but there's also, I think, um, deep technical knowledge because a lot of radio amateurs, of course, actually are professional radio scientists as well. So for example, my colleague at, um, at Leicester University, Mike Warrington, um, you know, many of you will know him as a radio amateur, also a professor of radio science. Um, so I think that, I think it's increasing amongst the younger people now that they start to realize the the value one of my students um Heba Elsele she she said to me that when she was doing her PhD that it was very theoretical but actually when she started to do the amateur radio course what she was able to do was to gain that practical confidence and it really fed back and gave her confidence in her work so I think it's increasing uh, you might be interested. We've, we've got to talk about the uh, Radio Security Service coming later in the day on the... Um, I'm looking forward to it very, very much. Yeah. I really am. We yeah. have, yes. Yeah, very much. Ian, uh, in, in Durham, 2E0INX, he said you, you, you mentioned the course for amateur radio. Uh, more details. You, I mean, you mentioned Steve Hartley helped you through that. That's right. So I, I was really fortunate. By chance, um, Steve Hartley, who uh, runs the course in Bath, um, Obviously, I'm, I'm in Bath as well, so I was lucky geographically to be to be in the right place to be doing the course. Um, I, I can tell people a little bit about the course from my experience. So there's there's three different stages. There's the, uh, the foundation, the intermediate and the, um, the full license stage. And the, the foundation course is really quite accessible, I would say, to everybody in the sense that you don't require a lot of technical knowledge to start the course you just you just need to be interested that's all just be to be interested um it was about 10 weeks and it was very stressful for me because it was very funny because there, there's me professor leading this research group in radio science and of course my phd students decided they would come on the course as well and the pressure on me um, to actually perform into the exam was quite high. It was quite funny. It was all it was all very friendly, um, but you know there was an expectation that, um, that if I was not to pass this exam, that I would never live it down. <laughs> so imagine, um, imagine. that was the first part. The intermediate part then started with some practical work. So we did some uh, some radio builds, some soldering to build some some some. Um, um, uh, I think it was a. Um, seven meter, uh, seven megahertz um, signal that we were picking up. So we built a, a, a simple uh, kit. 
Um, and then we started to really accelerate into some of the, the, the more of the technical knowledge about amateur radio. And then the final part was really very advanced. I have to say it's very advanced. It was very, very, very interesting. And I don't mean advanced in terms of too difficult. I just mean there's a lot, a lot of material, really fascinating, really interesting. And for me personally, as a, as a radio scientist, it was really interesting to see my own subject taught from a different way. And I learned so much about teaching from listening to, to Steve teach us about, because mm. the, the, the ways that you can explain things, the ways that you can understand them, um, and also to understand the interplay between the theory and the practice to happen very quickly with amateur radio. So if you're studying a subject in school or at university or technical college, you, you normally would have, you know, even maybe an entire module or entire course, which would be quite theoretical. Um, but with amateur radio, it's back and forth all the time. It's all about, does that really happen? Practical experience. And of course, the training that gives you, if you do this before you become a, a scientist or an engineer, the training that gives you in the field for real world systems is phenomenal. You know, that's, that's an expertise that's really uniquely found within, within this community. So I, I, would, I would thoroughly recommend it to people. Uh, I had a message from Rachel Sanders who said, uh, Catherine, uh, I was a physicist long before I was a radio amateur too, and I also, I'm not into operating, that's fair enough. Um, <laughs> now, Murray Nyman has given me a, a cue to what I thought might be a bit of a daft question to ask you. Uh, Murray says, uh, uh, please do transmit and warm up the ionosphere. And I was gonna, try and ask you a question about this for we know about the external influences on the ionosphere from the sun etc what about from this side um because i had a friend who said to me during the current doldrum well previous doldrums on, on the bands um oh the ionosphere is not doing very much because all the shortwave high power shortwave stations are closed down and then nobody's heating the ionosphere anymore is is there anything in that yeah, the, 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 this is, and now let me just start by saying, this is something that I have, I started entering this community and I always start because I'm really an experimentalist. Um, and I always start on the basis that if people tell me something, it's probably true. Okay, that's where I start from. So I start from that and then I think, okay, let's look into it in more detail. I don't start from dismissing things because as a scientist, you look for the evidence. So. In terms of what are the effects of the HF signals on the ionosphere? Well, we look at the ionospheric heaters. So one of the uh, people I spoke to in preparation for this talk was Paul Bernhardt in America. And he works a lot on the HARP facility up in Alaska. And the HARP facility is a big high powered radio facility effectively called an ionospheric heater. And so the term heating, what it does is it pumps RF energy up into the ionosphere and then you can create irregularities in the ionosphere. So you're actually modifying it using this ionospheric heat. There's another facility up in uh, Tromsø in Norway does, does a similar type of thing. So yeah, absolutely true that the, you know, the, the radio signals that you send out will have an effect in the ionosphere. Now, the question then is, I guess, how many radio amateurs would need to be uh, on air at one time to actually have a measurable effect. There's a great scientific question. To, and how closely do they have to be packed together? You know, can you can you citizen science create something like like HARP? I don't know. Really, really interesting questions. Um, and that's the sort of thing that. So when you say you started off by saying, I'm not sure if this question is really you know sensible. You start to explore the question and you lead to a really, really interesting scientific question. And then you can start to think, well, how could we measure that? What could we do? Um, it's incredibly difficult with the onosphere because the onosphere is such a live beast. It's always doing something. So it's affected by the waves coming from below. It's affected by, by the space weather from the sun. Um, so actually teasing out the effect that was would be coming from the, from the radio amateur signals um, would be would be a big challenge, but and um, you know we like challenges. Maybe we should all get together and organise a day or something, uh, <laughs> and then send you all our uh, all, all our information. Catherine, our, our time is up. I'm very very sorry, but thank you so much for taking the time to give us that uh, fascinating insight into the links between radio and space research. We really do appreciate it, and so you're welcome to stay and watch the proceedings. 
But if you've got research to be done, of course, all the streams will be <laughs> available later in the day. But thank you for now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, in a moment, it will be time to make a choice. You can stay with me for the Learn More About stream or join David, G7URP, over on the Introduction to stream. And if you set up both channels on the RSGB YouTube site, then we can flip between them during the day. On the Learn More About stream, the one I'll be hosting, Alan, EA3HSO, will be sharing his experience of an IOTA de expedition to the Arctic, followed at 11 o'clock by Andrew Barron, ZL3DW, and his presentation about software defined radio. If, though, you're watching on the Introduction to stream, Dan McGraw, M0WUT, is about to offer hints and tips to improve your soldering skills, followed at 11 by portable operating from the or portable operating for the terrified with G0POT. So during the day, while we're setting up the guest speakers, uh, like last year, we'll be dropping in live to the National Radio Centre at Bletchley Park. Steve Thomas, M1ACB, will be there to fill us in on the activity, which today will find not only GB3RS on the air, but also the RSGB president, Stuart Bryden, will be airing his honorary call sign gb 4 RS. So in fact, while Rob and Dom from Camhams are setting up the links for our first guest, let's go there now and see what's happening on air. So may, may, may it long continue. Anyway, I won't waffle any more, Diggy. Good to hear you. I'll give you a shout sometime on Skype. Maybe we can have another natter then. Uh, but leave it go for a while. So I'll put it back to you, John. G4XGT, GH, I'll just be listening on the side. Looking forward to any pictures that may come along. Back to you, John. Yeah, okay, Dave. Well, lovely, lovely to hear you, mate. Nice to know everything's going along okay. And, uh, Dicky, you're going to revamp the kitchen? Oh, God. They are, well, I mean, kitchens are a lovely project, aren't they? That keeps you busy for about five years. <laughs> it's just, a, I want to say, catastrophic. Uh, a lot of people don't appreciate what holds when you start tearing a kitchen out. It's like doing a heart transplant in a house, you know. Everything's got to come out, everything. Um, yeah, I've done that a few times. Um, not easy. Um, I've done it quite a number of times because, you know, well, you rip the kitchen out and you're, you're faced with this dilemma of uh, maintaining the service um, uh, to some level, you know, uh, while everything is literally torn out, uh, where the water, electric, gas, everything's off. So you've got to get it back on again somehow. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to the RSGB convention. Uh, each year we bring together professionals, amateurs, begin, uh, beginners, experts, staff and volunteers to all share our passion for amateur radio. We start planning the convention as soon as the previous year finishes. Um, so we've been working on this for the whole year. And we really hope this all comes together for you today. We're here at the uh, RSGB National Radio Centre at Bletchley Park um, but the team bringing the convention to, together is actually spread all around the UK. Now, I, we've been working really hard to prepare the whole convention for you, um, supporting the speakers, putting the technology together, and we're absolutely certain that we've got a fantastic convention for you again this year. I'd love to be able to introduce all of the technical team who have been putting this together, but they are spread out all around the UK. Um, so they're, they're all busy trying to make sure that this runs smoothly, um, but I, I would have loved to have introduced you personally to all of them. But I'm going to mention some of them now before we get going today. So running the introduction to stream, uh, we've got uh, David and Tammy, they're in, in Norfolk, and we've got Graham in Suffolk, and Heather in Bristol looking after the YouTube chat on that stream. Then running the learn more about stream, we've got Rob and Dom in Cambridge, We've got Jim in Warwickshire, and then we've got John in Northern Ireland, 
and Elaine in Hampshire. They're looking after that YouTube chat channel. And then we've got Heather, our RSGB communications manager. She's in Bristol and she's overseeing all of the communications behind the scenes um, and all of our social media activity. She's also put a huge amount of time into preparing everybody for this convention as well. Um, now, here at the National Radio Centre at Bletchley, we've got, and if I just cut to this camera, hopefully, there we go, are we on that camera? There we go, we can see, uh, I can pan round here, we've got Dan, Martin, John, Lawrence is over there, we've got Stuart, the RSGB president, and Crassy there on the radio. Um, and we've also got Stefano and Ed and Richard are also our uh, volunteers for the day, or some of them over there. And we've got, uh, we'll have visitors looking in through the door during the day as well, because the NRC is actually open to visitors. Let me put that down, because that's heavy. Um, so we're going to see visitors through the door as well. Um, so if we see some, uh, if we get an opportunity to do some interviews as the day goes through, we'll do that as well. But we will definitely be on the radio. We're going to be on operating as GB3RS, as we always do from the National Radio Centre. But, but Stuart, the President, is also going to be operating GB4RS as well. So live on the air. Um, we'll try and put the frequencies up in the top corner of the screen um, when we come to that, but we'll also put the frequencies on social media and on the DX cluster as well, if we can. So we'd really love people to give us a call uh, as the day goes on. We'll try some interviews. Um, when you come back to us between the lectures, then I'll try and tell you a little bit about who we've been talking to, who we've seen through the door, but really today is mostly about the lecturers and we've got a fantastic lineup. I really want to thank all of those people, uh, Catherine Mitchell, the keynote speaker, and all of the other 14 different lecturers we've, we've got throughout the day, but also the people who've supported them, videoed some of their talks, helped them, edited videos. It's been a fantastic team effort. I really hope it all comes together for you on the day. But what we're going to do now is cut back to the radio audio Stuart and Crassie are going to start calling CQ. So if you want to work GB3RS, GB4RS, now's the time to give us a call. We'll see you later. CQ, CQ, CQ. Germany, all the way for Romeo Sierra. Germany, all the way for Romeo Sierra. Calling CQ and listening. Germany, all the way for Romeo Sierra. Germany, all the way for Romeo Sierra. Listening. CQ, 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 Germany, Bravo for Romeo Sierra, RSGB President Station from the NRC, calling CQ and listening. CQ, 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 Germany, Bravo for Romeo Sierra, Germany, Bravo for Romeo Sierra, listening. CQ, 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 Germany, Bravo for Romeo Sierra, Germany, Bravo for Romeo Sierra, calling CQ and listening. CQ, CQ, CQ on 80 metres from the RSGB National Radio Centre, Germany, Bravo for Romeo Sierra, listening. CQ, 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 Germany, Bravo for Romeo Sierra, listening. Sierra, listening. CQ, 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 Germany, Bravo for Romeo Sierra. Germany, Bravo for Romeo Sierra is listening. CQ, CQ, Germany, Bravo for Romeo Sierra. Germany, Bravo for Romeo Sierra. Our Shibi President Station from the National Radio Center in um, Bletchley Park. Uh, uh, transmitting uh, locally but listening on Hack Green. Germany Bravo for Romeo Sierra calling CQ and standing by. Mike Casero, Zoo Alfreco. Mike Casero, Zoo Alfreco. Mike Zero, Zulu Alpha Echo. Thank you for the call. Uh, Mike Zero, Zulu Alpha Echo. Thank you for the call. Name is Stuart, located in Bletchley Park. And this is part of the National Radio uh, RGB uh, convention from the National Radio uh, Centre. So uh, back to you, please, uh, Mike Zero, Zulu Alpha Echo. Okay, uh, uh, Mike Zero, Zulu Echo. The name is Henry Lakitchi, just Kempston in Bedford, not a million miles away. One of the uh, uh, volunteers over there also volunteered at a whole bunch of other places as well. Good for putting on the stage, very much. 
Thank you very much and thank you for helping out over at uh, the NRC. Uh, we're also on, um, on 20 metres, 14216, um, if you uh, want to try a ground wave over to there. From uh, Golf Bravo 4, Romeo Sierra listening. Golf 3 Radio X-Ray Queen. Uh, Golf 3 Radio X-Ray Queen, thank you for the, uh, the call. Uh, name here is uh, Stuart, and um, I am um, glad to uh, glad to work you for probably the first well for, for the first time under this call sign. So uh, G3 RXQ, uh, GB3 RS. Yeah, GB3 RS, uh, G3 RXQ. Very good morning, Stuart, and very good morning to everybody else uh, putting on the activity in the uh, the station and also on the uh, the YouTube videos, which I've just finished watching the introductory one. Uh, very interesting it was indeed. The name here is also Stuart, uh, same spelling, so uh, can't get that wrong in the log. And I'm in uh, North uh, Lancashire, um, on Cumbria, and um, at Yorkshire, about 10 miles east of Lancaster, and I'm with me. GB3 RS, G3 RXQ. G3 uh, RXQ, GB4 uh, RS. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart. Um, yes, I'm looking forward to catching up on the, the video. I didn't get to see the keynote, uh, but I'm really looking forward to hearing it um, later on. Um, from what I understand, it's very much uh, my own personal sort of preference, which is uh, the, the importance of amateur radio in the, uh, in the wider context, as well as, of course, supporting traditional, uh, traditional operating. So, thank you for the call, and uh, look forward to working you, perhaps under my own call sign, Golf for Yankee Sugar X-Ray, at a later date. 73s, a G3, RXQ, GB4, RS. Well, we'll leave uh, Stuart operating on 3733 on 80 metres. I just heard him on uh, my setup actually working uh, at ZAE there. Uh, hello, I'm Jim, G4AEH. Welcome to the Learn More About Stream, part of the RSGB Online Convention 2021. Now, the idea is that every hour we'll have different speakers on topics that range from IOTA D expeditions, HFD expeditions, and VHFD expeditions, not necessarily in that order, interspersed with software defined radio the role of radio in wartime, microwave engineering, how to have fun making your own microwave components, and one man's obsession with antennas. All details of today's presentations are on the convention page of the RSGB website. Uh, and if you're thinking of becoming an RSGB member, you'll also find details there. Soldering skills, ideas and tips from Dan M0WT, just about getting underway on the introduction to stream. Now, though, it's time for us to meet Alan, EA3HSO. If you have any questions for Alan, do write them on the YouTube chat facilities and please get them in early. We have loads come in for the guest uh, speaker, the keynote speaker, right towards the end. We couldn't fit them in. So try and get them in as early as you can. We'll do our best to include them. Uh, hola y bienvenido. Alan, uh, tell us, um, where, where are you in Spain as we as we speak? Hello, oh, I'm in uh, Barcelona in my uh, home QTH, my first home QTH, the other one is in Mallorca, but I'm here uh, for this month and a half. Uh, and I'm having a little bit of a problem because I either see the presentation or I see you. So I will switch to the presentation and share no. if that's okay. No worries, you don't need to see me, mate. That's that's no problem. Now, <laughs> Barcelona is an interesting place because if anybody else is like me, whenever I go anywhere, I'm always looking up at the rooftops to see if I can see any antennas. In Barcelona, it seems that every block of apartment seems to have a beam or a quad antenna on the roof. I have a, a few, I live in a in a five-story building on top of a hill in the upper part of the city. And I have a 15 meter high tower with a two element cubical quad, which is going to turn into a four element cubical quad. And the neighbors don't have a word. According to our law, uh, once the telco, like the R Ofcom, uh, decides that the project is engineerically, engineerly sound, uh, we get the permit and we do it. There's, a, there's no saying, even if you live renting which is not my case but if you are renting you still get the permit to put it in the communal roof 
Oh, we're so jealous, so jealous. Uh, I had to look at your QRZ.com entry, by the way. You've got some lovely Collins equipment uh, amongst all, yeah. the, uh, all the modern gear. Love that. Yeah, the modern gear is a little bit there. That's the flex and the 990, but uh, this makes a better background, always. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, you're, you're here to talk about the fact that you are a member of a de-expedition to a reasonably rare IOTA uh, entity in, in July, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing about it. Florida. Definitely, it, it was. Thank you. It was. It was kind of a, a surprise thing, at a, an unplanned thing, because uh, you know, after confinement and everything, I was really longing. Uh, 2019 was very active. I went to Pitcairn. I was part of BP6R and traveled a lot. Uh, radio related. I'm about to finish a movie, a documentary, a feature-length documentary about ham radio, uh, and I'm in the process of shooting the last scenes. Uh, so everything clicked, and I'm a good friend of Ken and Erwan, the two guys that started running this show, and I asked them if there was a place, and they popped me in, and it was a very fast thing. Uh, it, it started as an outing of uh, five uh, crazy uh, Norwegians, you know, like a weekend or week out in camping, and it ended up being a little the expedition uh, and a very fun one, uh, for us. So on this first slide, uh, you can see um, more or less where we were left in the middle of nowhere. Uh, this island, okay, I'm going to uh, wait a second. Okay. So um, we were uh, six hams, a hunter, a professional outdoors man, you will meet Ronnie, uh, and two huskies, two rented husky dogs. Uh, because this is in the middle of a uh, polar bear territory. Uh, the first thing that arrived in my hand, Ken sent me this fat PDF giving instructions on what to do if you met a polar bear, where to shoot uh, the signal flare for him to run. And, you know, I thought it was just like Scandinavian overprotection compared to, you know, I'm from Barcelona, I don't know anything. So, okay, I read the document and in the end there was a, a, a like a line to sign so the government would know that you read that. So uh, polar bears were a thing. All through the planning, we took the Hunter, two big high caliber guns, uh, the flare guns. We had 24 hours a day polar bear watch that we switched and shared with the Hunter anyway. So polar bears, we were going to polar bear uh, territory. Uh, Ken was the leader of the, the expedition. He was the one that started it together with Air One, LB1 AQI, and LA7 GIA. Um, then we had LA8 OM, Chris, a uh, very, very proficient CW operator, one of those machines. He just sits and blah, 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 goes. Uh, Rune, uh, <laughs> the soul of the, the expedition, uh, very, very experienced uh, old timer ham and have been uh, around the world because of his uh, work uh, experience. Uh, Germund, uh, he's been licensed for a year and a half, and he's already on Bouvet. He's like a, a fast one and very, very, very fun guy. And that's me. Uh, that's uh, courtesy of Ken. That's how he uh, pictures his friends. I'm after my polar bear guard and my CW run. I'm completely toasted and you will see why that's the only heated place we had for a week and this is ronnie on the left that's our hunter uh, hunter i mean he's an outdoors man but uh, he's the one that knew how to uh, manage the weapons and then you see fem and me five and nine are two husky dogs uh which turned into you know wolf dogs and they lost completely their their dignity the moment we arrived on the beach and they were like cuddly cuddly pets uh in the in this little island it's an an inhabited island there's there are no humans there but there's a permanent colony of uh, walruses really really close to camp maybe 40 meters away so uh that was something that was like watching a movie uh, apart uh, apart from the incredible landscapes and and the changing weather for me i'm a peruvian and i live in spain for me it was like going to another planet besides those guys were fun big 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 time and that's one thing that i will say in the 
in the conclusion. So where did we go? Uh, this is the Svalbard archipelago. It's inside the, the Arctic Circle. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's part of Norway, but it has a shared sovereignty with Russia. So there are like Russian towns somewhere. We didn't have time to go and see that, uh, but it's definitely worth a trip. And from, from the main city uh, in Svalbard, uh, we took a boat around two hours and a half to that island. That's Prince Karl Forland's island. And we were right in that uh, where the arrow appears, that point, the, the, the eastern uh, most tip of the island. That's where uh, Ken thought the uh, sound to camp. Uh, because we had takeoff to everywhere. Our main goals uh, were North America, West Coast, and JA and Asia, especially. And we knew we were going to have Europe uh, for sure, a lot. Uh, and that's how it turned out. But that was an incredible spot. As you can see there, uh, those little three buildings are, one is uh, like a little hut for the governor, which is closed, and two are uh, weather stations. And that's where we set camp. Uh, the green thing that you see on the bottom of the screen is water. There's like an entry of water from the ocean. Uh, so we basically had salty water. We were on that bar and we had salty water for our verticals and BDAs and dipoles. We had salty water in all of the directions. The, the, the place was incredible and it, it, it proved incredible. I was, uh, we were all really happy. Um, so uh, we did like the walruses do, uh, and on a good day, we gathered uh, at the Oslo airport. Uh, for many, it was their first flight in uh, two years, maybe. Uh, there's even uh, the expedition office in Norway, expedition. So, you know, we went there just to say we we're going. I'm just uh, kidding. A Spanish joke, a bad Spanish joke. And we arrived to Long Yearburn. Long Yearburn is like the civilization inside Svalbard. That's the main building that you will see. That's like a mall with some restaurants and uh, uh, an ex-coal mining town. All the things that you see parked there on the bottom uh, are uh, snowmobiles because in the winter it's uh, minus uh, 16, 18 degrees. So it's completely covered with snow. It's an ex-coal mining uh, town. Uh, you can see that, you know, the, the houses are raised uh, because of the snow. Kind of a green place with an incredible atmosphere because it's full of young people from all over the world, from Chile, from Norway, of course. They go there, it's tax-free. There's a, a, a branch of the Arctic University uh, and they go there and spend a year working. So the, the, the place is kind of dark, but uh, the people there were incredible. That's uh, what the old coal mines look like. You know, you had to go to climb on the snow every day to work there inside. So that's us. We wake up and we load all our crap, meaning all our crap, it's all our crap everything we had to take uh, toilet paper all the food everything because we were going to be dropped in a beach for a week uh that's us in the little pier on the right uh, in the upper uh, left corner you can see the captain the russian captain uh, <laughs> trying to see how it will fit all our toys there inside uh we managed to fit everything and we departed uh, towards the island it's a uh, two hour and a half three hour uh, boat ride we, we saw some puffins horribly photographed by me but you know at least there's a proof there were a lot uh and our dogs sleeping already living the the large the big life and we arrived here at polypinten polypinten uh, where you see the boat uh, it's right that that's right at the at the point we were uh, camping and you can see towards the south we have ocean Towards the northwest, we have ocean, and in that uh, that that uh, sandbar that we were camping, we had an entry of swell ocean for maybe I don't know 50 or 60 meters. So yeah, prime prime vertical uh, land there. And as the protocol uh, requires in the in polar bear territory, the first to disembark is the guy with the guns and the dogs, and of course, a crew member. You can see the crew member, the Swedish guy is not really happy. He's there, okay, it's my turn. We didn't know what was at the other side of the beach. 
So he goes and he sees everything and the dog smell and there wasn't polar bears. Uh, so our boat, you know, starts departing and leaves us uh, there. That's a gentry I made for a uh, for K9 Papa Golf. He collects these pictures. I don't know why. Uh, so uh, we were left there in the middle of uh, nowhere and uh, with the promise to be picked up uh, in a week, a WX ray permitting. There were some tourists that visited two times, you know, the, the walrus colony. So we kind of had a link. I took a satellite phone too, just in case uh, we didn't need it actually, uh, but uh, we were there. <laughs> So the first thing was set up a camp. We set up the tents and uh, started setting up antennas. The biggest tent was a radio tent. You can see it there on the right. Uh, and I will talk about the antennas and the equipment uh, a little bit later. So we set up our uh, little kitchen. I, I took uh, delicacies from Spain, weird canned food that everyone loved, and they took their weird Norwegian food. It was like a like a gastronomic festival. It was cold. We were usually between uh, minus two uh, or minus one up to three or four or five during the day, depending on, on the wind gusts. Uh, but there wasn't a night, so it was daylight, uh, 24 hours a day. My bear shift was from 2 to 4 a.m., and it was broad daylight. Boom, I heard my alarm. I took out my face cover, and, and I grabbed the gun. So... That was crazy too, uh, of those uh, upper latitudes. Uh, we are gentlemen, of course. We had to take a loo. We voted. We voted on that loo. There was a part of these rough Norwegians that said, no, you go to the swell and do your things. I said, no, come on. You know, we, we need to rent this. How much is to rent this? It's actually a loo that you kind of wear. It's more like a jacket for all of us uh, big guys, but still, gave us a, a little bit of uh, dignity on those uh, hard camping moments. I'm sorry, but if anyone wants to plan at the expedition, that's something you really need to take into account. Uh, so antennas, OK? Uh, Ken uh, is a man of uh, principles, and he said, spider beams. Let's not start taking uh, aluminum masts and beams because it's going to be crazy on weight. He was completely right. We were on the top uh, of what we could load on the boat. So it was all spider poles and wires. And we split it. For example, I did the two, uh, two elevated radial uh, ground planes for 17 and 15. Another one grabbed another two bands. So we kind of split. And we built and tested and had all the hardware and were responsible for all the hardware, the balloon and everything of all the antennas we built from our homes. So when we got together in Oslo, we knew it was working. And that's something that really worked out well. So this was the queen of our antennas. Uh, we got inspired by Vincent uh, and built a VDA for 20 meters, uh, a vertical dipole array uh, for 20 meters, a two element vertical Yagi kind of uh, made of wire. And it was a cannon. These antennas have this uh, radiation pattern when they are very close to the sea, they have an incredible lobe away from the island and a very small one towards the island. That's exactly what you need uh, when you are on an island uh, doing uh, the expedition. So uh, next time, I think I would take all of these. We had only one for 20, and we had other antennas for other bands, but this one, we were all fighting for it. We all wanted to, to do 20, and 20 ended up being the money band. You will see later. Too. Uh, this is almost at the end of the, the, the expedition. The weather has gone uh, crappy already. Look at the BVA, all twisted, still working. QRO, boom, 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 until the last minute. And then on the left, you can see, you know, a dipole that, uh, that kind of bent a little bit too much. But, you know, that's everything starts beautiful and then it starts uh, getting ruined. We had the 40 meter dipole. That's a thing to uh, have in mind. Those heavy QRO balloons put a big strain on the spider beam poles. Uh, this, this spider beam pole, uh, it was the only casualty, the only one that uh, broke for us. But uh, very, very important to find a light balloon. I have an example. I found one for the 17 meter one, and it worked very, very well. Uh, so we had uh, for 60, 40, and 30, we had uh, ground planes with ground radials. 
uh, spider poles just put on the ground and not even a uh, dag just put on the ground and guy wired and they withstood the winds we had strong winds no problem at all uh, that's more or less how our camp uh, could be seen that was our antenna farm and the radio tent was in the middle uh, this is a casualty uh, this is the one that uh, that oh, I'm sorry this is the one that broke uh, the 18 meter one. Okay, so for power, uh, we took two Ondas EU30i, uh, three point something uh, kilowatt each output. Uh, we grounded both separately with ground rods and we fed two separate circuits, one for two stations, one for three stations. The two stations could run more power, the other stations could run a little less power. In average, we could run 700 watts uh, full carrier uh, at every one of our stations without a problem at all and have all the accessories and the pieces running. Uh, uh, so uh, Germund uh, that took care of this uh, made an amazing job. He all, they, all, they also built RFI filters because these uh, Honda generators are very silent, but they can put out some uh, RFI. Uh, so those lines are filtered with a big uh, build RFI filter uh, like a choke. So we didn't have any noise problem, a little bit of interaction, you know, where we, but the space wasn't much spread out, but but it was, it worked very well. The plans uh, happened to work. So this is our tent. Uh, this is our tent the second day. As you can see, we are all wearing jackets because we couldn't uh, make that um, paraffin uh, military heater work. Uh, that was the second day. Then we managed to make it run. And oh, we tried to spend as much time there because it was the only hot place. Uh, so we set up, you know, the five stations there. Uh, basically, what we were using uh, were for linears, uh, we had Jumas and experts. And the rigs were a flex. Uh, uh, we had one flex and, and a couple of uh, Elecraft K3s and two KX3s. Uh, so basically, everybody took their own uh, station. I took my cameras, so I couldn't uh, take my own station. Uh, so I was just jumping from one to the other. Uh, I'm talking there with our pilot uh, that I want to thank from here, Whiskey for India, Papa Charlie, little Connor there in the States that we had a problem. Someone started calling on the West Coast, so I gave him a, a telephone call. That was the only time we really needed to use the phone there. So uh, kind of, you know, in an overview, uh, we were 4.5 days on the air uh, with five stations. Uh, we were six operators jumping around. Uh, it was free to choose which mode we use, which band we run. You went into the tent. If 17 was uh, uh, free on the matrix, you would hook up. The, the amplifier uh, to the matrix and run that band very, very open the uh, open and, and you could decide if you wanted to go sightseeing, you could go. Uh, uh, Ken did there a very nice uh, design on the schedule. So it was fun. Uh, we pulled 16,000 cues uh, in total. Uh, you will see the stats later, but most of them in, in CW and SSB. Uh, 8.590 unique calls and uh, 115 DXCCs work. Uh, you know, it's not that we were in a super rare place, but we were there during IOTA contest. So during IOTA, it was a blast. Uh, those don't count as Valbard. They count the uh, EU63 counts as a uh, coastal islands or something like that. So anyway, very, a lot of radio fun. Uh, we didn't stop a second. So here are the numbers kind of crunched. Uh, uh, there was a bet uh, from the team on 40. I was doubting that, but still, we had uh, nice antennas for 40. And 40 proved to be uh, not very good already into the summer and into a new cycle. 20 was incredible, and 17 was a nice surprise, too. You can see there in red. Uh, but 20 was definitely the money band. And 20 was the, the, the band that we have, the BDA. Uh, plus uh, dipole. So anyway, 20 was the, the fun band for sure. Uh, here are the QSOs uh, per continent. Uh, 
uh, we wanted to focus on the West Coast and Asia and knew we were going to have some EU. That's that's the deal. You, uh, the Europe was coming like cannons uh, as usual. And uh, we had a lot of North America, a lot of West Coast. I was surprised uh, during planning. I said, are you guys sure? Because they run some propagation simulations. And are you sure West Coast? Wow, it's a, it's, it's a feat from Spain. Uh, and definitely whiskey six after whiskey six after whiskey six, and then JAs on the other side. It was a uh, everything went according to plan, which is not usually the case, you know, in adventures like this. Uh, I'm still impressed. Uh, here are the cues per mode: uh, 64% CW, 27% uh, SSB, and 9% FTA. Uh, some people were doing more FTA, whichever. There were some that only ran CW. Uh, I did both. I mean, it was like a free distribution, and that's how I ended up. It ended up. It shows kind of like we are <laughs> an old crowd. Uh, and yes, uh, finally uh, we had a visit. Uh, the visit we were all waiting and doing polar bear guards and everything. Uh, we were visited by a mother polar bear and her juvenile cub. I can't show the video here because that's kind of the end of the movie. Uh, and that's uh, disclosed material, but you know it. You will see it. That movie, you will watch it for sure. So um, that's a polar bear. It was 400 meters away. This is photographed through the site in the rifle I had with the mobile phone. Uh, but luckily... Uh, you know, we saw polar bears, uh, but we didn't have to engage them. That's me and Ervan, the two hot-blooded Mediterranean guys. Uh, luckily, we didn't have to engage them because they would have laughed and, and then eaten us. We being zero afraid of us. We weren't a menace for that huge beast. I think they smelled and they said, these guys, I think they already went bad. Hams, ooh, let's go. And they just left. We were lucky, but we were like this. It was like a big adrenaline rush. Uh, and we can uh, die saying uh, we saw a polar bear. We had many, 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 many uh, individual and corporate sponsors, which uh, we are super thankful for. Clipperton DX, uh, Far East The Exploiters, Mac, a brewery. Uh, up there north, the farthest north brewery in the world, uh, Funk Amateur, uh, the German uh, dark uh, magazine, DX World, Ham Supply, and of course our super dearest uh, Charles, M0 Oscar, X-Ray Oscar, we had to suffer all, all our chaos with our, all our network logs going crazy and and you know we love you, Charles. And a lot of uh, single hams uh, that supported us. This was a very uh, small trip, very lean in terms of budget. It all came from our packet pockets, and what we received as, as donations came back to us a little bit of a uh, as a refund. And and you know uh, any any support in these small ones uh, makes a big uh, difference. We we hope uh, to have put. Uh, wanted Island in many logs. We had a lot of fun. It looked like at the other side, there was a lot of fun too. So, and I would repeat with those people, I would go to the end of the world. Fun, loving, uh, we were pulling our legs. The moment we were on the plane already, uh, uh, good chaps, all of them. I, they have the, the official seal of approval. And uh, that's about it. And I think I went uh, too fast as usual. It's 11.26, but... I will be open for questions if there's any. And thank you very much for the patience. I'm from Berlin with my Barcelona accent here, my Peruvian accent. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been fascinating. Actually, I'm in awe of your English speaking skills and, and your uh, Norwegian pronunciation as well. Uh, um, <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, there aren't many. Yes, uh, just by the way, if you do have a question, please get them in on the. Uh, on the YouTube uh, chat, I'm looking at it uh, now. John, thank you. Has just put up a, a reminder about uh, about questions. I've got a few if uh, if you don't have. But um, I mean, you you live somewhere quite warm, um, and you your country of origin, Peru, I imagine, is is quite warm. How did you cope um, on uh, on this island? 
Digamos well, que... I've been I, I've been training in northern temperatures. I I grew up in Lima, Peru, which has the lamest weather in the world. My uh, minimum 17 degrees, maximum 29 degrees. And then I moved to Canada, to Vancouver, Canada. That, that's where I studied my second career and I spent two years there. Uh, Vancouver is still kind of easy weather uh, compared to the rest of Canada. And then I moved to Spain. I came out, af uh, came uh, here after my love. Uh, so, so I had to adapt. I mean, it's uh, it's nothing with living here in Spain, uh, Barcelona. Right? I mean, right now we have 25 degrees outside, which is uh, nuts. It's almost uh, November. Uh, I can adapt. My my blood is Russian. My grandparents were immigrants from Russia in the early 20th century. So I'm finer with snow than uh, with tropical weather. So yeah, I I adapted really really fast. But I was the cold one. I was the 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 chilly one. You know, with seven uh, layers and. And for them, it was like a normal going to work temperature for the spring, you know. Yes, LB5 yeah. GI was bare chested there. I saw in that. Uh, in that yeah, picture. that's funny. I asked him, hey, what are you doing? You are ruining my my epicness here for the movie. And he said, it's a summer trip, right? It's a summer. So it's a summer. Yeah. You know, you have to take out your shirt. This yeah. is what I was thinking. It was, it was July, wasn't it? Because uh, you it, said it, uh, it was, it it was, was the end the of time. July and the hottest temperature ever uh, there during the year. And it was four, the maximum, the day we were like, you know. Uh, so in the winter, it's completely covered in snow. It's a beautiful place. It's not an expensive place to travel to. Svalbard, as a general, there's a cheap flight from Oslo, SAS, uh, and it works perfect. And there's there are all a gamut of prices, of places to stay there, and a lot to see around. It's a... For me, it was an incredible surprise, incredible surprise. Uh, fulfilled my expectations by far, yeah. Um, AD, G6AD, it's local to me, actually. He says, uh, whose job was it to test the heater, LOL? Um, oh, somebody's saying, thank you very much. They just received the JW0 QSL card. I think that's somebody called Matt, so I'm not too sure. And, uh, oh, uh, Somebody signing themselves as heptode says, how did you get on with the walruses? Are they dangerous? Uh, no, they are not dangerous. Uh, we are dangerous there. Uh, those walruses are a huge attraction. So they give work to a lot of people. The boats that bring, that bring tourists, they have all this protocol not to scare them away because walruses, that's what I was told, when they get scared, they, they could never come back to that beach. So... You know, that's a place that's two hours away. So they bring tourists once a day. They don't, you know, so we weren't allowed to disturb them. I, I shot some shots of them, but didn't get uh, too close. I, I I guess if you get in the middle there, they are dangerous, but they don't attack people. Their, uh, their tasks are for hunting uh, for clams, giant clams. That's what they eat. So they need them for that, but uh, they are not aggressive. But they if they get scared, That was a big thing. We would have gotten a fine that we couldn't pay. <laughs> well, there can't be many de expeditions you go on where you need to take a, a rifle and a, and a hunter and some and some dogs. Yeah, well, uh, the hunter, it's actually a friend of GI uh, uh, and, and he's a hunter and, and he was in Canada and he had an encounter with a bear that tried to attack a, the exp an, an expedition, not radio related. So he knows uh, what to do in those cases. And, and he was a friend, so we brought him with us. And he was doing 12 hours a day uh, polar bear watch. And us six ops had two hours each. So he, was, he, had, he kind of had a job there. Uh, but, but everybody carries a gun there. Everybody, 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 everybody. We had this small sailboat coming with a family and the guide, a, a woman from France, which happened to be a friend of Erwan, one of our operators, jumped out, out of the dinghy with a big fat gun. You need to, when you go on a beach, the protocol is to have a gun and know how to use it and know where to shoot and train. You know, uh, all the Norwegians went to this range where they have cameras and they can train. And here I went to the, I ended up in the Guardia Civil, you know, and the guy told me, are you pulling my leg? No, really, I need to train with a high caliber gun so I can maybe kill a polar bear. 
So, you know, I, I think I'm, I, they have me wired already. They are listening to what I talk. <laughs> I'll get so, the bears on the streets of Barcelona, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the deal. Uh, for me, it was surprising too, but uh, that's a, a, a necessity. All, all the rest, apart, of course, from the generators and the weight of everything, it was like a cold camping trip, you know? Yeah, did, um, you mentioned uh, that it wasn't an expensive operation, but give us an idea of what, what, what it might be. Yes, to yes. Uh, a, our budget per operator uh, was around uh, 2,000 euros, and it ended up being 1,300 uh, for a 10-day stay that included our boat, of course, which is the main cost usually in these adventures, you know, the boat, uh, the rental of, of the tents and everything. That was a minus, of course, getting there. They were already in Oslo. I, I was in Mallorca there and I, I flew I flew from uh, Palma to, to Oslo. That's minus uh, flights, you know, but... Uh, you know, a lot of bang for the bag. Eight days in the North Pole wilderness, you know, with friends really, doing radio. You didn't really need any spending money, did you? Not on the, on the no, beach, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. No, no, no. Because no. Norway, I know, has a reputation of being very expensive uh, itself, but you were... Yeah, I, I, I wasn't in Oslo, I, I can't tell. And, and yeah, it's more definitely, it's more expensive, but... Uh, uh, it wasn't a, a huge problem, uh, really. We when when we went back, uh, went to a restaurant and had a couple of beers and had a decent uh, lunch, you know, after a, a while. Uh, but no, it wasn't a problem. And and the place Svalbard, it's it's incredible. It really feels like you've been traveling for long to somewhere very far, and it's right up here, even closer to you guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You uh, you mentioned um, you're making a film. I'm finishing a film that I started in 2016. I'm a film director. Oh, not about is... the expedition then? No, no, no. The, in the, the expedition, there's like the, the last uh, scene, <laughs> oh, <laughs> which I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> but uh, but X -rated. you know, X-rated, oh yeah, yeah. There's there are bears on it. X-rated with bears. Mm. So no, it's a, it's like a labor of love. I've been doing this out of my pocket without uh, even making my company uh, get involved, my production company. Just a thing of you know, it was traveling with hams and shooting around the world, and and it's about to finish. I need to finish because I'm getting into a fiction project now. Uh, and and this was an opportunity, you know, a perfect setting to shoot uh, the end. So so that's that's about it. I hope to have the film ready by uh, mid 2022. I still need to fly somewhere to shoot a couple of more interviews. But uh, yeah, it's been ongoing for five years, almost six years already. Yeah, it sounds fascinating. You'll have to let us know when it's uh, when it's ready. But going back to the de expedition, I guess the uh, the Norwegian chaps handled this. But um, did you need to convince any authorities that you were uh, that you should go there? Uh, Ken Ken has an incredible cred. Uh, he's you know every time he's gone, he's been invited to Jan Mayen. He's like military with the no impact thing, and we were all aware. You know, when we finished, we did this line and we walked the beach and we picked up crap from God knows where, you know, from other guys, bags and bags and bags. And and I didn't know, for example, that we couldn't fly a drone there. I took a mini drone to shoot some aerial. And the moment uh, Ken saw it, down, down, what? No, we are not allowed. But there was no one around. No, no, we can't fly a drone. I put the drone in there. So, uh you know, in those in those countries, if you really stick to the rules and you prove it and you comply, uh, uh, you get in exchange. You know, that's I, I don't think it's easy to get a permit to camp there. But I can tell you that if you went there, the moment we left, you wouldn't have noticed we were there. You know, mm -hmm. so because it's, it's, it's a nature, it's it's a nature reserve. It's a very high level nature reserve. It's not yeah. worth upsetting them, is it? Uh, it spoils it for everybody else coming along later. Of course, I, I mean the 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 two or three groups of tourists they came to the wilderness and saw six stinky hams there with their antennas. That was kind of a downer, maybe. But apart from that, we didn't have any impact. Yeah. Mm. 
Well, talking of stinky hams, I mean, don't go into too much detail, but what was it like? No showers. A wearable toilet you were talking about. Uh, The wearable toilet, it it wasn't bad. Uh, It was uh, like a trash can uh, that you put a bag there, and then it had like a molded uh, toilet lid uh, that fit perfectly there. So it was thought for that. Uh, but we all knew that the guy going inside there was going to have a hard time. So we kind of made it a joke and that didn't help the guy that was inside because you could hear people laughing and said, oh, come on, you know, go, go away. So uh, that's, that, you know, that's one of the kinks. Um, we didn't shower, of course. Uh, we didn't change our uh, first layer of uh, clothes either much because it was cold. But there, nobody stunk. Uh, you know, at, at those temperatures near freezing, it's not the same. Here, yeah. yeah, here you walk <laughs> two blocks and and you are, you know, you, you are you are sweating. That wasn't the case there. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to uh, come into uh, what it's like uh, listening in in the Arctic. I've been in Spain, and uh, I hear things in Spain on a little eight one seven and a wonder wand antenna. You can't hear. But this this north in the uh, in the world, but uh, um, where is it? Uh, John M- GM three JW wants to know what the noise floor was like being so far north. Uh, the the noise floor. Uh, you have to take into account that we didn't do any uh, low frequency work, so uh, I can't tell you how it was in one sixty eighty. Uh, I even didn't even touch forty. If I see the stats for my part. I didn't even go to 40. I stayed on 20 and 17. Uh, Noise floor S2, maybe. So incredible. I have a six, a seven here in the city, in the city station. Uh, But the flatter, that's something that I've always heard about and I never suffered before. Uh, The flatter is something. It's literally like if there was a monkey pulling your uh, mic plug, your, your headset plug, in and out, you it goes. So you have to pick a call on SSB from a big pileup, you know, and you are hearing kilo again kilo one kilo one like crazy. That was fun, and I realized because I have a lot of friends in Alaska, my my US colleagues from Alaska, and and they've always told me when you come to you know, bring your call out to the air, you will see flatter, flatter, flatter. So I experience flatter. It's crazy. But the good things is that the paths you have there up north, uh, if I want to work JA, I have to beam uh, to JA or, or on the long path. But they are so close to the pole. So you hear things, the West Coast, I've never heard West Coast in Europe so loud up there. So the path was maybe polar or... It's a completely different radio experience, which is something I really appreciate when I travel to the expeditions that, you know, it blows your head. It's completely different to Spain and it's uh, four hours away, you know. Mm. Yeah, we often hear um, Scandinavian stations in the middle of the day calling CQ on 40 to West Coast. I yeah. wonder what, that's, <laughs> what that is all about. Um, that that uh, flutter that you were talking about, was that to the effect of the Aurora or something like that? Yeah, to the effect of the Aurora, in a weird way, because this is so north, this is 78 degrees north, and uh, the, the prime aurora band is from 60 to 70. So we are farther north of the big auroras. If you want to see auroras during the winter, you go to Tromso, which is farther south. Uh, so uh, we were affected in a strange uh, way. Uh, uh, and, and it sometimes came and it left and it was at any uh, any day, any hour of, of that 24 hour light day. Uh, but uh, it was like a roller coaster. It was like someone was trying to make it hard for you, you know? Yeah, you wouldn't have had the benefit of, benefit of seeing the Aurora, would you? Be, be, no, no, no. I like miss that. Shame. I miss that. I, I'm going to go. I, I want to come back on the on the winter. They have this very well equipped uh, radio club right by the port in Long Yearburn, in the place where you fly to. And, and they are really open and they take guests. I've heard this kind of a noisy QTH uh, lately, but uh, yeah, I want to go there in the winter for sure. Absolutely. Um, question from a couple of questions from Dom M1 KTA. How much weight did you each carry on the flights in? 
uh, around the two uh, suitcases of 23 kilos uh, and some of us three suitcases of, of 23 kilos plus we had allowed eight kilos on the carry-on and boy we blew that like <laughs> I don't know, we, we were carrying maybe 17 kilos on the carry-on, you know, because you had to take your linear, in my case, my cameras. I, I, uh, so basically two or three 23 kilo uh, pieces weren't expensive in SAS. They were really reasonable, uh, the cost of taking them. Uh, and some of them were ski bags. That's where we took the big uh, spider poles. You know the the ten meet the new ten meter spider poles the ones I use they 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 went into my duffel bag, but from twelve meters up uh, they go into a ski bag. Yeah. Yeah. Many layers of clothes in every pocket full of stuff. I take it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Many layers of clothes. Uh, inner layer made of merino. Uh, middle layers uh, made of wool too. Uh, then like a like a waterproof pant. We didn't have any precipitation. Not snow, not uh, not hail, not uh, rain. Uh, but we have one day it was terribly foggy, foggy like crazy. So polar bears, you know, where are the polar bears going oh, yeah. to appear if you see 20 meters away? <laughs> you know, there are warmer places you could have gone to for a day expedition. Yeah. Yeah, but this place was was fun. I mean, the what, what I, was so special about going that? Why, why, why did the you landscape? You can't believe the place. It's uh, it's it's like being on the moon. Uh, I don't know. Look, uh, you could say, well, I've gone to the South Pole, and this is here. We haven't gone out of the continent. Uh, that's one. Uh, and the other one, which I found later, because I didn't knew most of the sorry, I didn't knew most of the didn't know most of the guys, uh, was the team. You know, I had the lottery, the two B, the two D expeditions I've done lately. Amazing people, the one on BP six R and here, which that that's the most important thing if you plan going anywhere to a weekend outing or to a small D expedition or to a big one, is you make sure that the team is right you know because because there will be hardships and it's better to smile at them you know together than shh. i've heard horror stories too that's what i'm saying this so <laughs> if anyone wants to start planning the expeditions find the right chaps first yeah and uh, um dom again m1 kta uh, yeah we saw in pictures there seemed to be some logs lying around it says it looked like you use those logs for did you use those logs for securing guys and stuff well, the, the thing is that some of those logs are considered heritage uh, and some of them uh, could have runes uh, in there. They, they could be there for thousands of years. Wow. So we weren't allowed to move them much. So what we the only thing that we did is tie to some big ones, tie our guy wires, you know, that we will not leave a mark or anything, or grab newer driftwood, obviously new driftwood, and put eye, eye bolts there. You know, you don't need a lot of uh, weight to hold those uh, straight, you know? So, yeah. yeah. Ooh, national monuments then. Um, oh, yes, you were talking about balance in the uh, presentation. Uh, Jeff G4FKA says, what balance did you use? Uh, uh, he's okay. interested in the lightweight balloon for, for his home stage. Okay, uh, everybody had doubts. I'm a balloon design guy. I have all my QRO balloons. I have a collection here in my shack, uh, but they are weighty, you know? So uh, let me see, because I put an insert there. Well, I think I've lost... Uh, uh, okay, I forgot to put uh, the 17 meter antenna. Anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a diamond. Um, if you wait uh, for me, I can tell you it's a it's a diamond BL60 or BU60. They have two models. Uh, let me see. I suppose we should say at this point, other balloons are available. Um, yeah, well, this one is is very small. Uh, it's uh, it's made by Diamond. You will see. Uh, it takes 1.2 kilowatts. Uh, I did some tests here with a dummy load uh, on 40 and 80 uh, on the higher frequencies, which was my case, 17, 15, and 20. They worked incredible, and they are very light, 
very, very light. So you could put up those in this. That's the one. I think so. Uh, how can I see that? Yeah, we can see it. We can, I can see it on my screen. Yeah, the Martin, Martin has it for sure. <laughs> I don't know if I bought it there, actually. Wait. Okay, and Terry, G3VFC says, uh, what about the wind? Was there much wind while you were there? Uh, two of the five days were beautiful. That's when you see the beautiful pictures. And uh, two were miserable miserable luckily our, our tents withstood but the antennas every three hours oh the for the you know the the huma juma three is shouting okay what band 40 boom the you know the antenna was down uh we had some some strong winds but not crazy winds uh withstandable you know okay um I've got a message from Cole McGowan. He says 73 from JW stroke OJ0Y. Do you ah. know uh, Cole? Uh, he must have operated from that part of the world as, uh, as well. Yeah, a lot of uh, Scandinavian hams and German hams go to Svalbard. Uh, it's that I think it's easy to get a license to a reciprocate license or you operate J Whiskey Slash. Uh, and you always get kind of a pileup. It's a rarish among the non-rare ones, you know? Yeah. Uh, Have you got any more planned? Any more uh, expeditions? Yes and no. I'm, yes and no. I'm, I need to focus <laughs> on my businesses and I'm, uh, I have to finish the movie, especially. Uh, I'm on the waiting list of two and uh, I'm starting to plan a third. Uh, but uh, there are some political concerns. I can't talk a lot, but I'm going to be doing the expeditions until I get out of ham radio. I, I'm a DX chaser. That's what I really like to do. If there's a new one, I'm there and I wake up and I still have the same drive and illusion as only eight years ago when I got licensed, you, even though I started as a kid in Peru, but it was pirate thing. <laughs> Uh, so I will. <laughs> I, I yeah I will do I I will definitely keep doing them uh, uh, for sure. I might me might move soon to EA6 uh, for good. Okay. I'm finally convincing my XYL here, my wife. So um, I will have finally my short EA call uh, from EA6. So I will drop this horrible one <laughs> just, just across the water. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, look, um, it's been great talking to you. Your enthusiasm for life is is fantastic. Um, and uh, I know you can't talk about the uh, the new uh, uh, de expeditions, but uh, just say, will they be somewhere warmer where you don't need a gun? Mm, uh, two yes, one no. <laughs> <laughs> one one colder <laughs> no i'm uh I, it's just that i'm not in uh, one of them and i you know it's a uh, it's a big question mark uh, i'm i'm up for offers <laughs> you oh, know uh, right. i'm uh, i'm happily happy to jump uh, to anyone if the team is good and the place is promising uh, and i can find the time of course well, look, good luck with the rest of that movie, making that movie. Good luck with the rest of uh, your life. I hope you managed to get to EA6, just across the water. Uh, it's been brilliant talking to you. Thanks ever so much for your uh, for your time and giving us a flavour of what it's like to go on an IOTA expedition to somewhere very, very cold. Alan, thank <laughs> you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure and an honour. Bye-bye. Ciao. Great stuff. Bye-bye now. OK, uh, we're going to be setting up our link to uh, New Zealand for our uh, uh, next talk. But uh, while you're watching on the uh, YouTube channel, by the way, um, there is you'll probably see I can see it on mine. It's a, a red subscribe button. Why don't you press that? Uh, it means you'll receive notifications when the uh, when the convention presentations are released individually uh, later in the week and also when other new videos are, uh, are published. And that's the best way to keep up to date with the uh, content on the RSGB YouTube channel. The subscribe button, as I say, is that uh, oblong red button that I can see there. So we're setting up the link to New Zealand for Andrew, ZL3DW's re-evaluation of 
SDR at 11 o'clock UK time. By the way, it may be one minute past by the time you see it because I'm looking at my uh, feed at the moment and it's at least a minute behind. Uh, so it could be anything at, uh, at your end. But while we're setting that up, let's have another look at what's happening at the NRC, the National Radio Centre at Bletchley. Hello, welcome back to the RSGB National Radio Centre. Um, I'm joined at the moment by Crassie, uh, M7YAY, uh, and Cassie's joined us recently as a volunteer at the National Radio Centre. So, hi Crassie, nice to see you this morning. Um, how did you find out about the National Radio Centre? Um, I found out about the National Radio Centre the same way as um, everyone else does at the moment, actually, which is through the one-way system at uh, Block B at Bletchley Park. So uh, the exit of Block B comes out right at the entrance of the NRC. Oh, just outside, so, yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. So you can't miss it. Yeah. yeah, and it's really good with people coming out of there. They, I've seen people queuing up outside. So right. why did you decide to become an NRC volunteer, though? 
Um, I had just completed my pilot training, so I was looking to get more involved into communications um, as well as meet like-minded people. So uh, volunteering at DNRC just offered both options. So I inquired about it um, and was lucky enough to be offered a position. So yes, very lucky. And, and what, what do you enjoy about being a volunteer at the NRC then? What, what really um, does it for you? The, the best part um, about being a volunteer is uh, speaking to visitors about uh, radio and uh, what we do as amateurs. Um, so we do meet quite a lot of diverse groups of people. Mm. And also, obviously, um, I do work with a lot of very, uh, very fun, very knowledgeable and very supportive bunch of volunteers who are, have the, the infinite amount of patience with me. Excellent. And we, you talk about the number of vol the visitors. We've had some really busy days recently. I think we've gone over 900 one Sunday that's recently. Right. Yeah. So th that's the sort of yeah. the number of people we have through the, the doors at the NRC. So yes. you're here introducing them to amateur radio. But you've only recently passed your foundation licence, haven't you? So how did that happen and what are you enjoying about amateur radio? Um, it, it happened uh, uh, quite suddenly, actually. Um, I did feel thrown in the deep end because I hadn't done anything like this before. But uh, what I enjoy about being a, a radio amateur is I just love the, the fact that the hobby challenges me every day. So there's always something new to learn, uh, yeah. such as uh, the difference between cutting a cable and stripping a cable. So there was quite a few centimeters of cable were damaged in the process. <laughs> I, I understand you made your first HF radio contact using GB3RS here as well. That's right. How was that? Again, it was um, again just completely thrown in the deep end because as most uh, radio amateurs that start, it's uh, yeah, it, the, this is not the equipment they would have availability um, to use. So. And um, what what do you think you're going to try next with amateur radio? Any plans? Yes, so I recently joined RainNet, so I'm quite keen to take part in events. Um, and also I discovered direction finding. So okay. as a pilot, obviously, navigation is a big thing. So yep. I'm quite keen to see what direction finding is all a bit about. Of amateur radio direction, yes. ARDF then. That's right, yes. Okay. Excellent. All right, well, thanks, Crassy. Great to see you. And I know you're going to be operating GB3RS yes. during the day. You've already had a go this morning, I know. We saw you earlier. Um, yep. But I think we're going to cut over now to the audio again on GB3RS and GB4RS. So, catch you later. Eagle to 80 metres this hour there. So, uh, working on Fox Tango 2000, Camel MC60 microphone on 102 foot double up. So, uh, not too bad this side there, working uh, north-south. So, uh, I won't hold it too long. Right, well, we'll be back with Steve and the gang at uh, Bletchley uh, later. Uh, by the way, if you're an RSGB member, you can get free entry to Bletchley Park and visit the NRC for yourself. Uh, details are on the membership pages of the RSGB website. So this is the RSGB online convention for 2021. And wherever you are in the world, welcome to the live Learn More About stream, where we're about to learn more about software defined radio but just starting over on the introduction to stream g0 pot is offering hints and tips on portable operating a reminder that you can post questions to all the listeners using the youtube chat facility we'll do our best to uh, fit them in don't forget to include your name and call sign and the location would be good too so we're about to learn more about SDR, Software Defined Radio, with Andrew Barron, ZL3DW, whose book on the subject is still available from the RSGB shop, by the way. Well, hello, Andrew. Nice to uh, see you. I've got two radios to my left here that use SDR, and even though I'm a bit of a radio fossil, I must say I do love them. They, they've really, um, what should we say, enhanced my radio experience, as the marketing jargon goes. Uh, and I know the suggestion in the notes that you're going to reevaluate SDR. Well, I haven't got my head around phase one yet, but uh, Andrew, the stream is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, good morning, everybody. It's uh, 11 p.m. here, so uh, forgive me if I'm a little bit sleepy. So we're going to talk about software defined radio. And um, software defined radio is a fairly new technology, but it's it's hit the mainstream now. It started off as a few blokes uh, tinkering away with circuit boards and uh, working away in the wee small hours on software uh, to go with it. And a huge amount of work was done. 
And now it's it's hit the mainstream and the big uh, three radio manufacturers are, are making software to find radios and it certainly seems to be the way the future uh, is going to be. So software to find radio, what exactly is it? Well, I think most radio hams would have an appreciation of what software to find radio is or do they? There might be a, um, a few snags there. So I'm going to talk about that just briefly as a recap. Um, DSP STR evolution, how software defined radio has been spawned from uh, DSP technology. I'm going to talk about uh, hybrid STRs like the new Yaesu radios. Um, some of the limits on direct sampling and, and why we have to go to the hybrid technology. A little bit on FT, FFT and the pan adapter, something on multiple receivers and a little bit on uh, software development. There's not as much software development going on now as there was. It was very dynamic um, probably 10 years ago and uh, there was new technology coming out all the time and that, uh, that seems to have slowed down a bit now. Uh, so the RSGB asked me for the talk to be technical and uh, I wasn't quite sure where to pitch it. So uh, hopefully it's not too technical. There's uh, no maths, well, not very much, and there's no software code, and I didn't include any vector diagrams, so we'll push on. What exactly is it? Most people know what a software-defined radio is, and many of us already own one. It's the latest transceiver from Alicraft, Yaesu, or ICOM, or Tentec. Of course it is. It's a flex radio or an Apache Labs Anon transceiver. It's an RTL dongle or a FunCube dongle. It's a Hermes Light, a Softrock, or a Raspberry Pi Hat circuit board. These radios are all completely different, but they all claim to be software-defined radios. So what exactly is a software-defined radio? The Softrock is a tiny quadrature uh, sampling detector board. Is it? The latest, is it the same as the latest Alicraft transceiver, the new K4 that's coming out? Well, uh, so we'll go into that. So SDRs are part of the digital revolution. You might be hanging on to your old LP records, but the world has gone digital. Your phone, your camera, TV, amateur radio transceiver, they all went digital years ago, and so did music formats and things like that. And the main reason, there's lots of reasons, but the main reason is that digital stages don't add noise. So you can regenerate a noisy digital signal into a clean digital signal, and uh, you end up with a nice clean system. Uh, with an analog, any analog transmission system, every time you amplify it or um, uh, or send it across the airwaves and receive it at another site, there's noise added and you can't get rid of that noise easily. So uh, whereas the digital signal, as long as you can tell what's a one and what isn't, uh, and what's a zero, you can reconstruct the digital signal and have a completely noise-free um, result. And that's, um, that's why Telephone systems initially went digital and everything else has pretty much followed on from there. So SDRs are a logical extension of the digital uh, signal processing, DSP process. And um, the main aim of software-defined radio is converting the signals, the received signals to digital as close as possible to the antenna. So um, DSP started off uh, with AF and then went to IF and so you, you could say that a software defined radio is an RF DSP process and uh, the reverse is true also on the transmitter the primary aim of an SDR transmitter is to convert the outgoing signals from the digital signal to an analog signal as late as you possibly can in the transmitter chain so um, so <clears throat> When I said that the digital signals don't add noise, when you convert an analog signal to a digital signal using an analog to digital converter, you do get 
some uh, noise. It's called quantization noise, and it's due to the error um, between levels in the in the ADC. So if you had an eight bit ADC, it would have 256 levels that can be described by those eight bits. And if you had a level that was partway between that, uh, between uh, say 0001 and 0010, you would um, make a small mistake there. And that ends up uh, averaging out as a, as a noise signal, but it's very small. And with a 16 bit or 14 bit ADC, it's fairly negligible. And there are ways around it. They use randomization uh, in the chips and oversampling, um, multiple sampling of the same data um, to average that out. So SDR receivers, they sound clean. When you, when you first get one, you think, oh, well, this sounds a lot better. It sounds a lot better than my old superheat radio. And the main reason for that is because the frequency down conversion from RF to audio is not adding any noise. So you don't get noise in the mixes or the IM amplifiers and things like that. So what is, an, what is the definition of a software defined radio? Well, the ITU definition is not really adequate. In fact, in my opinion, it describes any radio with any kind of computer control, including CAT. What does it say? It says, a software defined radio is a radio transmitter and or receiver employing a technology that allows the RF operating parameters, including but not limited to the frequency range, the modulation type or the output power to be set or altered by software. And that certainly fits uh, a CAT or a ICOM CIV type scenario. Um, for instance, the FD847 here, that is CAT control. Um, but it's not considered to be a software defined radio, even though it technically meets the ITU definition. So we can't use that. The uh, FCC manages the radio spectrum in the US, and it's primarily interested in devices that emit signals on radio frequency. So their definition says that software defined radios must always include a transmitter. There's no FCC definition for a software defined radio receiver at all. Their definition says a software defined radio is a radio that includes a transmitter in which the operating parameters of frequency range, modulation type, maximum output power, either radiated or conducted, or the circumstances under which the transmitter operates in accordance with the commission laws can be altered by making a change in software without making any changes to the hardware components that affect the radio frequency emissions. So they're saying that has to be a transmitter. And again, they're saying that um, <clears throat> as long as you can change some of those things in software without actually affecting the hardware, then it's an STR. Uh, clearly that's not what we describe as being an STR. The, uh, for instance, the FT, uh, 1000 MP, it's got IF DSP, but it's not field upgradable. You can't download a new firmware to it. It has to be done by taking the firmware chips out of the radio. So it's not considered to be an SDR. I like this definition that I found on Wikipedia a while back. It says uh, software defined radio is a radio communication system where components that have been typically implemented in hardware, such as mixers, filters, amplifiers, modulators, demodulators, and detectors, are instead implemented by means of software on a personal computer or in an embedded system. Now, that uh, pretty much describes what we would consider to be a software defined radio. On the right there, we've got the FLETS uh, 6600 M. It's a direct sampling, uh, direct digital sampling <clears throat> radio. And uh, that uh, SDR stage is followed with a fairly conventional Texas DSP stage. So that can be upgraded um, by loading new firmware from the uh, internet or another source into the radio and that can upgrade the features of the radio and so that is considered to be a software defined radio 
This is an earlier flex radio, the flex 1500. It's got a quadrature sampling detector architecture. Um, and all the modulation, filtering, demodulation, and stuff like that is all done by PC software. So that uh, clearly can be upgraded by um, changing the PC software. So it is also considered to be a software-defined radio. Okay, DSP evolution. Um, so this is a typical double conversion superheterodyne uh, receiver. Let's make the blob. So you've got an RF filter, RF amplifier, another filter after the amplifier, a mixer and an oscillator that produces an IF output. There's a filter there to make sure that you only get the, uh, the plus or minus <clears throat> output from the mixer because you don't want the others, because you get images. Uh, then there's an IF amplifier, then there's a second mixer, second local oscillator, fairly straightforward. And then there's IF amplifier, and eventually you get a demodulator and you get audio out of the receiver. So that's, that's pretty much the standard um, receiver that we were using up until the time that DSP uh, came along. This is a receiver with um, audio frequency DSP. It wasn't around for very long, really. And the main change is this area down here, where after the demodulator, there's an analog to digital converter. There's some digital signaling uh, processing, which typically um, added sharp filtering and noise blanking and noise filters. And there's a digital to analog converter to convert it back into audio and you get an audio output. So this is the first time we see an A to D conversion inside a ham radio receiver. So <clears throat> it's the thin edge of the wedge. You've already started getting digital at this stage. So a little bit about DSP. Once a signal has been sampled and turned into a series of numbers, it can be manipulated to perform the functions that were previously carried out in, a, in the radio hardware. Uh, that includes all those filters and modulating and demodulating and things like that. Some of the code's actually quite simple. <clears throat> now, for example, a volume control just adds a value to the numbers in the data stream. Here's an analog volume control. You've got audio coming in, you've got a, a pot, and you've got audio coming out. This is a digital volume control over on the right. You've got a data stream of 16 bits um, at about 48,000 bits per second because that's a standard audio stream. And you have a number up here which you've assigned with software to be volume, and it might say uh, it might be one if the volume's low. So all that does is in this box here, there's a piece of software that adds one to each of the numbers coming through, each of the 16-bit numbers coming through there. So these numbers here are higher by one, which makes them a little bit louder. If the volume control was set to 10, they'd be a bit more louder when they get converted back to, um, to analog. So it's very, very simple. And a lot of the filters and things are actually remarkably simple when you actually look at the um, software. Uh, for instance, um, if the computer is looking at this stream of data and suddenly the numbers jump up uh, to a higher level for a short time, that could be a noise spike. So the software can go, I don't want the noise spike, and it can just eliminate it and take it out completely. Uh, a noise filter, for instance, uh, looks at the average speech level, which is considered to be a long time constant, and it eliminates or, it'll, or attenuates the signals that are above the average level, but have a short time constant, such as a noise pulse. That's why your noise uh, filters on a D in a DSP radio or a software-defined radio, they um, don't work on noise that's below the average level uh, below the average speech level. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. Thank you. 
Um, <clears throat> so software defined radio takes the DSP further by always performing the demodulation on the digital signal and also providing um, uh, <clears throat> providing the traditional uh, band scope and filters and noise reduction. So software defined radio is a merging of radio technology and computer technology. Some of the radio is still hardware, but the operating panel and the DSP is all software or firmware running on a CPU or a DSP chip or an FPGA, or in some cases on a personal computer. So there's three broad classes of software defined radio receiver. There's, this is the first one that came out. Uh, this is basically the TALO uh, detector. And <clears throat> it's called a quadrature sampling detector. Let me draw a um, box. So it consists of two bits. This bit of this bit here is in hardware, and it's a very simple piece of hardware. Uh, Taylor detectors only got four chips in it, and they're very cheap uh, chips. And uh, so that bit uh, is is hardware. You've got a filter. You can RF amplifier. The uh, it's <clears throat> the RF signal is split into um, two streams, and um, a ninety degree phase shift is applied to one of the streams, which gives you the Q signal, and uh, the other signal is not uh, shifted, so it gets uh, it becomes the I signal. And then draw. Thank you. Inside the PC, you have two analog to digital converters. That's the sound card of your PC. People don't think of the sound card of the PC as being a uh, analog to digital converter, but that's precisely what it is. And then all the DSP and demodulation stuff like that is done in the um, PC sound card, and that also converts the audio back to... Um, the D to A converter back into an audio stream for your speakers. So, <clears throat> the second type of um, software defined radio receiver is this it's a direct sampling or direct. Uh, down conversion SDR. Uh, it's got the same RF filter, the same RF amplifier. It's got an anti alias filter, which stops the uh, analog to digital converter uh, sampling data that you don't want it to. And instead of an oscillator, these are clocks, so it's a square wave instead of a sine wave. And then there's a FPGA, and that slows the data down to a speed that can be sent to the um, computer. And the output of that is two uh, streams, whereas the previous one, the streams were at audio, and then they were converted to analog. Uh, sorry, they were converted to digital uh, by the PC. This type of radio puts out two um, digital streams that are at 90 degrees to each other. And they're carried via Ethernet or USB to the DSP stage, which is running on uh, software on your computer, or it might be running on software or firmware in your radio, such as your ICOM radios, where uh, it, uh, it goes through to a, um, to a Texas DSP chip, and then eventually to audio. So, um, the, the, this kind of receiver can have the DSP performed in the computer, like the Apache Labs Anon radios or the Sun SDR radios or the Flex radios, or it could be in the radio itself, like the ICOM 7300 or ICOM 7610. Or a third option is the PC could be in the radio, uh, like the Expert MB1 or the Apache Labs Andromeda radios, so uh, they're more like the first version 
with DSPs being done on PC software, but the PC is actually residing inside the radio box. So that's a, a different hybrid type. Uh, the third kind is a hybrid SDR. This uses a uh, standard superheterodyne stage at the start and mixes the signals, the RF signals, down to a level, down to a frequency that the ADC can sample. Um, and then from there on, it's pretty much like a direct sampling radio. So uh, this bit's super heterodyne, and this bit is the SDR. Uh, they're used mostly in uh, VHF and UHF radios because um, the, you can't get ADCs that will sample fast enough to sample up past about 160 odd megahertz. Uh, after that, you need you need to be able to um, to reduce the frequency down, and typically you reduce it down quite a lot. Uh, in the um, Yaesu radius, for example, it's mixed down to thirty six mega uh, thirty six kilohertz. Uh, so the SDR ADC doesn't have to be um, particularly special at all. So the direct sampling radio is as close as we can get to the antenna. But we have to back up a step if we want to go to high frequencies, and that's where this hybrid STR uh, with a super head front end followed by an STR back end uh, takes over. So IFDSP moved the digital sampling to the IF. AFDSP had the digital sampling at the audio frequencies. IFDSP moved it closer to the antenna into the IF. Uh, direct sampling moves it right to the antenna virtually, except for an RF amplifier and a filter. Um, and it's fine for HF, but as soon as you want to go to VHF or, a or uh, UHF or microwave frequencies, then you've got to go back a step and uh, use some sort of super uh, heterodyne stage. <clears throat> this is the, uh, just for interest sake, this is the block diagram of uh, the two receivers in the Yaesu uh, FDDX101. Uh, <clears throat> you've got a, uh, a super heterodyne um, receiver here. This is the sub receiver down here. They're both exactly the same. And um, so there's an RF amplifier, there's a mixer with a local oscillator, you get an IF coming out of here and it goes into an SDR block where there's an analog to digital converter, an FPGA, and uh, then a standard Texas um, DSP block, a digital to analog converter, audio amplifier and output to the speaker. And in addition to that, actually I'm getting ahead of myself. So we fade that out. There is actually a, um, an SDR in the ASU radio, and it's here. Um, so there's a takeoff at the end of the RF amplifier, and it goes into an analog to bit, uh, digital converter into the FPGA and straight into the display. So this is a direct sampling SDR, but it's only used for the band scope. So if we take that out, then you get the super heterodyne hybrid technology where you've got a super het stage here and an SDR stage and a DSP stage. Just for interest, this is the, uh, the simplified block diagram of a Yaesu FDDX5000, which is not an SDR. And um, you see that you've got the same uh, IF and uh, mixer and a local oscillator to produce an IF here. And then there's a second uh, mixer and local oscillator to mix from the nine megahertz IF down to 24 kilohertz for the DSP. So it's not significantly different really to the, um, 
to the FTDX 101. That's the FTDX 101, and that's the FTDX 5000. That's not an SDR, and apparently that is an SDR. So I'll leave that up to you to work out because I find that a little bit confusing. Yeah, direct sampling uh, limits. This is uh, Harry Nyquist. <clears throat> He's the father of direct, uh, father of digital sampling. Without his contribution to science, we might not have the digital systems that we have. He was born in Sweden, but he studied in America and North Dakota, and eventually received a PhD in physics from Yale in 1917. Now, the reason this guy is so important is that he is the guy that worked out that your ADC sampling rate has to be at least twice the highest frequency of the bandwidth of the signals being sampled. So, uh, and that is so that you can recover the, um, the analog signal back after you've messed around with it with the digital signal processing. If you don't sample that, uh, at, at at least twice the highest frequency, you cannot recover or cannot accurately recover the original signal. So if you want to sample all of the HF band and the six meter band up to 54 megahertz, that means you have to have an ADC that can sample at at least 108 mega, mega samples per second. So it's 108 million 16 bit samples per second are coming out of that ADC. So you need quite a lot of computer processing power to manage that. Or you can use a hybrid technology and you can shift the frequency down using a, a super hit stage to say um, 36 kilohertz. Now at 36 kilohertz, you've only got to sample it twice that, which is 72 kilohertz. Um, so that's a heck of a lot easier, much, much cheaper uh, analog to digital converters if you use a hybrid uh, technology, which is probably um, why that's the way things are going. <clears throat> this, uh, this rule is also why sound cards, you know, sound card in your PC, you'll find that it's either working at 48 kilobits per second, uh, which gives you 24 kilohertz audio, which is hi-fi audio, because you can hear from roughly 15 hertz up to about 20 kilohertz-ish. So, um, 48 kilobits carries that quite nicely. Or um, your sound card is also able to do CD audio standard, which is 44.1 kilobits. Um, and that, the, that is 22.05 kilohertz of audio. So, um, yeah, we've got a lot to, to thank Mr. Nyquist for. So, direct sampling is limited by the range of the frequencies that the AD. C so can sample on each Nyquist zone. Uh, an ADC can actually sample frequencies higher than the Nyquist zone, and you can use them, but you can't use, and that's called a second or third Nyquist zone. You can use them, but you can't use them at the same time as you use the signals from the other Nyquist zones. Does that make sense? No. So you can't use two Nyquist zones at once. For example, the Sun SDR Pro transceiver can cover from 0.1 to 65 megahertz, or it can undersample and it can cover from 95 to 155 megahertz. So this transceiver can cover the HF bands, including six meters, and the two meter band, but it can't cover the two meter band and the HF bands at the same time. You have to choose one or the other. This uh, ELAD receiver has a maximum sample rate of 122.8 megahertz or 128 million samples per second. Uh, so <clears throat> it can cover frequencies from 9 kilohertz up to 108 megahertz in two ranges using undersampling above 54 megahertz. This radio can sample, uh, can display up to 24 megahertz of bandwidth at the same time on your pan adapter, which is uh, pretty wide. Now, I note that they don't call this radio an SDR. They call it a direct sampling wideband receiver. And I think that's because of the confusion about what exactly a, a, an SDR is.
So any any radio that's any SDR radio that's capable of operating in the VHF or UHF range uh, will be a hybrid, and uh, that limits the bandwidth of the, that the radio can cover. Most of them are about ten megahertz. Some of them are a little bit wider, like that uh, ELAD. The problem with this is the way that we use the VHF, UHF, and micro spectrum is different to the way we operate on HF. On HF, we tune across the bands. On VHF and UHF, the activity is based around fixed channels generally. Even uh, when it isn't like an EME and satellite operation, it's restricted to small bands with wide spaces between them. And that doesn't really suit SDRs because we've got an SDR that can display 10 megahertz. It might only, uh, it might only be able to display a couple of, of local repeaters um, with a whole lot of unused spectrum in between. Now you can scan the bands or program mem memory channels, but then you might miss something because you really want to be able to see all of the signals all of the time. So what we need is radios that can receive multiple channels at the same time. For example, all of your local two meter, 70 centimeter and six meter repeaters at once, or three or four ear band channels or all of the marine band channels. Uh, you can't currently do that. So this is easier to achieve with radios that are harnessing the power of a PC rather than radios with knobs like the IC9700, uh, which has two receivers. Uh, for example, the SDR Play receiver um, using the SDR Uno you know, free software, they can create 16 receivers. So you can monitor 16 channels at uh, UHF or VHF at the same time as long as they're within a certain bandwidth. So uh, there is still an argument for um, black box SDRs that uh, plug into the PC. So SDR developments, well, it was very exciting in the early days. There was a lot of uh, development and uh, most of the software was open source software, so a lot of people tinkered with it, and there were a lot of software forks and changes going on and uh, new ways of doing um, DSP and uh, new radio coming out uh, pretty regularly. Every two or three months, a new radio would come out. It was all very exciting. And... Um, the, a lot of people spent thousands and thousands of hours developing new SDR hardware and particularly software. And the software, they gave it a wall away for free. Uh, it was all pretty much open source. Um, and there was great collaboration and that really drove things forward. Uh, on the other side, there's commercial um, interest in military um, software defined radio. Most cell sites are software defined. A lot of military radios are software defined. So there was a lot of development going on there outside of the ham radio world as well. So there was lots and lots of uh, receivers particularly and transceivers, but mostly receivers. Um, receivers because they're easier to make um, and the big benefits that you get from software-defined radio uh, affect receiver performance. You can make a software-defined transmitter, and it's fine, but it's no better generally than a, um, than a conventional one, whereas there were huge advantages in, uh, in adding, uh, making receiver software-defined. And it all became so popular, the SDR has become a bit of a buzzword. And everybody says their radio is a software defined radio these days. And not all of them are, and some of them are hardly software defined at all. Another development that's come out is uh, GNU Radio or GNU Radio. Um, this has allowed um, people to develop their own software defined radio software using code blocks. It's kind of a Lego system. And um, it's really good because you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to write your own um, pen adapter software. You don't have to write your own digital DSP software. 
you can just use blocks that other people have, uh, have written and you can tinker with them and you can plug them together and you get a software to find radio code out the, out the end. And that's great. Um, but I wonder if it stifles innovation a little bit because um, people aren't driving, uh, driving the code further. They're just reusing the code blocks other people have, have developed in Python or C++. So there hasn't been really anything much new over the last few years, which is a bit of a disappointment. Apart from the big three, the uh, ICOMs, of course, have revolutionised the um, the transceivers and probably killed a lot of the used radio market um, because they've released uh, radios, ICOM and now uh, Yozu, have released radios that um, have just offered a lot of features that used to be only on the very high end radios. And uh, they've offered these uh, features like PSK decoders and R uh, RTTY decoders and band scopes and sharp filtering and uh, all this sort of stuff <clears throat> at a reasonable price that a lot more people can afford. And so uh, it's really revolutionized uh, the uh, ham radio and there's an awful lot of uh, IC 7300s out there. I did a talk to a uh, ham radio club in America, and they said that 86% of their membership owned a, uh, an IC 7300. So remarkable. So why are the big radio manufacturers now waking up and, uh, and making SDRs? Why have they changed? They had a great market and... Um, They've been very successful for a long time. And um, so why did they change? The answer is better performance, better features, much cheaper to make because uh, RF circuitry is difficult to make and difficult to make well, particularly um, filters and things like that. Good filters are expensive to make and difficult to tune. And um, because so much of it's in uh, computer software, there's really no alignment required with these new radios. So uh, it makes the production line much easier. You have to speed up. Um, so the pan adapter. Uh, software defined radio people call it a pan adapter and the um, Older DSP radios call it a band scope. It's basically the same thing. A band scope, uh, the uh, VFO frequency sits in the middle and you can see frequencies above and below. A pan adapter, you can see a chunk of the band and you can move the receiver or the transmitter around within that, uh, within that area. So you could transmit here and receive here, even though the center is here. Um, so that's the main difference between a pan adapter. Now, Yozu and ICOM get around this, and they don't use either term. They don't call it a band scope, and they don't call it a pan adapter either. They just call it a scope or a display. This is a picture of um, CUSDR, which unfortunately the development stalled on, which is a real shame because it was a lovely piece of software. Um, people sometimes say, oh, well, you know, I can connect my uh, my new ICOM radio or my new Yosu radio to a monitor and it looks fab. And I go, ooh, I don't really think it does. Um, when you're used to something like this, which is very high resolution, um, those other displays really don't cut it. And the other thing about this is that this type of display, you can control all the radio functions um, because all the radio functions are in the PC. Um, whereas the uh, the scope you display on a monitor with these other radios, you can click on it and move the frequencies and things, but that's all. Um, there, just one point. <clears throat> the um, hardware radios with knobs are still using S meters. The pan adapters on software-defined radios tend to not use S meters. They tend to display in um, DBM, 
which is a much better thing because these meters really don't mean anything. S9 on one radio is not the same level as S9 on another radio, whereas a DBM is a DBM. This scale here on this uh, is so accurate that you can use it, uh, you can use the device as a spectrum analyzer. So time of frequency and range. So <clears throat> the ADC in an SDR converts the spectrum into digital signals that divide at a defined rate measured in millions of samples per second, typically 122.8 uh, million samples per second for a direct sampling HF receiver. But for a hybrid receiver, it could be much, much lower. It could be something like 72 kilohertz. And ADC is working in the time domain because it's taking, um, it's, it's deciding what the level of the RF signal is at units of time. Now that's fine for the receiver because that's what we want. And um, we want the DSP to produce data that can eventually be converted back into analog. But for the spectrum display, we don't want that. We don't want uh, to see what the, <clears throat> um, level is at different times. We want to see what the level is at different frequencies, and that's called the frequency domain. And the fast Fourier transformation is a very complicated uh, mathematical structure that converts data from the time domain uh, in millions of samples per second into bins in the frequency domain. Each bin has a width, so it's the level of the signal within a small chunk of frequency. Uh, they say it might be um, 10 hertz wide. And uh, the spectrum scope is actually made up of stacking all those 10 hertz wide bins side by side by side to produce a, an image of the um, frequencies across the spectrum. So the, uh, the new radios offer uh, two independent receivers. That's a big step forward with these uh, SDRs. Uh, the older radios had dual watch, which was uh, sort of two receivers in the same band. But these radios can have two, uh, you can monitor two completely different bands at the same time. So you could monitor a band to see uh, if your friend turns up for a scared while you're working um, another station on CW on a different band. Or you could decode CW with a uh, skimmer on several bands at the same time. Or you can listen to the pileup and the DX station to find a good spot to transmit on. Or you could just uh, have uh, one receiver sitting on a, a band, say the six meter band, just to see uh, if it's open or not. You could sit it on a, um, on a beacon frequency and just leave it sitting there. Great for contest stations because you can check what a band's like before you switch. And uh, also you can tune around on um, one band while, uh, while it's gone a bit quiet on the other band. Some SDR receivers offer as many as eight completely different independent receivers. So in the hardware radios, like, with, like the AC and the ICOM, you get uh, two. Uh, this is a flex radio um, showing four, and uh, some of the flex radios can actually do eight receivers. And uh, I've only got two ears, you say. I can't listen to two things at the same time, or four things at the same time. Well, you don't have to listen to it, but you can see what the band activity is like on different bands. So uh, in the middle here, <clears throat> you've got a split operation. So you're transmitting on one part of the band and receiving on a, a slightly different part of the band. And you're also monitoring the 20 meter band and the 10 meter band at the same time. There we go for time. Oh, I think we're just about up. I might have to skip this. So um, direct Fourier conversion is a uh, technique uh, proposed by Phil Harmon. Unfortunately, it's stored, and the idea of it is that um, you do an F, um, FFT on the entire HF band and then just pick the ones you, bits you want 
uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work as well as it should. And uh, so there's some bugs to be ironed out of that. So although converting all of the FFT bins back into the time domain is feasible, converting selected FFT bins causes horrible problems that are yet to be resolved. So I'd really like someone to pick that up. Um, other advancements, uh, controlled envelope SSB and dynamic pre-distortion CESSB is used experimentally by some operators and it is a feature of some radios. And it can give you a boost of average output power of about two and a half dB. Um, what it does is the software looks at the modulating audio and it modifies the data so the overshoots that would cause clipping are eliminated. And that can push, that means that you can push the average modulation level up. Now, a two and a half dB increase in signal is like stacking a Yagi on top of your existing Yagi. So um, it's a huge improvement. For, uh, without having to add any extra hardware. So it's well worth doing. Uh, it could turn a um, it could turn a 100 watt transmitter into the effectively a 178 watt transmitter and it can turn a 1500 watt transmitter into a 2600 watt transmitter. So that's uh, one of the things that they're doing. Pre-distortion is the other thing. It's a way of cleaning out these uh, intermodulation products that are inevitable on the sides of a wanted signal. With um, pre-distortion, the same sort of thing happens. You look at the, the um, output that the radio is putting out and you correct the modulation that's going into the transmitter so that you don't get the intermodulation product. Um, now that's fine. But it's not a fixed thing. It has to it has to change continuously as the uh, modulation changes. So it's quite clever and difficult to do. Um, you can get a typical improvement of around about twenty dB of uh, transmitted intermodulation performance. So there's a um, there's a typical transceiver of the two tone test. And this is the IMD that's produced out of that two-tone test. And here's the same transmitter running pure signal. And you can see just how much cleaner it is. It is truly amazing. So the ARRL guidelines says that the largest intermodulation um, peak, which is that one there, should be at least 30 dB down below the PEP level, which is the top of the screen. With pure signal, this particular radio, which is my radio, my NN100, uh, is achieving 80 dB down below the PEP level. So that is amazing. Hooray, I've finished right on time, I think. So um, thank you very much. Back so over Andrew. to you, Rob. Yeah, not got too many questions, but there's been quite a lot of discussion going on on the uh, chat. But you did say that early on that there's not much development going on now. Um, this is what people want to talk about. Would you say we've reached peak SDR then, or what? I hope not. Um, I, th I think originally there was a lot of people tinkering around with boards and um, they were developing new things and it was very exciting because there were a lot of new changes and they were collaborating with a lot of other people and they were making a lot of new changes. And um, so it was very dynamic and very exciting. And those easy fruit or that easy um, advantages, there's not so many of them around now. Um, so I, I don't think it has peaked, but, and I'd like to see things like um, uh, the drip Fourier conversion and the, um, and uh, the um, dynamic uh, pre-distortion and thing included in more radios. There's no reason why that couldn't be included in radios that have knobs. Um, so the, yes, there's still there's still advances to be made, but maybe not um, as quickly. Okay, I'll just put a couple of points to you um, that came up on the chat, David. Uh, David Crump. Uh, uh, disagreed when he said uh, it seems to have stalled. He said lots of SDR developments for amateur TV use in the last uh, three years. And John Regnold, hello John, says he, I also disagree. The use of GNU radio modules can be incredibly innovative in amateur radio, an extension of open source development. A few quick thoughts on that. 
Um, yep. Okay. So as far as GNU radio goes, I have no experience with it. And uh, I'm sure that it is right. I, my point really was that because you can just pick up modules and reuse them, maybe not so much innovation is happening. Um, but maybe it is. And, um, and that's, that's, that would be great to see. And um, I'm sorry, what was the first one? Uh, uh, um, digital TV, digital TV. Oh, yeah. Radio. Again, I have no experience with it. Um, that's great. That's great. I think um, digital TV is, is, a, is a, a logical way to go. STR is a logical way to go for digital TV because a digital TV requires a wide band signal and STR is excellent at wide band stuff. Uh, so, yes, there's huge advantages in using SDR receivers for that and for satellite um, use as well, things like your, uh, your QO100 and things like that. I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't be on that satellite without SDRs. Yes, so GB3RS has been on uh, QO100 uh, already today. Well, that, Andrew, um, time is getting on. Um, it must be coming mm. to midnight with you, well past your bedtime, I imagine. It so is thank past you my for, bedtime, yeah. Thank you very, very much for uh, giving us the, uh, the time today. Um, if you'd like to find out more about Andrew's book called Software Defined Radio, uh, funnily enough, it's available from the RSGB shop. Have a look at the, uh, at the website. Well, stay with us here on the Learn More About channel for the story of the Second World War Radio Security Service after, well, appropriately, this short visit to the NRC at Bletchley Park. Thank you for calling, and um, this is um, Joel Bravo for Romeo Sierra, the um, RSUB president of Callsign, uh, operating from Bletchley Park. Uh, name is Stuart, my own callsign is G3YSX. So back to you, G0PHO, GB4RS. Yes, good morning, Stuart. Good morning to you. Thank you for answering the call. You're five and nine plus four. I was going to give you a five and nine plus five, but you it's back papered up a little bit. And uh, you're now plus ten, so it's very, very good. So the name is then is Potter. And uh, we're located just outside of Folkestone on the southeast coast. Sierra to Ashford. Or Trafford. <laughs> whatever whatever you call it. On a Kenwood uh, 7610 and a G5 RV running up the garden. And you're a very good signal. Nice audio, Stuart. Very, very nice. I'll tell you your name again. My name is Zenex Zulu Delta Echo November Echo Kion. Zenek, okay, thank you very much for the repeats. I wish you all the best in 7-3. Oscar, Kilo 1, Papa Charlie Alpha, please watch us on YouTube. This is GB3RS. Who was that, please? CQ20, CQ20, CQ20. Golf, Bravo 3, Radio Sierra. Golf, Bravo 3, Radio Sierra is calling CQ20. United Radio 5, Mike, Quebec X-Ray. United Radio 5, Mike, Quebec X-Ray. Good afternoon, thank you very much for the call. You're 5 and 9 plus. Hello, welcome back to the National Radio Centre again. Uh, I'm joined this time by Ed G3 Zulu Lima X-Ray, I think. Did I get that right? That's right. Okay, yeah, that's right. right. Excellent. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, Ed's one of our volunteers here, joined us recently. So, Ed, what brings you to us? Well, retirement was the main incentive and the convenience of it being nearby. Uh, with working life having filled so much of my time, I wanted to put some more time to radio. Excellent. And uh, you've been an amateur for a few years, I'm guessing, uh, from about the G3. 51 years. 51 years. 51 Excellent. years. Excellent. Licensed 1970. Right. So, uh, okay. quite a long time. Not enough time spent on the radio, though. Oh, well. And now you're devoting some time to showing everybody else amateur radio here at the Indeed. RV. Encourage people to take up the hobby. Yep. It's uh, fascinating indeed. And, and what sort of things do you do here at the NRC? Well, at the NRC it's a mixture. Uh, we operate the radio, which is one of the biggest attractions, uh, but also we talk to the visitors uh, to introduce them to amateur radio, uh, all aspects of the hobby, um, 
and uh, the relationship between the radio centre and Bletchley Park, the reason yep. why the radio centre is placed here. Yeah, I know, just, just having been here today, we've seen a wide range of visitors come through the door and it, it, you never know who's going to come in, do you, on any given day? Not at all. Uh, they come in bursts as well, so you often have a lot of people to talk to, or maybe one or two yep. uh, individually. And the questions, of course, are always of interest and spark off a discussion yep. uh, about uh, any aspect of radio, yep. uh, propagation it, particularly. It's really great for us because it, it spreads the, the awareness of amateur radio. Even if the people don't take it up, they are aware that amateur radio is there, and we see that as a you know a really big attraction. Oh yes, very anyway, much. Anyway, thanks, Ed. Ed, great to talk to you, and uh, I'm sure you're going to be operating GB3RS during the day as well. Oh, but, I uh, hope so we'll, too. We'll go back to some radio audio now. 5959. Uh, Roger, good evening. Also 5959. Good luck. Thank you very much. Please watch us on YouTube. Just search for RSGB Online Convention. You are that, please. This is GB3RS. Golf Bravo 3 Radio Sugar is calling CQ20. Italy November 3, yes, GB Bravo. The Italy November 3? Roger, Italy November 3, Echo Zulu Bravo. Italy November 3, Echo Zulu Bravo. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the call. 5 9 plus 10. Roger, Roger. Thank you. My name is Fabio. Fox Alpha Bravo Italy Oscar. You are 5 9 plus 20. Very strong signal. Grazie. 73. Thank you. Grazie Fabio. Ciao. 73 QRZ. This is GB3RS. Golf Bravo 3 Radio Sierra. Germany. Baker 3 Radio Sugar is calling CQ20. Okay, the Echo Alpha 5. Echo Alpha 4. Go ahead. Echo Alpha 4. Go ahead, please. Echo Alpha 4, Hotel Lima, Quebec. Good afternoon, thank you very much for the call. 5 and 8, 58. Thank you, thank you very much, my friend. Uh, one question. Would it be possible you confirm my contact in qsl.com? Yeah, no problem, we upload the log, no problem. Can you please have uh, my senior report? Can you please give me my senior report? Oh, thank you very much, Juan. You have 5 and 8, 58 in the log. QRZ, please. This is GB3RS, special event session. GB3RS, Golf Bravo 3, Radio Sierra. GB3RS, Germany, Baker 3, Radio Sierra is calling CQ20. Echo Alpha 1, Japan, Germany. Echo Alpha 1, Japan, Germany. Good afternoon, 5 and 9, 59 plus. Okay, you see, I'm 59 plus, okay? Very, very strong. Okay, well, they're going great guns at the uh, NRC. And for those of you who are requesting uh, Stuart to get on to 40 meters, because there's inter-G uh, conditions today, um, he's there, as you can see. Uh, I make him on 7114, actually, but uh, that's just a case here. I have to take. Right, if you've recently joined us, welcome, wherever you are in the world, to the Learn More About stream, courtesy of the RSGB Online Convention 2021. Hello, I'm Jim, G4AEH, live from my humble shack in Nuneaton in central England. By the way, if you put a question into Catherine Mitchell earlier in the day, a lot of them came in uh, quite uh, towards the end of the conversation. She will be answering those questions and the answers will be put up on the RSGB website in the next couple of hours. So if you did ask a question, uh, they won't go unanswered. They will be on the uh, RSGB website shortly. And there is another stream running parallel to this one. Of course, it's called an introduction to <clears throat> Excuse me. And just starting there is having fun with electronics, coding and amateur radio with John Hislop, G7OHO, and the intriguingly named Steamet. Um, you can always catch up on that one. All presentations will be made available in due course. Now we're joined by Dr. David Abritat, who is a former Royal Marines commando, RAF officer, zoologist, and most recently, a lecturer of international relations and security studies at the University of Buckingham. And he was a guest on QI on the telly a while back. So where does radio come into it, you may be asking? Well, if I tell you that his book, The Secret Espionage War of the Radio Security Service, 
It's still available from the RSGB shop, it may become clear. Radio amateurs, of course, played a big role in the RSS, but uh, David can fill you in on the details. Welcome, David. Um, Hi. Military, military, passion, uh, military history is a passion of yours, I gather? It certainly is, yeah, and uh, hopefully I'll entertain you for the next 45 minutes. That'll be brilliant, and of course you can get your questions to David or comments on the chat facility. So David, over to you. Thank you, Jim. Well, um, yeah, it's a pleasure for me to uh, be part of the convention uh, this year. And uh, as Jim said, I've, I've recently published a book called Radio War. And it's really exclusively focused on the radio security service, which is hopefully of uh, significant interest for radio amateurs and the role that they played right the way through the Second World War. Uh, it was a, really a, the genesis of the book was from my first book, which was about D-Day. And I'm a, actually a career Sig inter, uh, signals intelligence um, practitioner. So um, it was a, an organization I knew very, very little about. Um, so it really spawned the, uh, the, the second book, which was, which was Radio War. And many, many of you know the, um, the crux of Second World War SIGINT is very, very in the sort of the, the public perception is very much focused on Bletchley Park and the work of the, the code breakers in, in Bletchley. But the story of World War II signals intelligence is much bigger. Um, it's an industrial scale um, process, not just in Britain, but overseas as well. But I'm just going to focus particularly on, on the radio security service. And I'll talk through its origins, its work, how it was organised, um, and then um, just a few vignettes uh, from it as well. So they were very much the, the subject matter experts for the German intelligence service and other aspects of Axis intelligence around the world. Um, but the origins really stem back to um, the First World War. And at the start of the First World War, licensed and unlicensed um, radio stations have been closed down um, to prevent any breaches of the Defence of the Realm Act in, in August 1914. And I've just thrown up this quite nice, nice schematic of um, the plots of Zeppelin routes coming across uh, the North Sea from Germ Germany in May 1917. And it's really just to emphasise the point that the start of the First World War really was the um, saw the dawn of, of signals intelligence in Britain. A number of um, intercept and direction finding or DF stations were opened up, mostly on the East Coast. Um, focused on uh, the German Navy, um, German Air Force, um, and it was certainly a number of those were actually started by radio amateurs, and a, a famous one being Hans Stanton on the um, east coast in Norfolk, uh, started by Clark and, and Hippersley. And, and so the, the, the intertwining of uh, amateurs in the story of, of the genesis of, of signals intelligence in Britain is very, very, very strong. So um, in 1915, the Secretary of the Wireless Society of London, which was the predecessor for uh, the RSGB, Rennie Klein, wrote to the Times newspaper, suggesting members um, should be recruited to monitor the airwaves um, for what we refer to as illicit wireless transmissions. So transmissions from German agents operating in, in Britain. Um, but there was no real active use of radio amateurs during the, during the First World War. And a few years later, in 1928, a standing interdepartmental subcommittee, uh, the Committee for Imperial Defence, or CID, recommended the War Office should use radio amateurs for such a role to work alongside the already established uh, signals intelligence units within the military and foreign office, which monitored transmissions overseas for the Government Code and Cipher School, or GCNCS. But Really, uh, one of the most important things that happened just before the war um, was uh, this chap came onto the scene, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Adrian Simpson. Uh, he was formerly uh, a Deputy Managing Director of Marconi and had intercept experience during the First World War. And he wrote this fairly um, seminal report on illicit wireless intercept, um, which resonated around uh, government circles one of the things it suggested was a technical advisory committee um, to oversee uh, priorities and requirements. And it also set out a plan, you can see on the left, of how to structure and organise um, the, the country in the way um, they wanted to bring in um, 
radio amateurs into the fold. So um, originally the organization was called the Illicit Wireless Intercept Organization or IWIO, um, but it eventually formed um, various organizational structures, uh, but it fell certainly from 1941 onwards under um, SIS control, like MI6, the Secret Intelligence Service, under the chap there called Brigadier Richard Gambia Parry, who was the controller, or the, the designated controller of the RSS, uh, and based at uh, Hans Lake Park. Um, but he oversaw various other aspects of um, communications, um, security, uh, and communications apparatus for um, British intelligence during the Second World War. One of the main parts of um, the RSS structure was the signals group. And I'll talk a bit about various aspects um, as we go on uh, this, this talk. Um, but certainly the, the basis for the entire organization was um, the GPO, the General Post Office um, Telephone Conference System, uh, which was a structure around the country. And it was the basis, the infrastructure that was in place to allow um, intercept from stations around the country to be played through multiple um, direction finding stations almost instantaneously to get uh, directional fixes on those transmissions. So the organization was first located in uh, Sea Wing of Wormwood Scrubs Prison, um, co-located with MI5 at the time. And MI5 had, had been pushed out to Wormwood Scrubs because of the, um, the Luftwaffe attacks in central London. And they were linked by teleprinter to, to Bletchley Park. It was originally part of MI8, MI8 being the um, military intelligence unit that oversaw signals, intelligence, administration and organisation. Um, and they were designated MI8C. Uh, but as I mentioned, in 1941, they became part of the Secret Intelligence Service. So the story of uh, the Radio Security Service really stretches across all three of, of the modern day um, intelligence services. Probably most interest to all the radio amateurs listening is the work of the voluntary interceptors or the VIs. And the basis of that uh, was from Lord Jimmy Sandhurst or Ralph Mansfield, who put forward a proposal for a nationwide network of interceptors, DF specialists, who could get into that ground wave and he was certainly wanting those personnel to be distributed every 10 to 15 miles so a nationwide network and he put forward a memo to the director of mi5 in october 1938 to expand this fledgling organization and he discussed this with arthur watts uh, the former president of the rsgb and started to recruit um, rsgb members which would form the the backbone of the radio monitors required for the new service. The first 50 VIs that were recruited identified over 600 German agents operating in occupied Europe. But it's estimated there were between 1,500 to 2,000 recruited uh, across the entire country. And a couple of fairly famous ones there in the top left, that's Helena Crawley, who I think has recently died, aged 103. Uh, she was based in the Orkneys. And Ray Fortley, the chap in the centre there with the Royal Observer Corps uniform. Um, so these voluntary interceptors would operate in their sheds, um, in their attics, in their front rooms, real sort of dad's army stuff. Um, as an individual, they were vetted by local police, um, but they were really recruited because of their experience and their skills in, in operating radio receivers. And they split the country into nine regions, each of which was run by a regional officer who would typically have two to 400 VIs in each of those regions. They were typically given Royal Observer Corps or Royal Signals uniforms so they could um, hide in the noise and give them some form of cover. Um, but the agreement was they would contribute uh, just more than 48 hours a month which would um, allow them to avoid home guard or fire watch duties. Many actually did more than 160 hours a month. Um, they were very, very passionate about what they were doing. Obviously, a lot of them had full-time jobs as well. Um, 
they were recruited because of their more skills typically and they were graded um, into three uh, three grades so grade a uh, would be 23 words per minute grade b would be 20 words per minute and grade c 18 words uh, per minute and the basis of their work was to fill out these log sheets you can see an example in the bottom right um, filled out by a chap called Bob, Bob King, who uh, many of you may know, he died uh, fairly recently, unfortunately. Um, but these log sheets were essentially what the VIs filled in every day when they were monitoring a specific frequency or they were doing a general search over a specific frequency range. And they were sent onwards in a double envelope to a, a fairly anonymous PO box, PO box 25, as it was known and more on that later. So um, the logs were often sent back to them um, with comments. You can see some of the comments in red um, on, on this particular log sheet, which would say things like watch please, or okay covered thanks, or more please. But it would give the VIs a bit of direction on what to look for and to spur them on into doing even more um, for the organization. They were formed into typically local groups who would have a, a VI group leader who was then in turn responsible to those regional offices I just mentioned in various parts of the country. The regional offices would have a small staff. They would often have their own office in a, in a local town or city, and they would hold occasional meetings uh, with the group, which were often in um, local pubs, in the back rooms of local pubs, um, or directly with the VIs themselves, encouraging them to spend many hours diligently searching for and copying stations to send messages. And to give you some idea of the scale of the operation, by 1941, the logs were flooding into PO Box 25, reaching a peak of 10,000 pages in a single day. It was an industrial scale effort, and subsequently um, they were responsible for the vast amount of target knowledge on not just the German intelligence service networks in occupied Europe, but all over the world as well. And I just want to highlight one particular individual um, that is a remarkable man, uh, genuinely. Um, many of you probably know that, if you, if you know me, you know I'm disabled. Now, this chap, Edward Bridge, um, in the middle of the COVID restrictions last year, um, his local town, Burskoff in uh, Lancashire, um, unveiled a blue plaque on his old house. He was awarded a military medal during the First World War after capturing a German machine gun post in the Somme um, with the King's Liverpool Regiment. And after that, he was uh, quite severely injured. And those injuries um, left him completely bedridden uh, for the rest of his life. And he developed an interest in radios. Uh, he learnt Morse code and obtained a wireless licence. He was subsequently enlisted into the RSS and through his work against uh, Group 10 or X traffic he started exploiting um, a German Abwehr network, the Abwehr being the German military intelligence service. This network was operating in New Jersey in uh, the US under the double agent William Siebold. One of the agents in the network uh, was a German agent called Fritz Duquesne, who was running 33 agents. And it subsequently became known as the Duquesne Spiring. And the RSS and Bridge in particular and the FBI were monitoring the network, showing Abwehr activity, not just in, in the USA, but also in South America and Mexico. The network was disrupted in June 1941. And in a trial in the Federal District Court in Brooklyn, New York, on, which began on the 3rd of September 1941, the 33 members of the network were given over 300 years in prison. And Duquesne himself was given 18 years. It's still the biggest espionage case in American history that ended in convictions. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill personally wrote to Bridge and uh, I quote, I was stirred to hear of your splendid war work. You have not allowed physical disability to prevent you playing a fine part in the fight against Nazi Germany. May I send you all good wishes and my warmest congratulations upon your success. The RSS was integral to the MI5 double cross system that many of you may have read about. Um, they were instrumental in identifying agents and understanding 
knowledge of their arrival in Britain for MI5, and also understanding how far the disinformation was spreading in German intelligence. Among the first 21 spies to arrive in September 1940 were four that come in by dinghy, two by parachute, and some by fishing boat. And several arrived among the large number of genuine refugees which flooded in during the German occupation of Western Europe. But not all these arrivals were enthusiastic or competent. Some gave themselves up as soon as possible, and some were easily caught because of their ineptitude. But few came without our prior knowledge due to the radio morse intercepts made by the radio security service. Many who tried to avoid capture and please their master did so because their families were being held as hostages. Out of all the illicit entries into Britain um, at the start of the Second World War, nearly 30 were made into double agents working on our behalf unknown to the enemy. They were given code names and at least four codenamed Tate, Zigzag, Tricycle and Garbo were of great value, especially Garbo in the run up to D-Day. I'm sure many of you have read the Ben McIntyre books, um, which you can find out more details of, of these agents. Another agent, um, Snow, he was also very important in the early days of the RSS when they were working close in close collaboration with MI5. Now, I mentioned PO Box 25. PO Box 25 was this location, a place called Arkley View in Barnet, which is in North London, which opened on the 3rd of October 1940. This was very much the operational and administrative hub for the organisation. So those intercept reports, those log sheets were sent there and it became an industrial process. Much of it was Amphia hand cipher, but there was some machine Enigma traffic that came through as well. Arkley was run by Lieutenant Colonel Kenneth Morton Evans, who was the Deputy Controller of the RSS. He was originally a company commander with 4th Battalion, uh, the Welsh Regiment. His course of the war was to fatefully change after eating a Pembrokeshire sausage, uh, which infected him with trichinosis. On his sick leave um, in spring 1940, he was returning from his medical board on the train and he met Captain Edmund Vale, who was the RSS Regional Officer for Wales, who encouraged him to join the RSS. And he made a very quick um, rise up the hierarchy. Traffic analysis was a hugely important speciality for the RSS, akin to what other pioneers in this technique at, at places like um, uh, Sixta, the um, traffic analysis section in Hut 6 at Bletchley Park on the people like Gordon Bushman. So the RSS collection and direction finding resources were collated around a, a number of groups, each of which was ostensibly a, a radio net controlled out of a hub. The study for each group was the responsibility of a group officer who reconstructed the signals plans of the communications networks using direction finding and other sources to discover those locations. Um, the first two groups I'll mention, group one was called Harry. This was an Abvia network controlled from the Hamburg transmitter. And this network had some very long distance radio links with clandestine agents operating overseas as far afield as South America, uh, the USA, Angola, and Mozambique. Uh, the one that you can see in front of you is Group 2, which is referred to as Bertie, Bertie being Berlin. And this was, again, another Abwehr station, um, but by far the most significant of all the RSS groups. The network had links and subcenters across Europe, as far afield as Poland, Norway and Spain, which routed daily information back to Berlin. But the groups weren't just focused on German intelligence services. Group 12, for example, was focused on Russian clandestine transmissions. Group 9 focused on Palestine traffic. So it was a much bigger um, apparatus than just the German intelligence services. One of the most secret parts of the radio security service was the radio intelligence section, or the RIS, led by Hugh Trevor Roper, which was based in the Arkley View HQ. 
Um, Hugh Trevor Roper works alongside Charles Stewart, Stuart Hampshire, Gilbert Ryle, all of which became Oxbridge professors after the war. They were the recipients of Bletchley Park decrypts, as well as other source material on specific radio nets that the RSS was covering. They were responsible to receive, but also maintain and publish target knowledge on enemy intelligence services activity. They guided the priorities for interception and advised group leaders on what to focus resources on. So these were the hub of the machine and um, in places like the National Archives, you'll find some very, very um, comprehensive reports from the RIS um, on, on certain aspects of their, their target knowledge. Hugh Trevor Roper famously um, broke an, an Abvia hand cipher in his flat in, in Ealing. And when this was reported up to his commanding officer, Colonel Woolwich, he was ordered to write um, a document about how he'd done it. Um, unfortunately, that got circulated to his normal customer set, and um, which caused a bit of uh, uh, friction and reaction um, with his, um, certainly his MI6 counterparts, because this was very much the province of Bletchley Park and they were severely reprimanded. In fact, um, Major Felix Cowgill, um, who was the new head of the MI6 Counter Espionage Section or Section 5, sought a formal uh, court martial for Trevor Roper. The RSS needed full time intercept stations, and it created a number around Britain. Um, one of the main ones was um, Hans Lake Park which was taken over in August 1941. Captain Reggie Wick was in charge of the advance party. And the building work was completed uh, by May 1942. It very much was the engineering and direction finding headquarters for the organisation. The engineering group was led by one of the world's foremost direction finding engineers of his time, uh, Major Dick Keane who previously worked for Marconi and was the author of most of the major texts on the subject of radio direction finding. The RSS positions had 66 state-of-the-art state HRO uh, receiver positions there. The OIC for the engineering section was a chap called Robin AD, and uh, the height of the war, Hamzo had become such an integral part of the signals intelligence machinery on which the RSS had been built. The Brigadier Gambia Parry hosted visits from General Eisenhower, Field Marshal Montgomery, and General Alexander. So direction finding was a very big part of the RSS work. And it really goes back to 1938, when uh, the GPO, the General Post Office, created three new ADCOC DF stations at Sandridge, which was just outside St Albans, Stockland, which is just outside Bridgewater, and Cupar, which is north of Edinburgh. These were all built out of uh, the post office's own funds, but it was very much the first RSS radio activity prior to the Second World War. Alongside this existing ADCOC DF system, in 1940, a new DF system called Space Loop Direction Finder, which had been developed at the National Physical Laboratory, was brought into the RSS by Jerry Openshaw. The central DF plotting control room was actually in Barnet under the control of um, Openshaw, and they could take bearings up to 500 miles distance, covering HF uh, frequencies between two and 30 meg. But the RSS also operated medium frequency DF stations up to frequencies of, of three meg. But they were a similar design, but much larger, with four 30 meter high guide latticed steel aerials. This system used tanks. You can see um, them on the back of the truck there and um, being put into the ground. The, the concept being locating these tanks in the ground would screen out any radio interference. The tank was connected to four external aerials linked to rotatable coils called a goniometer inside the tank and they had to dig a hole that was eight foot deep and 13 foot wide to accommodate the tanks 
And these were installed at DF sites in St Earth in Cornwall, Wymondham, Bridgewater, Forfar, Thurso, and at Gilderhurk in Northern Ireland. So Wymondham was a typical DF station. It comprised eight staff. You'd have a sergeant in charge and seven other ranks. The team would do three eight-hour shifts, but with only one operator at a time actually housed inside the metal tank. During the day, uh, the other people around would do routine maintenance work, such as running the auxiliary power generators in case the mains failed, checking the calibration of the DF equipment and so on. The night shift was probably the worst and most soul destroying from 2300 to 0700 in the morning. And the operator was on his own entirely, obviously in the dark, in the middle of the ground. There was also a series of mobile detection units, which were distributed around the country for what we call the last mile DF on those illicit signals. So when you're trying to track those um, enemy agents in a town or in a country, you need um, pretty um, good uh, mobile uh, DF systems. So they had uh, three remits to investigate suspect transmitters after the DF of the signal on instruction for the discrimination group using the DF fans and short range DF units. They maintain listening watches on suspect buildings by setting up stations with a within a quarter of a mile of the suspect site. Special equipment was used which was uh, designed by the post office or by the engineering group, which would mechanically mark signals of interest, highlighting frequency and time of transmission. And they'd also provide mobile units for use on the continent, which were deployed um, certainly um, during the Normandy campaign onwards when we um, took on the second front. Another aspect of the work at Hanslake was reverse engineering. After the Allied invasion of France, in June 1944, the Radio Security Service would give implicit instructions to the Field Security Police to make sure any wireless telegraphy sites sets that they were to come across, particularly those belonging to agents, to understand their design, their operating ranges and their procedures. This particular set you can see in front of you um, was from Yves Grilsha who was operating as a stay behind agent, I think in Normandy. Um, so this was around June, July, 1944. You can see some of the sets that he was using. Another aspect of the radio security service, which I wasn't aware of was the fast uh, work and global uh, network coverage. They had numerous um, resources overseas. They were referred to as special sections, and were largely manned by military personnel. But they were sent as far afield as Tanzania, Gibraltar, Egypt, Malta, Palestine, the British Cameroons. They also had liaison officers with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Canada and a good working relationship with the Royal Canadian Signals, the FBI, and also the US Coast Guard interception units off Northwest Africa in March 1945. I'm just going to highlight one aspect of, of the overseas work, and that's from MERS, which was the Middle East uh, Radio Service, which was a, an, an RSS facility at a military camp in Sidi Bashir, um, a few miles east of Alexandria in Egypt. Commanded by uh, Captain Jack Hester and was um, originally established in February 1941. Alongside Gibraltar, it was the first RSS overseas station, and it had 15 intercept positions. It had a number of interception priorities. Um, for example, Italy, uh, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and the Aegean networks, and had very, very close liaison with the combined Bureau Middle East, which was Bletchley's um, outpost in Heliopolis, just outside uh, Cairo which was the, the main SIGINT hub for the Middle East. So the Alexandria collection and the Heliopolis logs were transmitted back to Wadden, which was a village just outside Bletchley, um, the Section 8 um, HQ for the SIS. The MERS detachments um, were also um, deployed out of Sidi Bashir to, uh, as the battle uh, rolled on through the Middle East and uh, North Africa. And, 
these detachments were sent as far afield as Derna and, and Benghazi in, in Libya, and the traffic was relayed back to, to Cairo. MERS was intercepting at its height around 200 messages a day, and they were certainly responsible for exploiting around three quarters of the total Aegean network. And certainly a lot of the insights I've got and some of the photographs you can see are from uh, a chap called Ray Wright in, in New Zealand, who uh, is the chap on the left uh, using the uh, receiver. Gibraltar was another RSS site under the command of Lieutenant Donham and was certainly one of the most active uh, RSS units overseas. It had real success in exploiting traffic, which was conveying Abvia insight into allied shipping movements around the Straits of Gibraltar and exploiting Abvia agents traffic in Spain. These Abvia messages could be intercepted, analyzed, translated, decoded and forwarded through to the Admiralty within 30 minutes of its broadcast. That's pretty phenomenal stuff. There were also RSS um, facilities out in the Far East. These special wireless sections uh, went by sea to Singapore in January 1941 with six mobile units equipped with R106 receivers. The units were commanded by Captain Macmillan from the Royal Corps of Signals and were under the control of the Far East Combined Bureau. Again, that was what the, one of the Bletchley outposts uh, in the Far East. Some sections were deployed to the Royal Navy uh, wireless station in Kranji in Singapore. Others were deployed to Kuala Lumpur. And there was even one mobile unit that was deployed to the Thai border. So very much, it wasn't just a British, um, a British effort. It was a global effort uh, against the Axis uh, intelligence networks around the world. But even in the Second World War, the Radio Security Service didn't avoid media scrutiny. This was one um, headline that appeared in the Daily Mirror in February 1941, which exposed the work of the VIs in their houses in Britain. Um, it was uh, highlighted uh, to the authorities and uh, was subsequently uh, revoked. So what became of the Radio Security Service? Um, at the end of the war, Sir Findlater Stewart um, did a wholesale review of MI5. This was November 1945. And he recommended that the RSS elements should be retained post-war, especially the RSS traffic analysis component. And they wanted and recommended that it was transferred to the newly formed Government Communications Headquarters, GCHQ, at East Coast in April 1946. So under agreement um, from the director of GCHQ, Edward Travis, the VI cadre was decreased down to just 250 personnel, but it formed a new organization, which was called the Government Communications Voluntary Radio Service or GCVRS, which continued doing the work that the RSS had pioneered in the Second World War but focused now on a new target, the Soviet Union, during the height of the Cold War. The RSS work had been invaluable to breaking the Enigma ciphers in Hut 6 at Bletchley Park. It opened up some new insights into the inner workings of the German intelligence service networks. Over 268,000 messages have been estimated to be decrypted at Bletchley from RSS traffic, most of those from Advia hand cipher and Enigma hand cipher. They were most certainly the subject matter experts for the German intelligence services and were integral to the, M the success of the MI5 double cross deception plans, which as many of you know, were vital for the excess, success of Allied operations, arguably the most significant um, for, for D-Day. So that's the end of my talk. Um, and that's the front cover of my book. Um, it's available from all good booksellers, but I'll be interested in taking any questions. Thank you for listening. And available from the RSGB, uh, uh, David. Now, uh, I've got a few comments for you and a question. I'll come to the question in, in a second, but uh, Gordon Hunter, G8WWD, said he was dating a girl in the 70s whose mum had been one of the interceptors. 
And he only found out by accident because they were watching television one night and there was some Morse code on a, on a programme and uh, the girl's mother was able to read it straight away. And this is the thing, isn't it? That they pro other people would have taken that secret to the grave normally. That's right. That's, that's, brilliant. that's a brilliant story. Um, yeah, and, and still there's, there's very few of the RSS operators alive now. They're obviously all in their late 90s and, and low hundreds. Um, but the ones I interviewed have all been very, very tight-lipped. Um, they still maintain a veil of security even to this day um, about what they did during the Second World War. It's, it's fascinating to see um, how indoctrinated they were in, in the security um, of what they were being asked to do. Um, a lot of them were unaware of the involvement of Bletchley Park. Uh, you know, they were sending their material through to a fairly anonymous PO box and weren't really privy to what happened after that. So it's very interesting and obviously a different world uh, from what we now live in. Absolutely. Uh, Andy Cowley says, uh, my grandfather was a spy in World War II and he leaves it at that. Come on, Andy, we need to know a bit more than that. <laughs> Um, now, this looks a bit complicated. Steve, G4HJE says, you mentioned Gordon Welchman and traffic analysis. Fort, Bridgewood, Fort Bridgewood's War Office Y Group, headed by Lieutenant Commander MJW Ellingworth, Major, Major oh my word, HF Yolovich, uh, mm -hmm. who developed TA at Bridgewood's and was the birth of GCHQ TA. Does that mean anything to you? Yeah, Fort Bridgewood's in Chatham, um, which was one of the main war office or army uh, interception sites before the Second World War. Um, they were certainly some of the pioneers in traffic analysis. It's very much a, a, an unreported or you know, not, there isn't many books have been written about the, that sort of component. Obviously, the, the code breaking effort of Bletchley's, you know, being the subject of a number of films and, and, and an awful lot of books. The traffic analysis component was such an important aspect of signals intelligence work during the Second World War and prior to that and post that as well. You know, it's still to this day a very important aspect of the work, um, you know, in terms of uh, trying to understand the network and, and the operators within the network. Um, and it's uh, very much so. There's lots of lots of different entities involved and, and certainly the RSS was some of the very, very comprehensive um you know the work they were doing during the second world war was very very well respected and when uh, when the rss was folded in 1946 um a lot of the instructors uh, and techniques were brought forward into the modern day gchq they were still using a lot of the the tradecraft and understanding about traffic analysis method methods would have been carried forward into the cold war Excellent. Now, I don't know how long you've been with us, um, but earlier on we had a keynote uh, speech from Catherine Mitchell, uh, M0IBG, who revealed during um, a talk that uh, she had relatives who were in the RSS, and she sent a question. She says, um, I've heard that the World War II voluntary interceptors would have been in particular danger in the event of invasion because they were some of the few people with radio sets kept at home. And she wonders, were their radios and antennas kept hidden when they weren't in use? People, I think the, the recommendations were they had to be fairly discreet in where antennas were placed, because obviously the local communities would spot them sticking out of their roofs um, and in their back gardens, and it would raise suspicions. As it often did, local police were often called and, and had to descend on a the VI's house and uh, you know they they would have to explain themselves so um, these these aspects were, were a consideration obviously if, if the German invasion did happen from Operation Sea Lion it, it would have changed the landscape um, and I think there, there was certainly there was invasion plans um, put in place for the for the organization so they could then work as part of the resistance um, if, you, if, if that ever came to pass. Uh, Ian Munro says, uh, absolutely fascinating talk, David. Thanks for cramming in so much uh, rare detail. Uh, Rob Browning says his neighbour, the late Les Jackson, G3OZ, was a VI who was responsible for getting Rob into, uh, into radio. And Steve, G4HJE has come back and he says, my book, Fort Bridgewoods from Victorian Fort to World War II Y Station. Um, uh, Palmerston's Enigma. 
in brackets. I don't know if that's would that be the would that be the publisher or what? I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't go into more detail. So very good. Okay, well look, um oh before you go, I mentioned right at the start that you made an appearance on the telly. I don't know how recently this was on on QI. What was that all about? It was a couple of weeks ago, yeah. Uh, oh, so it yeah, might still be on the iPlayer. It's all a bit embarrassing. Um, <laughs> so in my in my day in my day job, I'm the um, department historian for GCHQ. So um, I have the uh, have to do the odd bit of media work now and again, which is uh, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, it was fascinating to be part of the program. We actually filmed it in February. Um, and it's just really interesting to see how it's all structured. You know, the whole filming took about three and a half hours. That's um, telly for you. <laughs> yeah, they edited it down to, to 30 minutes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It was uh, it was a good laugh as well. And what, what, what was it about spies or something, was it? Spies, sleuths and secrets, yeah. It was a oh. letter S. And so we had numerous bits of our um, GCHQ collection, a um, couple of secure phones and things like that to show them. Oh, I must have missed that one. I'll I'll look it out. And uh, oh, somebody. Um, oh, Steve says G4HJ says his book is published by the RSGB. So thanks for clarifying that, uh, uh, Steve. And oh, I don't know if you can answer this one. Paul M0 GSX says, uh, "Hi, David. Very good presentation. Wonder if you know the weight." I don't know why he would want to know this. I wonder what do you know the weight of the mobile sets that Field Ops carried. <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> they weren't SDR, so I guess they'd be pretty heavy. Yeah, I imagine so. Everything's manpackable, apparently. They always used to say that in the military. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and uh, oh, a comment from David Thorndike, G four O N M O M N. Great stuff. Thank you. Yeah, that's been really interesting. Thank you very much, uh, David. Now I take it because I haven't been supplied with one. You're not a radio amateur yourself. I'm not shamefully. No, I'm. Uh, no, don't be ashamed. But if we can interest you, yeah, I do talk uh, a lot about it, and I, I should really. Um, yeah, if, you, if you're in bigger. the right place, the RSGB website will have all the necessary information. And uh, as Catherine was saying earlier on, you know, the, the foundation license is uh, well, it's a bit of a breeze for her. Uh, you know, shouldn't take too much. Uh, shouldn't take too much. All right. Uh, a reminder that David's book about the Radio Security Service is also available from the RSGB shop. Thank you very much, David. It's been great. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for All listening. All the best now. For now. All right. Take care. And, and talking of Catherine, um, I mentioned earlier on that we didn't manage to fit in a lot of the questions that came in for Catherine because of time and all the rest of it. But she has now answered all those questions that came in earlier. Uh, if you go to the RSGB website, uh, I think we're looking at it now. You'll find um, you'll find the uh, the answers to to all those questions. Uh, I must just say hello to a few people who've been coming up on the chat. Hello to Greg, who's in Los Angeles. Uh, Greg is X G four B S J from Coventry. Uh, nice to hear from you, Greg. Uh, I think you're our best DX so far. Um, I've seen comments from Malaga, South Africa and the Netherlands and if there have been any others I haven't uh, I haven't spotted it but thank thank you very much right let me tell you if you've been enjoying the presentations today uh, I want to remind you that the next tonight at eight webinar is not too far away it's on Monday the 1st of November uh, these are free webinars that are hosted on the RSGB YouTube channel uh, where you are now, actually by David, who's currently hosting the introduction to stream uh, over the way. Uh, the next one in November then uh, will feature Ashar Farhan, VU2 ESE, and he'll be talking about BitX to S BitX. Uh, and it goes on to say the journey and development of this exciting range of transceivers. If you're not sure about what BitX is, like me, um, apparently it's an easy to build six watt SSB transceiver for 14 megs. And Ashar's latest design is the S Bitex, uh, an open source hackable HF SDR transceiver designed around the Raspberry Pi. And uh, in his talk, Ashar will be tracing the history of Bitex with some anecdotal banter, it says here, and some tech pointers as well. So that's on Monday, the 1st of November at eight o'clock. Well, we're going to spend a few minutes now to see how the QSOs are stacking up at the NRC. By the way, uh, 
40 metres is uh, looking very busy as Intergy uh, conditions at the moment. Stuart, uh, the RSGB president, is there as GB4RS on 7114. And I know just up the band uh, is GB75CV, which is the Cray Valley Radio Society. They're celebrating their 75th anniversary this year and running an award. Now, I gather if you work that station, it counts as something like 25 points towards it. So... Uh, uh, have a look for them as well while you're on the band. Uh, so we're getting ready for our next talk at one o'clock or just after, as my stream is about a minute and a half behind here, I notice. Um, when there's a chance to learn more about precision microwave engineering, the fun of making your own components. And that's with Neil Smith, G4DBN. Get your questions in for Neil on the chat facility, or maybe you'd like to send us your feedback at rsgb.org forward slash feedback. We'll be back shortly. 20 CQ20. Golf, golf, Germany, Bravo 2, Radio Sugar, Florida 1, Bravo, Alpha Victor. Florida 1, Bravo, Alpha Victor, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the call. 5 and 9 plus 10. Fox 1, Bravo, Alpha Victor, 5, 9, plus, one, plus 10 in Bletchley Park. Okay, you are 5, 9, 5, 9, your, your report. Uh, my name is Mike. What is your report? Over. 5, 9, plus 10, 59, plus 10, and the name here is Stefano. Sugar, Tango, Echo, Fox Red Alpha, Norway, Oscar. I'm operating from Bletchley Park. We are part of RSGB online convention. You can watch us on YouTube today. Foxrod 1, Bravo, Alpha, Victor, you are in the log. Thank you very much for the call. 7-3 and take care. Uh, Golf Bravo 2, uh, Radio Sierra, the number is 2. Uh, Golf Bravo 2, Roger. Negative is 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Okay, Golf Bravo 3, Radio Sugar, okay. My, my town is Nice, like November, India, Charlie, Echo. 73, bye-bye. 73, thank you very much for the QSO. Take care. QRZ, please. This is GB3RS calling CQ20. CQ20, CQ20, CQ20. Golf Baker 3, Radio Sugar. Germany, Bravo 3, Radio Sierra is calling CQ20. CQ20, CQ20, CQ20. Golf, Bravo 3, Radio Sierra. Golf, Bravo 3, Radio Sierra. CQ20, CQ20, CQ20. Golf, Bravo 3, Radio Sierra. Special event station. GB3 arrest is calling CQ20. Okay, the station ending in whiskey. Italy Uniform 5, Lima Alpha Whiskey, good afternoon, 5 and 7, 57 in Bletchley Park. Luciano, can you please repeat my senior report again? Italy Uniform 5, Lima Alpha Whiskey, can you please repeat my senior report? Okay, Luciano, thank you very much, 7-3, QRZ, please. This is GB3RS, special event station. GB3RS, Golf Bravo 3, Radio Sierra, is calling CQ20. Golf Bravo 3, Radio Sierra, Sierra Sugar, pa Sugar Queen 3, Oscar, Papa Fox, good afternoon, 5-9 plus 20. Thank you very much, 59 plus 10 power. My name is Stefano, Sugar Tango Echo, Fox at Alpha, Norway. Hello there, uh, we're still at the RSGB convention and we're here at the National Radio Centre and I'm joined now by Stuart Bryant, G3YSX, the RSGB president. So Stuart, how has it been today so far? Well, it's always good fun um, talking to lots of uh, radio amateurs around the country. I've been doing this 
uh, on air um, rather than via the internet this time. And you're, you're actually operating GB4 RS, aren't you, today, I think, which is the President's own call sign. Yes, well, one of the, uh, one of the little perks, I suppose, we get is, um, as President, is the use uh, during tenure of uh, the call sign GB4 RS. And if ever you hear me under this call sign or my personal call sign G3YSX, I'm absolutely delighted to, uh, to talk to you. So thanks, Stuart, and we've, we've got GB3 RS on the air here as well. So both stations, an opportunity to work both today, which is quite unusual. Now, Stuart, you were elected as president in April this year. Um, we're in October now. How's it been so far? Well, it's um, always an interesting experience uh, being president. Um, one of the things that's uh, got a lot of my attention at the moment is uh, the IARU uh, Region 1 meeting next uh, week where the, I think it's 100 countries uh, get, down, get uh, together virtually and um, uh, we're going to discuss a number of, of matters of common interest to all of the member societies across the region. In particular, how we move amateur radio forward into, uh, into the needs of people over the next uh, 10 to 20 years. And that follows on from the survey that we ran, didn't it? The very quick SWOT analysis we asked members to contribute to and we published in Radcom. So this is really the progression of that, um, that request for, for input that we're going to discuss with the other IARU societies. Yes, we, we, all the societies uh, did that and uh, the plan is to put our heads together and work out um, across the whole of, um, well, it's Europe all the way through to Asia, what, uh, what we need to do for amateur radio. Yeah, excellent. Any other things on the on the presidential agenda, Stuart? Okay, what's your name? I'm trying to think. Oh, construction competition is my next thing, right? So, um, as you, um, as as a number of people will know, I used to uh, manage the construction competition for for about eight years. I've been doing it, and um, it's gone virtual now um, because that gets a lot more people involved. And um, I'm um, currently uh, looking for someone to uh, to chair the the judging panel, and um, um, this will uh, you'll get the opportunity to uh, to build things over Christmas. Um, the, the details will be in the next Radcom that drops on your doorstep and um, judging will be um, in time to announce the results at the uh, RSGB AGM in um, April, which I think will also be streamed. Yes, I'm sure it will be, yeah. Now, in the previous construction competitions we used to run at the face-to-face -face convention, didn't we? Um, which was a great opportunity for people to see some of the things that were constructed. But we've run some of them last year during the lockdown virtually and online but we're still hoping to get everybody back together for the convention in the future aren't we but we're still going to run the construction competition virtually Th that's the plan because um um the running it face to face is really great uh and you do get to see the the physical exhibits but it, it really restricts the number of people who can participate to those who can get to the physical convention so our experience over the last um, three i think it is that uh, we've run like this now um, is that running it um, as a sort of send your video and your uh, presentation in sort of event uh, allows many other people to take part who would not normally take part and, and construction is really one of the key um, uh, skills uh, that a radio amateur um, uh, can, uh, can can use excellent and we really are hoping to get people back together again for the for a convention next year even if we still stream some of it that we're, we're all missing that face-to-face contact aren't we as well yeah very very much so uh, i'm certainly looking forward to uh, to seeing people face to face again i'm certainly looking forward to the face to face convention but uh three and a half thousand people that's seven times as many people as normally take part yeah have been took part last year and uh, we really can't leave that uh, that audience uh, out of it oh, so it'll hopefully fantastic. it'll be a hybrid uh, event it's fantastic okay thanks Stuart, and uh, more to come on the convention today thanks we'll catch you later thank you all Thank you very much, 73. You are set. GB3RS, Germany, Bravo 3, Radio Sierra, Special Event Station. GB3RS, Golf, Bravo 3, Radio Sierra is calling CQ20. Okay, Golf, Bravo 3, Radio Sierra. Golf, Bravo 3, Radio Sierra is calling CQ20. Is the Radio 3 mic? Radio 3 mic, 
Radio 3 Mike, Bravo Delta, good afternoon, 5 and 5, 55. Thank you, 73. Please watch us on YouTube. Watch for, uh, look for RSGB online convention. Thank you. QRZ, please. This is GB3 RS. Golf, Bravo 3, Radio Sierra. Golf, Bravo 3, Radio Sugar is calling CQ20. Echo Alpha 3 in November. Okay, the Echo Alpha 3 first. Echo Alpha 3 in the November. Echo Alpha 3 in the November. Good afternoon. 5 9 plus 10. Okay, very good afternoon, good five, nine plus ten as well, thank you. Thank you, Marcel, seven, three, good luck. QRZ, this is Golf, Bravo, three, Radio Sierra. GB3 RS, special event session. Golf, Bravo, three, Radio Sierra is calling CQ20. Okay, the Germany. QRZ again, please. Sugar Queen 1, Echo Tell Oscar, good afternoon, 5 and 9, 59. Good afternoon, also 59, bye for now. Thank you very much, 73. QRZ, Golf, Bravo 3, Radio Sierra. Golf, Bravo 3, Romeo Sugar is calling, CQ 20. CQ 20, CQ 20, CQ 20. Golf, Bravo 3, Radio Sierra. Okay. Two India, India, India. Two zero, two I zero, two India zero. Fox on Victor X ray. Two India zero. certainly knocking them off on uh, 40 meters it's looking quite busy over there actually at the moment hello this is the rsgb online convention 2021 live uh, if you missed any of today's speakers from this channel or the introduction to channel both streams will be available later this evening in their entirety individual talks will be available later in the week uh, and while you're here it would be great if you could subscribe to the rsgb a YouTube channel by hitting the red button on the site. That way you'll get alerts when the videos become available. And just starting over on the aforementioned introduction to stream, the prospects for Solar Cycle 25 with Steve Nichols, G0KYA. Our next speaker has a passion for making things. There's a long list of his projects on his QRZ.com page. It's probably even longer now. Neil G4DBN is the man in question. And on the face of it, to me, um, his talk today is not for the faint hearted or uh, maybe I'm just being a wuss, Neil. Well, yes, I think um, I, five years ago, uh, that was the position I was in. I was uh, fascinated by all this um, manufacturing stuff that people were doing and, uh, you know, people were, were making things like this and uh, 
magic little relay for uh, for waveguide and uh, so now i know how to make things like this so uh it's only taken me five years which um <laughs> It, it seems like a very happy five years. Well, you've got just under an hour to teach us how to do it. Yep. Well, I think uh, I, I first um, got into uh, the uh, uh, amateur radio uh, when I was taught by George Dobbs, um, G3RJV at school. So uh, it's been a long, interesting journey. I, uh, I, I then had a, uh, a summer job working at AEI Semiconductors when I was 14 years old, and they were teaching me all about quantum mechanics, and uh, I was doing online computing and all stuff in those days, so it was great fun. But anyway, uh, it's really nice to see the goings on at the National Radio Centre, because back in 1975 as a student, I was actually there learning about quantum mechanics and uh, maths and things like that. Um, it's changed a bit since then. <laughs> Fascinating to see. I've been um, making things for uh, as long as I can remember in um, wood, metal, ceramics, stone, plastic. I'm a basket maker. Uh, I'm a, an avid electronic constructor. Uh, I've been a top band DXer for, well, since, since I first got into radio, really. And I, I do radio now between 8.27 kilohertz and 122 gigahertz. I, I go onwards and upwards to, 100 and, um, to well, 400 terahertz visible light. Uh, I'm doing DXing tests via uh, cloud bounce, but uh, I don't really play on the radio much between two megs and one gig. Uh, there's just so much to do on um, uh, LF, VLF, and microwaves. So I, 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 these days I define myself, this, this, what I do in life is I'm a maker of things. I, I create things. Um, microwaves and machining has sort of taken over my life at the moment. And I'm very, very busy making exciting and interesting things with some very exciting and interesting people. So uh... 45 years ago, as an electronic engineering student in a different life and another century, I took a short course in the basics of machining and metrology, taught by Bob Corley and the team at what was then the Post Office Factories Division. My father and several uncles had worked as machinists and inspectors, mostly on gas turbines and turbochargers. All of them advised me very strongly to choose a career path which didn't involve oil, swarf, noise, danger and 6am shifts. So I followed my Auntie Val and Great Uncle Les into the world of electronics instead. Then microprocessors happened and personal computers, and as a result I've wasted the intervening 40 years getting paid to do things to computers instead of real work. I first got into microwave radio in 1974, and of course I asked my dad for help making a 10 GHz micrometer wave meter and a directional coupler and gun source. Exciting times. I migrated LF for a long time after that, rarely operating above 2 MHz, but I got bored of stamp collecting once I was approaching 300 DXCC entities worked on top band. It took me 25 years to realise that I didn't really enjoy talking to random strangers on the radio. I was more of a maker than an operator. It was a big relief to realise that that was perfectly fine. Five years ago I subscribed to Dubus and saw wondrous creations in metal that were full of mystery about how they worked and how they'd been made, and I wanted to play. My father had just died, and as I'd never really talked to him about machining and metrology and didn't know any machinists, I had to turn to YouTube and Twitter to gain an education. I talked at length to wise old metal bashers who all advised me to invest in old cast iron beasts and learn the trade on those rather than buying a shiny Chinese mini lathe. They also told me very firmly that good measurement tools were vital and to expect to spend at least as much on tooling as on machines. Oh, how I scoffed. Four years later, I had my first article on machine microwave antennas published in Dubus. My mum was very proud. This is the story of how I've had a huge amount of fun turning ideas and theory into functional antennas, filters and other parts. I'm using my newfound modelling, machining and metrology skills with tools that cost about the same as a reasonably fanatical radio amateur would spend on radios and antennas. 
The tale follows the genesis of the designs, the modelling of electromagnetic performance, mechanical stress and heat flow, material selection and how I turned those ideas in my head into real functional objects, enabling folks who enjoy operating more than I do to have fun on the radio, while I have fun making things. My first purchase was a 1962 Bridgeport milling machine, which weighed about the same as a small car. Second through the door was a 1982 Colchester 1800 lathe. With those two items and a decent micrometer, if civilization ever collapsed, I'd be able to rebuild it. I added a horizontal bandsaw and a 14 ton hydraulic press, and I was ready to cut some metal. The first project I tried was a high power 1296 MHz coaxial low pass filter. I used the design tool from Dominique F1 FRV to design a 9th order LPF using 716 DIN connectors. The design tool runs in Excel and it calculates the end effects, fringing, termination adjustments and even factors in the capacitance of insulating spacers. I had some 3mm copper pipe so I used that as the core conductor. The diameter of the outer tube was limited by the size of the 716 DIN sockets. To keep the tolerances reasonable, I picked a 1.5mm air gap, meaning I needed 25mm discs. After specifying the acceptable ripple and the corner frequency, the dimensions looked reasonable, so I made a CAD model in Fusion 360 just to be totally sure there were no issues with clearances or manufacturability. I used Fusion to create a dimension drawing and disappeared into the new rather empty machine shop and started making chips turning some brass bar to 25mm OD, facing it off flat, and then drilled and reamed it to 3mm, cutting small countersinks to help control the solder beads and improve wicking. I parted off the first disc about a millimetre oversized, then repeated the process for the other three discs. Trying to hold a thin brass disc in a lathe chuck or collet is not easy, so I turned the remaining bar stock to 20mm diameter, faced it off, and cut some shallow concentric grooves in the face. A drop of super glue on the machine face of the first disc fixed it firmly in place and left some room for me to measure the thickness. I faced it to the final side, did a very light deburr of the sharp edges and countersunk the central hole as before. A quick toasting from a blowtorch melted the glue and released the finished disc, which I cleaned with super glue solvent and acetone. A swift reface to the block was easier than trying to clean it and I repeated the operation to the other discs, getting them all within size to better than 10 micrometers using a 1 micrometer resolution Mitatoyu micrometer. I popped them into the mill vise with an end stop and drilled a shallow 2 mil diameter hole at three points around the periphery of each disc, and then made some aluminium spacer to hold the discs the correct distance apart, applied solder paste to each disc and fired up the blowtorch. After a clean up I machined the rectangular block to size, drilled and then bored it using a boring bar on the lathe and drilled and tapped the socket mounting holes. It needed a porthole in the underside of the block so I could reach in to solder the pin of the second 716 DIN socket. The next job was to fit and trim the 2mm diameter PTFE pips to length using a 1.5mm thick template, shaving the excess with a scalpel. After soldering one socket to the end of the centre conductor and filing away the excess solder, the next step was to poke a soldering iron through the porthole and solder the pin to the tube. Making that dished plug for the porthole was more work than the entire body, but hey, I'm doing this for fun. I tested the low pass filter using my HP signal generator, directional coupler, reference load and spectrum analyzer. But since low cost VNAs had become available, I used my pocket VNA to check the results. More recently, I bought a Nano VNA V2 plus four, which is much faster to calibrate than the pocket VNA. The match between the location of the zeros and corner frequencies between Quux, the Specan and VNA results are pretty reasonable, so I think my machining must have been up to spec. I needed a combiner for a pair of 250 watt amplifiers on 23 SEMs. Making an air dielectric rat race hybrid seemed a great idea at the time. I used ATLC2 to model the surge impedance of a round inner conductor at the centre of a hollow rectangular outer conductor. The program takes an arbitrary bitmap image as input, using the colour of the pixels to define which part of the cross section is a conductor or air or dielectric and what connects to what. I was aiming for 70.71 ohms with a 10mm copper ring, setting a fixed vertical dimension and varying the width to get the match. 
I machined the body and lid and turned a joining plug for the ring. After cutting the ring precisely to length and soldering the joint, I checked its circularity on a tapered mandrel. Tapered sleeves reduced the mismatch at each port and I supported the ring with U-shaped aluminium spacers and soldered all the joints. Drilling, tapping and counterboring all those holes for the lid was kind of relaxing. Testing showed the return loss was a worst case of 19 dB and interport isolation was over 30 dB with a balance between the two ports of around 1.2 dB. Not brilliant, but then this was more like plumbing than precision engineering. Now I needed a few more amplifiers, so I ordered some 4 inch by half inch copper bar to make myself a few heat spreaders. But when the invoice arrived with a heavy thump in my inbox, I realised I'd bought 4 metres instead of 1. The bar weighed 42 kilograms and cost the thick end of £450. I decided to recoup that by making some DF9IC spreaders for sale. So far I've shipped about 50 of those spreaders and still have a dozen more to finish. I'm almost through my third copper bar now. I had a steep learning curve with machining copper. Snapping an M3 tap is far too easy in nasty, gummy, grabby C101 copper. I migrated to thread forming taps and found some really good tapping compound. Snap taps are now a rare event and usually from carelessness. Face milling was even more challenging. C101 galls and tears as you machine it and it cold wells to cutters. Horrible stuff. I tried all sorts of techniques with fly cutters and shell mills, but I've settled on a trick I saw on YouTube. A 7 bladed 80mm face mill fitted with a single positive rate polished radius carbide insert. By careful choice of cutting insert geometry, spindle speed, feed rate, lubrication and adjusting the slideways, gibs and lead screws nuts to perfection, I'm now able to get a reasonable finish on copper. Moving to C111 free machining copper has helped a lot, although it's a lot more expensive than the gummy stuff. Wholesale copper prices are now more than double what they were in 2017 and the retail cost has almost trebled. More orders for heat spreaders followed with W6 PQL models being popular but also some specials for tiny 5.7 GHz devices, a 3.5 GHz unit with M1.6 screws and some high power dummy load mounts. This is a 5.7 GHz masthead transfer to PA system I built in a steel powder coated enclosure. To get effective cooling to the outside of the case, I machined a rectangular opening in the back panel, then fly cut the surface of an aluminium plate, milling a raised area of exactly the right height to fit through the hole and end up flush with the back face. A flat plate bolts into blind holes in the porthole plate to prevent leaks, and the mating faces of the aluminium have a smear of heat transfer compound. The outer parts in contact with the steel are coated with a clear neutral set sanitary silicone and the whole sandwich was nipped up to a low torque, left for a couple of days and then tightened. I have to be careful to maintain the heat sink above the dew point so I don't get condensation inside the case from the very efficient cold bridge this creates. There's a Gore-Tex breather in the case wall and I flood it with argon each time I close the lid. A container with zeolite desiccated granules inside the case keeps things dry, but the thermostatic control is also a useful protection. I made a few dedicated clamps for this build. These days I'd probably just 3D print them, but I didn't have a printer then. Over the last few years I've made a lot of antenna mounting hardware, things like elevation drives for dishes and EME yaggies, bracing rods for dish feed points, custom quick detach mounts, anti-rotation clamps and even a through mesh porthole for feeders in a dish. Getting the stiffness and precision required for EME elevation drives sometimes needs bronze bushes and grease nipples but I try to stick to ultra high molecular weight polyethylene for bushes as it doesn't need lubrication, it's more wear resistant than steel and has less friction than PTFE. One of the first elevation drives I made was for my own 10 GHz dish. I used a hugely over-engineered elevation actuator that I happened to have and I made close fitting clamps and clevis attachments for it. The mass clamps are made by inserting a spacer between two aluminium blocks then drilling and boring the mast hole. Once the space is discarded the two halves fit very closely to the mast so there is no risk of crushing or slippage. 
I usually cut a fine taper on the edge of each curved face to avoid having a stress riser or any pinching. Where a clamp's going to be in place for years, I usually just use gap filling Loctite to protect the stainless steel hardware in the aluminium threads. But where the bolts need to be refastened regularly in aluminium, I use helicoil inserts or use nuts on the bolts instead of threading the holes. For larger dishes and Yagi arrays, a rather stiffer knuckle arrangement is needed. The torques can be significant and a wider stance is needed to ensure that the mounts can transfer the loads without risk of distortion or fracture. This arrangement is for a 2.4 metre mesh dish which is used on a large pneumatic mast mounted on a van. Counterweights can be added to the rear of the saddle to balance heavy feeds. The bearings are UHMWPE in aluminium carriers with a stainless steel shaft which picks through a machined knuckle. I added dimples to the shaft so it could be locked in place with grub screws. The saddle assembly side cheeks are milled from 10mm aluminium plate and the front section is a rectangular extrusion with 6mm wall thickness. The whole saddle assembly is TIG welded. Being able to weld stainless steel, aluminium and even copper has been a revelation, but I'm still terrible at it. So few of my welded creations ever see daylight. Most of the time I machine off the uglies from the outside, but with practice I'm getting better. I made a rotary welding fixture to hold round things and turn them slowly, so I could maintain a perfect angle and torch separation, but I'm still rubbish at welding. Give it a few years and I might be half competent. Carbon fibre tube is excellent stuff for bracing, but needs care with fixing to prevent it failing from excessive crushing forces. I tend to machine terminals from stainless or aluminium with a slight chamfer on the socket and fit a pin in the core of the tube, gluing the whole assembly with a suitable epoxy or acrylic adhesive. These rods were to support a feed horn on a top fed offset dish. These were a three point quick detach fitting for a large mesh dish with a coarse brass thread and these are to support a 13 cm Yagi above a VHF beam. Sometimes carbon can't be used, like where it's aligned with the E-field of an antenna. GRP is then sometimes the best solution, but it's also somewhat fragile. I often get asked to machine anti-crush plugs to go in the end of even thick walled GRP tube, along with split collars which spread the load of U-bolts and similar small area fixings really designed to clamp metal tubes. Standard size tubes are rarely the correct bore or wall thickness, so they need a lot of machining to get the right balance of stiffness and weight. Smaller bore GRP works best with precision grips and anti-crush plugs. Sometimes anti-split collars made from engineering plastic are needed and can be pinned in place. I made some drilling guides for the collars on one system so the op could fit and drill the collars themselves. Hinge plates for elevation of Yagi arrays present some amusing challenges. I made this one recently. It uses bronze bushes which are made from a lump of bronze given to my father in the 1940s. The bronze was already old by then. He got it from an ancient colleague who was retiring, having worked for the firm since Edward VII was on the throne. My dad used it as a soft anvil. Uh, I hope you'd be happy to know it now has a new life helping to workstations on 70 cm EME. The bushes are split and pinned with a void between them where grease is injected. I had a, a lot of fun making all the fiddly bits for this mechanism. Various friends had asked me about making 6 and 9 centimetre feed horns, so I decided I'd better learn how to use Open EMS to do some modelling of the performance of chokes, the variation with tube diameter and the effects of pin position, size and shape. The first design was a straight lift from the W1GHZ antenna book. A Super VE4MA with a 0.71 lambda bore and almost flat face. I rolled the choke using a slip roller, cut the choke disc, then welded the whole thing together using AC TIG and a filler rod. I machined the block for the end socket with a curved face to mate exactly with the outside diameter of the horn tube. That was... Uh, how shall I say this? Fun. The back short was a turned bit of 5mm aluminium plate with a nice chamfer at the joint to ensure good weld penetration. Once it was all welded and my terrible TIG work was machined off and erased from history, I drilled, reamed and tapped the end socket holes and after a deburr and polish, it was ready to go. 
I didn't put a tuning screw as I had total faith in my filing skills. I managed to stop filing the pin at just the right time for once. The horn worked well until a minor disaster when it broke the fall of a 1.2 metre solid dish and developed a bit of a fold. Rather than scrapping it, I donated another 6 cm horn I'd made to the owner and used persuasion, flames, violence and rollers to get the squished one back into shape. Amazingly, it was still showing a nice return loss dip at 5760 MHz after all of that excitement. It's now back in use by another operator. Not having learned my lesson, I embarked on a few 3.4 GHz feed horns next. On one of them, I used a commercial C-band scalar choke, but that was for a 2.4 meter prime focus dish where feed blockage wasn't much of an issue, and also for a 1.2 meter offset where the blockage was reduced compared with what it would have been on a small prime focus dish, for example. OpenEMS lets me model the pattern with a given diameter and different choke sizes to illuminate specific prime focus and offset dishes with a suitable edge taper. OpenEMS seems to work well once you understand the way it thinks about the world and meshes and ports. It's certainly not as functional as the hugely expensive commercial EM solvers, but there are a few limits on model size so long as you have a big enough computer, and it is of course free. Once I had a model that worked, I drew them up in Fusion 360, mainly to simplify getting a dimension drawing again. There are benefits to CAD even for those of us who don't have CNC machines. Yet. As for the 9cm horns, I TIG welded the back shorts as usual, but after a bit of a nightmare while rolling and welding the choke on the first one, I decided it would cost very little more to turn the choke from a short length of round bar and fit a clamp collar so the choke could be moved. More importantly, it wouldn't need any of my terrible welding. One day I'll get good enough at welding to be able to show my work without erasing the evidence using the metalworking equivalent of Photoshop. As 9cm band horns are generally too large to fit any normal LNB clamp, I often end up spending as much time making clamps and mounts as I do when making the feed horns themselves. Where a 9cm horn's been used for portable work, I usually machine up a radome cover from HDPE bar. This changes the tuning and match, so these days I include the radome in the Open EMS model. Turning a 70mm HDPE bar to 1mm or so thickness is an amusing challenge, involving a custom mandrel and double-sided tape. To make that process easier, I'm working on a vacuum chuck using a very clever vacuum generator. You blow compressed air through a small jet orifice and it entrains the surrounding air, pulling a decent vacuum which will hold thin work pieces against a machined face with tiny holes and grooves and a rotating vacuum seal on the other end of the lathe headstock. The vacuum these things generate isn't high but should give me at least 12 psi or 80 kilopascals different, so a 70 millimeter work piece will be held with the force of around 300 newtons or almost 70 pounds force against the chuck face. The model I use can pull around 0.3 litres per second, so with an internal chuck volume of less than 100 millilitres, the suction reaches maximum in well under a second. One of the other applications of the vacuum chucks will be to hold thin polystyrene and HDPE discs about 200 millimetres diameter, which I'll machine into Fresnel zone plate dielectric lens antennas for the higher millimetre wave bands, but I'll talk about that in a different lecture. After reading Geoffrey Paulin's article in Dubus about short high performance 10 GHz waveguide feed horns, I decided to have a go at making some for myself to Geoffrey's designs. The thickness of the oval iris plate is specified to the nearest 10 thousandth of an inch, and the other dimensions are fairly critical, but it worked very well and is still my primary feed on 3 cm. I made a few more parameters in France and at least one of them is now being used to work 10 GHz moon bounds. After the success with the WA6KBL horns, I was asked to make some dual band antennas for QO100 to the POTI design by Mike, Paul and Remco. I made some jigs and cut the parts on the lathe and mill, soldered them up with a machined spacer and made a machined ring for an LMB dielectric lens. 
it tuned up nicely with the expected dual dip in return loss at plus or minus 40 megahertz as the patch was excited in orthogonal modes with a 90 degree phase difference for circular polarization on 2.4 gig transmit. I even made a couple of contacts via the satellite before losing interest and going back to making stuff. After reading another Dubus article by Andrew VK3CV about the 122 GHz transceiver based on a car radar chip, I had a close look at the antenna designs that Andrew had come up with and decided to try some alternatives for folks who wanted to use flattish dishes with a large FD ratio or very deep dishes. My first attempt was a replication of Andrew's feed horn design but instead of using a shaft and grub screw, I cut a very fine pitch thread into the horn and the mount duplexer assembly to make fine adjustments of the size of the duplexer cavity possible. It was quite a challenging project. Andrew's feed horn had a face about 7mm diameter, with three grooves cut into the face to form a choke, like the chaparral design for satellite LMB horns. Machining such tiny slots needed a two-flute carbide milling cutter, only 0.5mm diameter. Those cutters are designed to spin at 60,000 RPM. That meant making a special purpose high-speed spindle using a 600 watt three-phase motor and a variable frequency controller. I made it with a dovetail mounting so it would fit on the Aloris style wedge tool post on the lathe. I wrote some MATLAB code to generate the taper angle and length of W2IMU dual mode horns and ran simulations to check the gain and side lobe suppression. An important aspect of feed horns for microwave dishes is to balance the illumination of the dish surface so that the illumination is maximised, avoiding too much overspill. A good rule of thumb is to aim for 12 dB edge taper but that also includes the space attenuation that comes from the feed point being further from the dish edges than the centre. Using OpenEMS it's easy to adjust the parameters of the model to optimise the edge taper and side lobe suppression, although it does take serious computing muscle to do the simulations. The IMUs would eliminate dishes in the FD 0.6 to 0.8 range, more effective than the ridged choke design that Andrew used. The core waveguide's only 2mm diameter, so I drilled it with a special fast taper 1.9mm long series drill and reamed it to size with a tiny 2mm cobalt HSS reamer. The flared section's only around 4.5mm diameter with a taper at 27 degrees. I found some sim turn boring bars which were made from solid tungsten carbide and were only 1.7mm across. That meant I could drill the bore roughly to size with a normal drill and then use the boring bar on my lathe to machine the bore exactly to size and then use the compound slide to cut the taper. Using an 800 kilogram lathe to cut these tiny features on parts weighing grams was surprisingly easy, although I had to use a dial gauge on the tool post to ensure I didn't crash the tiny tool into the opposite face as it entered the bore at the end of each cut. I set up a video microscope so I could see what was going on and used precision gauge pins to check the diameter of the outer bore. I've got a set of several hundred of those pins to cover from 0.2 up to 25 millimeters. Edmund Scientific supply low cost polished deep aluminium dishes with an FD of about 0.25. That makes the focus level with the rim of the dish. To illuminate that you would need an impossibly wide horn angle. I decided to design a Cassegrain subreflector using the W1GHZXL calculator sheet. That gave me the coefficients for the hyperbolic curve of the subreflector, which I put into a table to give me a list of coordinates to define the surface shape. Not having a CNC machine, I made a dovetail clamp to fit the cross slide of my lathe and used the XY position table to cut a flat template on my milling machine uh, in tiny manual steps. Then all I had to do was use a round 10mm diameter lathe tool and 10mm round pin to follow the template and I had an instant copying machine which can reproduce the flat curve as a 3D surface. 
The trigonometry and calculus involved to work out the shape of the curve is definitely challenging. I really, really need a CNC machine. The high gain Picket Potter dual mode horns for 122 GHz needed a different approach from how I made the W2 IMUs because of the length of the taper. Once again, I model the dimensions using calculated values for the size of the guide, step, and outer taper. I decide to make the taper 10 wavelengths long and a 6 wavelength diameter opening. I took a piece of tool steel, machined it to 18mm diameter, and then cut the taper on my lathe. After machining it, I used a gas torch to heat it to cherry red and quenched it in oil. That made it glass hard and brittle. So I popped it in the kitchen oven at 220C for an hour to temper it back to usable hardness. The tapered face needs to have a very fine polish and the edge must be razor sharp. So I use the tool post spin as a grinder, spinning the D-bit in the chuck and using the compound slide to put a fine precision grind on the tapered face. I ground off the tip with a relief angle using my decal copy cutter grinder form the step which stimulates the formation of the second mode in the horn. A final lap of the flat face of the D-bit with a fine aluminium oxide paper and then with diamond dust slurry and the D-bit was ready to use. The finish it creates on brass is very good straight off the machine but I still use a tapered Delrin rod with 2000 grit paper to polish any remaining surface imperfections. Once the tape is completed, I use a 3mm silver steel rod in the tailstock to measure the depth of the taper to the step and then machine the face to the final length. After that, there's just the outside diameter, outside taper, an M8 by 0.5mm thread and waveguide cavity shaft to machine. The horn fits in the same modular mount and duplexer cavity as all the other 122GHz parts. I've also made some horns and adjustable flange connectors for 122GHz, machining UG387U flanges with 440UNC captive lock screws. I made my own lock screws after finding how expensive they were to import. I had to make a special tool for that as well, plus a holding jig and lantern chuck to trim the threads to length. The flange adapters were quite intricate as the flange is free rotating with a split lock nut and there's a separate threaded adjustment for the duplexer cavity with its own lock nut. The duplexer body is reamed to 4mm to fit the 3.98mm waveguide shaft and then tapped with 4 M2 holes to mount to the VK3CB boards. Dom F6DRO asked if I could make a biconical dielectric lens for him for a 10GHz feed horn. I machined a 21mm ID brass tube for the horn body and bought some Rexolite 1422 crosslink polystyrene dielectric from Specialist Engineering Plastics. It machined very nicely and gave excellent results. Later, Vili HB9PZK modelled a truncated dielectric lens with a step matching section for the POTI, and I made a couple of batches of those. The step section made it much easier to grip the lens in a collet chuck. I've made a few dual band setups using a cluster of single band feed horns, some mounted over and under, some side by side, and it struck me that using dielectric lens feed horns would allow, say, a 5.7 and 10 GHz feed to be mounted much closer than those with chokes, reducing the side lobes and loss of gain you get when a feed isn't exactly aligned along the dish axis. I started with a 5.7 GHz horn, running an open EMS model to optimise the electromagnetic design and then CAD as usual to get the exact dimensions into a drawing. Machining it was challenging, as I wanted to maintain the outside diameter at 40mm to fit the standard LNB clamp. That left the wall thickness at 0.8mm, rather too thin to be machined reliably. More mangled aluminium ended up in the scrap bin. On the third attempt I had a usable body. At that point I decided I should probably make the walls slightly thicker and make a custom clamp. Reducing the inside diameter would compromise the electromagnetic performance too much. The 10 GHz horn went much more smoothly, the first attempt looked good, and after trimming the SMA pin to length at the first attempt, the return loss was acceptable. A quick test on a turntable confirmed that the illumination taper was within spec. I mounted the horn on a spare offset 1m dish and aimed it at the sun and then cold sky. 
It showed around 5 dB of excess noise when beamed at the sun, with a beam width of around 2 degrees. I could probably have squeezed another dB or so out of it by careful adjustment of the position of the lens horn. The next step will be to make a waveguide fed burst of the dial spike horn with a tapered transition from WR90 or WR75 rectangular to 21mm circular guide. So, what does the future hold for the DBN machine shop? So far, everything I've been doing has used manual, subtractive machining and traditional fabrication techniques. But there are things that I can't do using those methods. CNC machines with the same precision and performance as my old manual clunkers are furiously expensive. So I'm working on CNC add-ons for the Bridgeport and Colchester. That'll take away the stress of cutting the dozens of tiny slots on 24 gigahertz slot array antennas and also make it easier to make close fitting covers for microwave PCBs to help suppress waveguide resonances inside cases. It'll also mean I can machine arbitrary compound curves, aspheric lenses and make complex 3D shapes from solid. If I ever get better at welding, I now have a giant slip roller to make 23SEM and 13SEM choked aluminium feed horns with welded seams and milled stepped polarising septums for large circular polarised feeds on big EME dishes. My biggest EME dish is only 3 metres diameter, tiny really. As for additive machining, I've invested in a Prusa 3D printer for prototyping as there are now suppliers who will take a CAD file and use laser sintering to make solid metal 3D printed parts. I'll be able to make prototypes in plastic before ordering the metal parts and making expensive mistakes. Another application of the 3D printer is to make casting patterns so I can make complex parts from molten aluminium or bronze using Petrobond oil bound sand in a dragon cope and sodium silicate sand hardened with carbon dioxide to make cores for hollow castings. Even fancier castings possible using the ancient lost wax technique but with a 3D printed positive made from polylactic acid filament. The prints coated in slurry and sand or investment casting plaster and then the PLA is melted out and vaporised in a kiln. The empty moulds then fill with molten metal and you're left with a solid cast metal replica of the 3D object. Another 3D print application is using pre-perm dielectric filament to make complex lens horns and dial spike dial guide antenna feeds. I'm also working on anodizing and electroplating for surface protection and improving surface conductivity. But the most exciting use of chemical deposition, I think, is electroforming. If I want to make an elliptic tapered corrugated feed horn for 47 gigs or higher to get the best possible RF performance, I need to cut very deep, very narrow and very, very precise internal grooves in a tiny horn. All but impossible, especially in copper, which is awful to machine at the best of times. The trick is to machine a negative mandrel with the shape of the inside of the corrugated horn in aluminium and then etch off the oxide immerse it in a zincate bath, then straight into a gold electroplating tank with the power on. The zinc layer disappears instantly, leaving bare aluminium, which allows gold to be plated onto the mandrel. That's followed with a plating of silver or nickel, and then a thick copper layer. The outside's machined to size with the mandrel in place for alignment, and then the whole thing's immersed in a hot caustic bath, dissolving the aluminium, leaving behind a gold-plated copper feed horn with those tiny internal corrugations. So that's how I do my amateur radio hobby. I've still got a lifetime of challenges ahead in machining, design, modelling and metrology. Taking my abstract ideas and bringing them to life as physical objects is already enormous fun, but the bonus of being able to use those parts to talk to people on the radio is the icing on the cake. Um, I'm sure that was metalwork porn to uh, some of our viewers today, uh, Neil, but it confirms to me that I am indeed a, a, a wuss. Um, do you take orders? 
Well, I've got a bit of a backlog, to put it very mildly indeed, but um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, a surprising number of parts for people. Uh, the thing is that people see the sorts of things that that uh, I'm I'm making, and then they they go away and they have daft ideas, and they say, "Can you make a?" And so I usually say, "Probably," and they yeah. have a go. Yeah, I used to work in an engineering company myself, and I can still smell the suds if I uh, think about it when I was a youngster. Yes. But uh, I used to order the bits for the lads on the shop floor to work their uh, work their magic. So, uh, and 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 there's been a few comments actually. Uh, I'm not sure who. He only identifies himself as one too, but he says amazing engineering there. But uh, and I have to be careful how I uh, I may have to edit this. It says uh, it looks <clears throat> extremely expensive. Shall we say? um those little horns that i make and i, I ship off the uh, the 122 gigahertz ones um i usually i don't charge anything more than the cost of materials you know i'm not doing this uh, for income so um one of those uh, little horns probably cost you about 20 quid 25 quid something like that and i'm wondering uh, if he thinks it's uh, i mean setting all that gear up for you well, yeah cost a, you cost know. a lot of money that's the... if you think something like these little um transitions i don't think it'll focus but uh, these little transitions you find them on ebay second hand for 100 pounds well there's what 15 quids worth of material in that but yeah the um the the cost of machines i i i'd usually say it's about the same as a a decent transceiver um you spend maybe 1500 pounds and you can get yourself a bridge port um it weighs more than my wife's car did and uh you know it's, it's not a hugely expensive thing to get if you want to get something shiny and new sky's the limit you know you you would have to mortgage your house but uh there are machines out there and a lot of the stuff that i've got is second hand um you know people have shut down engineering workshops and suddenly i end up with uh, a load of micrometers or uh, all sorts of uh, of measurement tools and um uh, things to fit in lathes that really only cost pennies. Okay, you started all this at the age of 14. There can't be many 14 year olds today, I don't think, who would be um, be exposed to this in, in the first place to even to even take it up. Um, what well, do you think I, it's going to be the future of engineering like this? I think that's a bit of a problem because I remember at school, we, we did metalworking at school and I, I was using lathes and milling machines and shapers and grinders. Uh, from actually from the age of about 11. Um, it was uh, it was just the thing that everybody did. Nowadays, though, if you think the way the technology is going, this idea of using metal 3D printing is really quite mature. And it's although it's fairly expensive, if you want to make a hundred of something, it's not that bad. Mm. Of course, you're doing all this because you became attracted to microwaves. <laughs> I think re-attracted is the right word. Oh, re-attracted. Well, what is it about microwaves that, uh, that has this fascination for you? I, I like the idea that you could lose the antenna because you put it in the wrong pocket and you don't know where it is. Uh, and that you've got the, the same amount of gain as a, a huge moon bounce antenna that you can hold in your hand. Um, but I, I think... A lot of people are still stuck in the 1970s idea that microwaves, you have to go to the top of a hill with a tripod and uh, get cold and wet. Uh, all of my microwave operating is done from home and I'm doing almost any day of the week, I'm doing 400 kilometer contacts and uh, I have regular skeds with somebody at 340 kilometers. And we, we even have, if it's raining, we sometimes have rag chews, uh, three and four way um, on FM and, uh, and D-Star. So, Surprising what, what you can do with microwaves. It's, it's just endlessly fascinating. Bring on the rain. A couple of comments on the website, uh, on the chat, I should say. Uh, G1 PPA says, great talk, Neil. Well done, mate. That's from Steve. Uh, cracking talk, Neil, and great skill. Well done. That's Chris G0WUS. And Heptode says, that was joyous. I'm uh, using CNC, so can you recommend the trans... So can tr recommend the transition. And he wonders what grades of aluminium are you using? That's GM4 LVW. Well, it, it varies. It depends what I can find. I, I, I Sometimes I buy unknown mystery metal uh, that you, you see if you go to a traction engine rally or something. And uh, 
I, I've got some fantastic seven series um, aluminium alloy that is obviously aerospace alloy and it, it's beautiful. But uh, yeah, the stuff you buy off the internet is not brilliant. 6062 and um, uh, uh, things like that are, are, are not superb, but they're cheap. Yeah. Um, now, you said you pick up a lot of your stuff second hand. What sort of place do you get them? I've got a question here. For someone who's been excited by the last 40 minutes, but without their own workshop at home, where's a good place to start? Ooh, now that's a really tough one. Um, it's uh, There are lots of maker spaces that have got lathes and milling machines, and they tend to be underused because everybody's going there and using the electronic stuff and they're using the, uh, the laser cutters and so on. But if you can find one that's got uh, a milling machine and somebody to explain how to do it without injuring yourself, it's, uh, it's a fantastic resource. And, and do, do can you find these things like on the you know uh, auction sites on the internet and things yeah. you know the machinery? I, I would avoid eBay, um, but there are lots and lots of specialist um, sellers out there selling second-hand machines. Uh, I bought both of mine from uh, both my big machines from somebody that was just advertising. Um, it, it wasn't an option. Uh, they just had um, um, they'd taken this machine in and refurbished it and uh, and sold it on i think the uh, that big lathe of mine i i could have bought myself for i don't know about 1500 pounds i could have bought myself quite a nice looking chinese lathe but instead i get something that weighs 10 times as much and that's hugely more powerful and much more useful and a lot more accurate for uh, i think it cost me 1800 pounds altogether and that included the shipping but that was just somebody that i found uh, that that did refurbished machines and what have you got? A shed or an outhouse, a garage? Where, where do you keep them? Uh, um, yeah, I've got um, I, my, my house was thrown together in 1850 and uh, it used to be um, uh, a small holding. So it's on, on, a, on one of the estates up, up here in East Yorkshire. And uh, there's a, a brick barn attached. Um, so what I did, I got my friend over the road who's a builder to build me uh, a machine shop inside the barn. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's. It's tricky, but I do know people who are doing it in basements and bedrooms. You okay. wouldn't want to do. You wouldn't want to be splashing the amount of oil I splash about though in your bedroom. In your bedroom, I wouldn't think so. Oh, we've had a comment from uh, from Australia. VK two R eight says that was amazing, uh, inspiring. Really enjoyed your explanation of your thinking behind each step in making the pieces. It was a very professional presentation, I have to say. Uh, they all really well done, and uh, the anonymous emailed question any recommendations for getting started with cad oh now i found there was a nice loophole with fusion 360 i used to use eagle cad design for uh, pcbs and it turns out that if you spend 100 pounds on your eagle license you get a free copy of uh, fusion 360 thrown in without any limitations other than you, you don't get any online um, rendering and, and so on. But it's a, it's a fantastic bit of code is, uh, is Fusion 360. The learning curve was nightmarish, absolutely awful. I, I just could not believe how hard it was to get my Windows infected brain into using something that wasn't really Windows centric again. Uh, but it's, it's just stunning. However, there are other ones that people are using. Uh, what I'll do is I'll collate a list of all of the things that I'm using and some other stuff, and I'll put them on my website with uh, with a link. I was going to ask you about your website. So where will we find that? G4DBN.UK. So, <laughs> easy enough to remember. <laughs> easy enough to remember. There's there's lots on there. Oh, well, yeah. that's great. Okay. Well, I think that's all the uh, the comments we've got. Uh, thank you very much. Now that was a really tremendous uh, presentation. So thank you. And uh, what, what's what's the, your next project then? I think the next project, the one I'm working on at the moment, is uh, for a six meter EME elevation system. Um, but uh, I, I've got a few ideas about the thirty terahertz band. So um, yeah, more about that later. <laughs> thirty terahertz is absolutely fascinating, um, but you can you can use an electric fire as the transmitter. Yes. Well, maybe that would be the subject of another convention talk uh, sometime in the future. Thanks very much, Neil. Great to see you. Okay, cheers. Well, short break now while we line up our next speaker. If you've seen his YouTube videos, you'll know that 
anything could happen in the next hour. Uh, the DX commander, Callum McCormick, M0, MCX, comes clean about his obsession with antennas. But first we'll uh, see how GB3RS and GB4RS are stacking up the contacts at the NRC. And while we're on the break, uh, do give us your feedback about the convention. Uh, we'd be very grateful if you could spend a few minutes filling in the online form and telling us your thoughts about the day. The uh, address I think is on the screen now, www.rsgb.org forward slash feedback. We'll see you shortly. Joe, uh, enjoy your day. And, um... Thank you very much, and uh, Mike, and enjoy your day. And Mike 3, Mexico, the rest of your call sign, please go ahead. Mexico 3, Mexico, America Yankee. No, um, I need it slightly slower and a couple of times. Mexico 3, Mexico, I need your call sign, please go ahead. Mexico 3, Mexico, America Yankee. M3, M-A-Y. Mike Alpha Yankee, thank you very much. Five by nine here at Metal Park. Name is Stuart, and uh, part of, I'm the RSGB president uh, operating out of uh, the National Radio Centre. Mike 3, Mike Alpha Yankee, Golf Bravo 4, Romeo Sierra. Okay, Stuart, no problem, sir. Operator is Matthew, and I'm in West Yorkshire there, and you're 5 and 9 plus 20, over. Thank you very much indeed, and um, enjoy your day. Mike 3, Mike Alpha Yankee, Golf Bravo 4, Romeo Sierra, QRZ. Golf Whiskey 4, Oscar Kilo, Tango. Golf 7, November, Juliet x -ray. Right, I'll take the... Um, there's a, a golf station. I'll take the golf station first. Go ahead. Golf 7, November, Juliet X-ray. Golf 7, November, Juliet X-ray. Uh, golf 7, November, Juliet X-ray. Thank you for calling in. You're 5 and 9 here at Fletchley Park. Uh, name is Stuart. Go ahead, please. Yes, you're 5 and 9 here in North Somerset. Lovely signal, Stuart, and enjoying watching the convention. GB4RS, G7NGX now. G7NJX, I think that was. Uh, G3NJX, I think it's GB4RS, I think it was. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. 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 Yeah, I think that
Thank you very much. Glad you're enjoying it. And uh, QRZ from Golf Bravo for Romeo Sierra. And welcome back to the National Radio Centre here. Um, at the moment, the stations are all fairly busy, so we're going to leave you listening to the station audio, I think. Um, we've got Ed operating on 15 metres at the moment. He's on the flex. Um, and Stuart, the RSGB president, is currently operating on 40 metres. Uh, Martin is operating on uh, 2 metres SSB. And Stefano is actually operating on the QO100 satellite at the moment. So we've got all four stations on the go. We'll leave you with a selection of their audio. Sierra, QRZ. Golf 8, uh, Victor, Juliet, Uniform. Golf 8, uh, Victor, Juliet, Uniform. There was another station I'll get you next. Golf 8, Victor, Juliet, Uniform. Thank you for calling in. 5 and 9 here at Bletchley Park. Name is Stuart. And of course, I'm Golf for Yankee Sugar X-Ray. G8VJU, go ahead. Yeah, very good afternoon to you there, Stuart, from G8VJU. You're a uh, stonking signal. Five and nine plus ten into uh, South East England. Um, good luck with the station. I know there's many calling. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, GACJU. Go Bravo for Romeo Sierra. Go ahead. Go Bravo. Right, Golf Echo Bravo again, please. radio here and uh, I can't join in I'm um, di dying to get on to 7114 uh, hello again and welcome back to the learn more about stream live part of the RSGB online convention 2021 before we go on I must apologize about my lighting I'm sitting in front of a south facing window which is massive it requires two sets of blinds side by side and unfortunately the join the gap between them is right in front of me and that's where the sun is streaming through at the minute so apologize for that don't adjust your sets how to stage a d-expedition 
without breaking the bank. Ray Novak, N9JA, is about to suggest ideas for QRP de-expedition fun with SOTA, POTA and IOTA. Weren't they the Teletubbies who failed the audition? Anyway, that's about to start over on the Introduction 2 stream. We're going to hear from a radio amateur now who could almost be described as one of those YouTube influencers, but in the field of amateur radio. Last time I looked, he'd got over 39,000 subscribers to his DX Commander YouTube site, and I think a lot of them are queuing up on the chat at the moment. During the first <laughs> <Good>. lockdown, <laughs> he ran a very popular COVID net to check on the welfare of radio amateurs all over the UK. He's a self-confessed antenna nut whose all-band vertical design is popular with amateurs all over the world. You heard him cackle there. Welcome to the 2021 RSGB online convention, Callum McCormack, M0MCX. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, and it's nice to hear your voice, Jim, not reading the shipping forecast. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking a break from, uh, from that. So okay. we've got this talk coming up. I can't believe you've pre-recorded it. What's going on? Uh, well, I mean, I, I could do, you know, stuff down here and live uh, you know I, i've got the tech to do to do it live but it's a big show and i just thought i'll pre-record it and then we can do we got the live q a afterwards which is why i've got the yeah. other camera here so if we need yes. to scribble things we can have a play you know yes so if you've got questions for callum do get them on the on the chat do get them in early because a lot of them come through just towards the end yeah because remember what you're seeing at home is probably a couple of minutes after we after we put it out, so there's, there is quite a long delay on on mine at the moment. Actually, yeah, I'm looking at certainly it a minute. Yeah, so yeah, we will talk more, and uh, hopefully, you'll answer those questions after we've heard about your obsession with antennas. Thank you. Well, a very good day, everybody. My name is uh, is Callum. I am from DX Commander, and RSGB have asked me to give a presentation to the convention, and I think. The topic was kind of left up to me, as long as it was something to do with antennas. I've, I've called this an obsession with antennas because in the modern world, we buy radios, right? Now, 50, 80 years ago, people were making radios, either from kits or, you know, old televisions or something. Or did they have TVs then? I can't remember. They'd make them from kits, you know, from old junk all sorts of stuff. And people are still doing that. There is a market for the home brewer on the radio front. But I'm an appliance operator, like most of us are these days. Therefore, the one thing we really can change about our lives and about how we operate and about how efficient we are and how well we can hear, how well we can transmit and so on and so forth, is the antenna. And I don't know about you, but I go around B&Q, or if you're in America, Home Depot, and I'll see a painter's pole or something. I'm the first person. Wendy's going, what are you doing now? <laughs> I'm going, oh, wait a minute, this could be a good support for a portable doublet, you know. An obsession with antennas. So I think what we should do is just lay down a couple of axioms. First thing I want to talk about is decibels. Now, it's got a good history. DBs, okay, it started off with Bell, Bell Telephone, Bell Laboratories, I don't know, Bell, okay. And they noticed when they polled their customers that a customer could definitely tell when the volume had dropped enough to go, oh, the volume's gone, gone down. And they called that one Bell, okay. It was all to do with a standard cable mile or a cable mile standard or something. Very old school stuff. But as they improved their measuring techniques, they discovered it wasn't enough granulation in the bell. So they called it a decibel, tenths of bells. Hey, now, DB is quite interesting. You can't, no, under normal circumstances, you can't put an antenna up or, and they use DBs for optical glass, radar, it's all sorts of stuff where we use the term db you can't have oh i switched on my gadget today and it was 4 db for it's got to be 4 db better than something uh, it's relative to something else we often use dbi dbd db v 
DBW and I'm just very briefly going to explain what that is because I'm going to be talking about DBs and I just want all of us on the same page. So let's talk about something called an isotropic radiator. Now, an isotropic radiator is an imaginary antenna which is infinitely small, okay? And it radiates in all directions. So it's a sphere. It's a sphere of RF. Radiates everywhere. It's imaginary because we can't make one of those. What we normally make is, let's say, a dipole. Now, a dipole isn't an infinite. What it is, a dipole, let's put a vertical dipole down here. A dipole will radiate more that way and that way in free space. And there's a difference between dBi and dBd at this point. It's just over 2 dB. Right. So if we've got an antenna, any antenna, we'll use purple, and it's got a gain of, oh, let's say 3 dBi. That means the difference between this bit, the edge of the dBi, and there, the difference is 3 small b, Small d, big D, big B, right? Three. Now, what does 3 dB actually mean? Well, every 3 dB is doubling our power our, or our reception or our antenna gain or our optical clearness, whatever they use in that, in that uh, industry. Every 3 dB. So you can, and you can add... Uh, and you can add dBs together. So for instance, if something is 6 dB better than something else, then we can quickly work out, well, 3 dB is doubling and 3 dB is doubling again. So if we had an amplifier that had a gain of 6 dB, all we need to go do in our mind is going, well, if I'm doing 100 watts and this is a 6 dB gain, that's like going from 100 to 200 and from 200 to 400. So there's our 6 dB. And by the way, it's not linear. So 10 dB is actually tenfold, all right? So our 100 watt radio at, uh, with a 10 dB gain amplifier is giving us the equivalent of 1,000 watts out the other end. So 10 dB um, is a factor of 10. And you think, oh, it's not much difference between 10 and 13, for instance, but it's another 3 dB. And remember, 3 dB is doubling. So our 100 watt radio which is I've got a 10 dB amplifier would be doing a thousand watts, but a 13 dB amplifier would be doing 2000 watts. So that's, that's dBs. We get to some interesting things when, um, I mean, when I was a young foundation student, I had a real complicated idea about dBs. <laughs> and a lot of it I just used to guess. So for instance, the RSGB um, band plan, or the Ofcom, the Ofcom band plan, for instance, we're allowed, I don't know what it is, I think it's 16 dBW, I think, 16 dBW. What does that on top band? So on top band, for instance, we're allowed 16 dBW. I don't know if it is, by the way, so I'm going to have to look it up. But let's just pretend it's 16 dBW. How do people know it's 30-something watts, right? Well, we can do, let me change the, turn the paper over. We can do it quite easy. If it was 16 dB, dBW, what does 16 dBW mean? Well, one W is one watt. So it's 16. Well, this is easy because 10, we know, is going to be 10 watts. 13 is going to be, double it again, 20 watts. And 16 is going to be W again, so it's 40 watts. So it must be 50 dBW, I think, because I think it's 36. But anyway, by using a mismatch of threes, you can normally calculate in your mind exactly where someone's going with dBs. And that's really important in a minute. OK. Next thing I want to cover before we head on to our obsession with antennas is the fun we have with takeoff angles. So let's go back to the planet Earth here. 
and we have an antenna sticking up off the ground. We we kind of know if you in it if you're watching this video, you're at the RSGB conference conference uh, convention, or you're on YouTube or whatever, and you're watching this, you'll know some of these concepts anyway. But clearly, if I want to talk, if I'm here and I want to talk to another station there, it's pointless me sending my signal straight up in the air, in the main, right? There can be an advantage to that on very low bands where we want to go up, refract, and come straight back down, and that's called NVIS. That stands for Near Vertical Incidence Sky Wave Propagation, where the signal goes straight up and straight down. I'm not talking about that right now. What I'm talking about is low angle radiation. So in other words, it's called takeoff angle. We want our signal in the main to be to leave our station at a fairly low angle. Now there's been some great experiments done on this and um, using all sorts of arrays of antennas and computers and switches and everything, listening to very long haul DX, long distance radio, and what angle they were receiving it at. And it's anywhere between up, up down to two degrees off the horizon. This is the long haul stuff, up to about eight, maybe nine for long haul DX. On 80 meters, sometimes it can be a bit higher, apparently. Now, as a, I'm an antenna manufacturer and I'm supposed to know some basic things. And for years, I must have built about a thousand different models and certainly up to a hundred different antennas and tested them all out in the back garden here. And what I discovered is it's hard to get low angle transmit. It just is, okay? So we want to make an antenna and measure it, let's say 10 degrees off the horizon. It's actually a lot easier and you can convince yourself your antenna is quite a lot better at 10 degrees than it is at five. As long as you measure everything at five degrees off the horizon, you'll know that Normally, under normal circumstances, and this is a VHF or very tall tower, right? But there are some exceptions to everything. In the main, five degrees will give you a good baseline if an antenna is going to perform for DX, long haul stuff. Five degrees. I'm doing that now because we're going to get in to do a little bit of five degrees on here. Um, I think it's worthwhile just covering what antennas are made of. I'm not going to do, I'm not, I'm not going to do this business of how does an antenna work. I remember seeing a 1970s um, documentary and they had the cameraman and the producer trying to convince this professor, right, about when he was about, when they're about to go live and about to interview him, the question is going to be, how does an antenna work? And there's this professor going, why would anybody want to know that? Well, it turns out that he could explain it, but it would take him well over an hour and nobody in their right mind would ever understand it. So I call it the magic of radio. And I remember on one of my videos once, somebody actually left a comment, probably one of these professors. It doesn't help anybody if you call it magic. Well, obviously it's not really magic, right? But if we're going to make an antenna, we need to make it out of a conductive material. Now, we know what resistance is. Resistance is measured in ohms, okay? So if something has a res resistance, we use resistors in circuits and all sorts of things. Conductivity is also a parameter we can measure, normally in Siemens per meter, all right? So, for instance, copper has a pretty good um, conductivity, and there's a good chart on the internet, which I'll just fire up now. So here it is, uh, silver has got a very good electrical conductivity of 10 to the 6 Siemens per metre. Copper is 58.7, gold 44, aluminium 36.9, and so on and so forth. It's important to know because if we want to make an antenna out of iron, let's say, it, it has fairly low resistance, it does conduct electricity, so does my finger by the way, but it doesn't make a very good antenna. So bearing in mind that you've got the precious metals like silver and gold, they're very, very expensive. I don't know anybody in their right mind that would make a, make a 80 metre Yagi out of gold. Um, silver, of course, would be the best. So copper is a good, I mean, it, well, it's one down from silver, basically. Aluminium's not too bad either. 
So to conclude on the conductivity side, we're never going to use silver or gold for our antennas. The copper is cheap enough to be able to use and so is aluminium and they're not too far apart on the conductivity states. That conductivity, by the way, is going to come in in a minute when we look at seawater. OK, so as a young foundation student, I used to love the idea of modelling antennas. And I learned, taught myself everything, by the way, but I learned how to drive one particular software modelling program that I could draw antennas in and then start to see the result. It's got to the point now I can look at an antenna and I think, well, I know what that's going to do in the main, assuming it's tuned correctly and that sort of thing. Before we go down there, I've got a little analogy for you that you may like. And when, if you're ever doing a presentation at a club night or whatever, or you're trying to explain what an antenna is to someone who has no idea what amateur radio or RF is, that you, you might like this analogy. And I accidentally bumped into this analogy when I was trying to explain how my antenna worked to my accountant. And I said, well... The short wave spectrum, in fact, the whole RF spectrum, is a little bit like a piano. So the long straight strings pay, play the low notes and the short strings play the high notes. Well, just like RF, the long wires do the low frequencies and the short wires do the high frequencies. And we can use that analogy and we can head in now to MMANA. And I'll show you how to get to that on the screen. Just do a Google search for M-M-A-N-A dash G-A-L. Follow this link and fairly near the bottom, you'll be able to download this completely free. So when you fire it up, it looks something like this. We have basically four tabs across here. So I can quickly draw um, an antenna that's, let's say, 5.2 meters long and it will automatically fill the rest in in zeros. I can go and view that antenna and there it is actually. I can hold the control button down and slide that one down. That is my 5.2 um, antenna. I can zoom in and out. That says Z there in the middle. I can zoom in and out and I can right click here and add a feed point or a source to the beginning of the wire, which is at the bottom. So that's where our coax would go. OK, this is a ground mounted vertical, as it so happens. I've gone back to here because it's added this here. Wire one base. That means that's where the feed point is. You don't need to know anything else. In fact, it's defaults to 14, I think, 0.15. Let's have it a bit higher up. It doesn't really matter, to be honest. So we can view that here and we can start to calculate. We don't add any height it knows it's a ground mounted vertical now. We're going to make it out of copper wire and this is for real. So it's not a simulated free space antenna, you know, like on the moon, well, not even on the moon because that would start to behave a little bit like an antenna on the earth. So we've got free space, we've got perfect and real. We don't want perfect either because we don't have a perfectly conductive surface on the ground. We can set up our ground and we'll give it 16 quarter wave radials just for a bit of fun and let's just see what that does uh, it's giving us an impedance of about 38 um, ohms SWR of 1.49 and it's got a gain maximum gain is 1.12 dBi so we can go to the far field plot now and this is what it looks like so on the left we've got our plan view that's our, our bumblebee flying over the top of the antenna if it could see the RF dispersing out from the middle it would look like this elevation views on the right and we can hold our cursor and drag this around and measure things so at 20 degrees off the horizon it says we're 0 0.8 dbi you gotta remember this is you need to build another antenna and measure the two which, which we'll do in a minute i just want you to remember one number in a minute slide down to five degrees off the horizon and it says minus six minus six dbi in the middle up here minus if i hit a button you can see it says says it there that's a really important number to have because minus six sounds a bit rubbish doesn't it but with that minus six i've talked to people all over the world <laughs> in an omnidirectional vertical minus six let's just remember that i mentioned seawater earlier on and what we can do on the ground setup just to simulate 
what seawater does, which has a conductivity of 5,000 millisiemens per meter. And let's start that off, and then you'll know why some of these D expeditions are so strong, because our minus six has now become 4.2. So it's effectively a 10 dB kick. We'll draw a couple of other antennas just for fun. So let's get rid of this one and I'll quickly draw a dipole, let's say for 20 meters. Small inverted V dipole, 20 meters, here we go. Right, there's our dipole. The feed point is at the wrong end of this one here. So I'm just gonna cha change that to wire one end. Okay, so. We've got X on our right hand side, Y going north and Z coming straight up. And we can calculate that as well. And we shouldn't be far out on the SWR. Well, we were, but it doesn't really matter. I'll quickly adjust that. It says it's at 14. Best is 14.5, whatever, 14.5. And we'll be at the wrong height above ground as well. This is it's only two meters above the ground, it tells me here. So we probably need to add a little, we'll add a couple of meters, say five meters. We we'll probably get a slightly better SWR and we do. And then we can adjust the ends and all sorts. But what I'm interested in is the far field plot. Okay. At, uh, I'll just check the height. So the height of this is Z2, two meters plus five. Right. So we're seven meters above the ground at the inverted V and it goes down a couple of meters. Your average reasonable apple tree. <laughs> there we are. And that's what the far field plot looks like. And what we'll do is we'll raise the height up in a minute. But before we do that, let's just measure some things. So you can see that the wire at the moment is running north south. Therefore, like any traditional dipole, we'll be getting most of the gain off the uh, perpendicular <laughs> to the wire. Okay, so we can take our cursor and we can come down to here at 175 degrees off the horizon, we're getting minus 8.3. We were at six a minute ago. So we're 2.3 dBs, slightly worse with this one. We need to raise it up a bit. Well, let's find out what happens when we do raise this up. So this is at seven. Let's have a look at nine. There's 11. That's 13. Here's 15, here's 17 meters now. Now let's go to a whole wavelength off the ground at, on the 20 meter band, so here we go. So you saw what was happening there is that as we got higher and higher off the ground, we get fingers develop, yeah? That's, well, I don't know if that's the official term, but uh, I call them fingers. These fingers develop and we get these nulls going on inside here, we've got a null there of minus 10. But where our main gain is still coming out here. And if we come down to minus five degrees off the horizon, we're 2.9 dB. So that's nearly 10 dB better than the straight vertical by being a whole wavelength off the ground. By the way, if that's 40 meters, then we're well over a hundred feet, okay? It's the 40 meter band after all. I just think that's cool how a height above ground effects. A couple of things actually start happening when you do lift it off the ground. As you go higher, the tune will change. Certainly up to a quarter of a wavelength. So if you're into 80 meters, a quarter of a wavelength at 80 meters is 20 meters high, so 60 feet. As you faff around with your 80 meter dipole going up and down, you'll notice that not only is the impedance changing, but so will be what the element lengths need to be. So certainly up to a quarter of a wavelength off the ground, I always think this is a seagull, okay? For seagulls sitting on the edge and you come along and shoo it away, it stretches its wings as it goes up. And that's what we need to do with a, a low band dipole. As you start to raise it up, the elements start to get longer. As it starts to get closer to the ground, I think because of capacitance with the ground, the elements can get a bit shorter. Not only that, is the SWR isn't fixed at 72 ohms, okay? It goes past 50, then it goes up at the top and comes back. And I'll find a graph to show you. Here we are, I found the graph. And you can see how it goes up and down relative to the height above ground. 
So a dipole is only got its 72 ohms in free space. It's not 72 ohms when it's really on the, you know, near the ground. Okay, let's move down to the 40 meter band and I've adjusted the same antenna for 40 meters. We've got an added height of six meters here, plus the two meters we had in stock, you remember? And we'll hit the start button, ignore the SWR because the far field plot won't change, all right? Here's the far field plot. Now, what can we see here? We can see that our north-south dipole is still producing a little bit more east-west at eight meters above the ground, all right? And bearing in mind that if that was on 80 meters, that would be two eights of 16. This would be 16 meters above the ground now. Now, a lot of people, they start to tell you that their dipole is, you know, for 40 meters, you know, <laughs> running across the top of a tree somewhere and it's north-south, and they think most of their gain is east-west. You see, it's not. Let's just run the cursor around. Let's, this is our max, roughly max gain. I think actually the default is 45 degrees. So at 45 degrees, which is a nice takeoff angle for the 500, 300, 400, 500 mile hop that we have on 40 meters during the day, do you remember? Well, no, you don't remember because I haven't told you that, but we do. And I just round that it says here five point whoops, it says here five point seven. And if we scroll to the top it says two point two, three, four, five. So there's only about three dB difference. Three dB is equivalent of going, if you remember, from fifty watts to hundred watts. You'd I, I defy anybody to honestly go, yeah, I can hear three dB, right? It's not enough to worry about, just get it down. And bearing in mind, that's at 40 meters. This was on 80 meters. This is the equivalent of going from eight meters to 16 meters high. Now, I don't know many people with a 16 meter high dipole or doublet or any shape antenna, maybe with balance lines or a big fat tuna that can deliver um, gain perpendicular for 80 meters. You need to go right up. And I'll just show you that now. Let's recalculate this because I was 3.75. That's 130 feet. Let's say 35, 33 meters plus the two we've got roughly 32 meters. This is very high. I realize the tune's a little bit out of shape. Resonance. It thinks it's at 3.96. Well, we could faff around with that. So at 32 meters, which is uh, a third of a wavelength, roughly, on 80 meter band, we are getting this. And we put a dipole on top of a 100 foot tower above the Yagis, right at the top. And we, we put this, then uh, we realized that actually we need a pair, we need to switch it because this was gonna be for, I can do something here. I can force this to show me, tell me what is happening at five degrees off the horizon. So we were after DX in the middle of the night for 80 meters. And that was gonna be North America, which is delivering minus 3.7, pretty good. South America was gonna be down here, minus 8.2. So there was quite a lot of difference between the two. So what we did is we put a pair of dipoles with more coax and another switch. Tell me about it. Anyway, just interested. So on 80 metres now, if you've got a 10 metre high dipole, I'm sorry if I'm labouring this point. It's a bubble of RF. That's what I call it, a bubble of RF. Honestly, it doesn't really matter what the shape is of the antenna. It's a bubble of RF in the main on 80 metres. And look, I mean, we can, we can, this is, I think, at 45 degrees off the horizon. I think so. Which is your average... 45 degrees during the day is your average low fee around. Fine, you know, you're in Manchester talking to Fred in Brighton, about 45 degrees. Minus 5.8 there, minus 2.5 there. 3 dB in it. You'd never know. All right. Interesting. So basic software modelling is damn good fun. And does not, it not only teaches you how it works and what's happening in terms of the energy coming off the antenna, but it allows you to start to get ahead of the curve when you're starting to plan antennas, that's all. I'll go back to the book here. This isn't, I'm not trying to, 
I fully appreciate there's a lot of people in this convention, there's a lot of people on YouTube, and every video I make, there are professors and very clever people watching it. A lot of them trying to catch me out. I'm pretty sure of it. But I'm here to give you inspiration on the one hand. It's also a bit of fun, isn't it? Right? It's kind of edu it's education and, what's the other word? Entertainment. Education and entertainment. They go hand in hand. Because if it's boring as hell, you're not going to watch it anyway. Multi-banding antennas is quite good fun. So if we take a dipole, for instance, now dipole with our coax coming off the middle, and let's say these are roughly 10 metre legs, will be resonant on, let's say, 7.1 megahertz, right? Now, technically, according to the books, that's resonant three times the value of what we've just got. So if it's resonant on 7.1, it's actually, the next time it's resonant, it says here, according to the maths, it would be resonant on 21.33, uh, yeah. It's not, right, because we've got the height above ground has changed as a percentage of the wavelength. It's got a lot higher now, basically. And it's now a three-quarter wave dipole, effectively, for 21 metres. So that's its next resonance. Just multiply by three, okay? So if you could take um, any band, multiply it by three, would be its next harmonic. Now, the only... The only <laughs> In the main, that's the only one we normally need to be worried about. Because if you're making a fan dipole, in other words, and just for the case you don't know, right, you've got a piece of coax that looks like that. And normally a coax has got a centre conductor, normally made of copper, and it has this braid on the outside, right? So if you don't know anything about amateur radio, just remember what a um, the coax from your TV used to look like. Right, all that people don't have that anymore either, do they? Anyway, so a dipole basically is that end goes one side of this and that end there goes the other side of it. Effectively, that's what's happening. A fan dipole is fascinating. So what we can do is if these are 10 metre legs, we can then do five metre legs off the same feed point with no other contraption and that will automatically get the middle band, which for us is going to be... 20 meter band and 20 meter band is roughly 14 megahertz so then you've got a dipole for that one does that one that's going red so this is going to do 40 and 15 and that one is going to do 20 meter band you could add another one either a longer one going this way for 80 meters or maybe a little baby one in here for the 10 meter band fan dipole Another way of kind of multi-banding an antenna would be to go down the loop route. So a loop, a basic loop, and I had one of these in my garden for years, and a lot of people know this because I talk about it quite a lot because I loved it, is that the, you use something called a four-to-one ballon here, right, because this has roughly got an impedance of 200 ohms, and our coax that goes to our radio is normally 50 ohms. So we need to divide that by four to equal 50. So we use a four to one ballon, okay, which connects to this point here, and then the coax back. Now a loop resonates on every frequency. So 7.1, 14.2, 21.3, 21 so on and so forth. And you get the 10 meter band as well, obviously 28.4. So loops are good fun as well. You don't need to do anything fancy to multiband a loop. Unless you do, uh, you want a monoband loop, but we won't cover that now. Because you can feed it with a quarter wave, less the velocity factor of 75 ohm, 75 ohm coax. And that would give you a transformer from your loop to your coax, to your radio. But then it would be monoband. It would only do the one frequency, normally the target frequency you were originally after. So loop. Then we've got the end fed, and the end fed uses a little contraption, either a 49 to 1 or a 64 to 1 transformer. Our coax comes in here, and then out the other end, this transformer here, and out the other end, we've got an end fed. And an end fed is a half wave, it's resonant and the half wave, which is opposite to a dipole. Well, <laughs> for each element, it would be. So if we've got a 40 meter element for a half wave, 
it'd be quite long it'd be it'd be 20 meters long all right so that would be 20 meter length so that is 20 meters it would also be resonant on its doubles so you'd get that on the 20 meter band as well uh, the jury's out between 49 and 64 but you can make either quite easy right hence the two mike and i like the idea of a 64 yeah, whatever and then of course the last thing is that i wanted to cover today is if you can make a fan dipole you can make a fan vertical hey and this is this was an accident seriously an accident i had where i had a telescopic pole and i had a 40 meter wire going up it right 40 meters and it was ground mounted so the coax center of the coax goes up the up the pole and the braid i just put on on the ground you see connected it obviously on a few radials probably about eight or ten you can use more i've covered that plenty of times on on youtube but what i discovered on the same feed point i could put let's say a 20 up the side and i was getting 40 and 20 and that developed until i now put six elements up a dx commander that's a fan vertical and that works at about minus five minus six db at five degrees off horizon i just want to cover that one thing before we before we close this off um ladies and gentlemen which is many 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 years ago <laughs> um a lot of people had two antennas they had their main transmit antenna and a receive antenna but then the uh, yagi technology came along and people realized actually you could do it all on one antenna all right but you know i think the world has changed again and because of all the local noise we're getting on our antennas there is an argument to say well the radios are so good these days why don't we put a dedicated antenna it could be a loop on the ground for instance just google it loop on the ground plenty of people that have done loops on the ground and put that into your receive jack and that way because the thing is about a vertical for instance it gets out very well and i used to make a terrible mistake of only using my antennas for receive for the testing like oh i don't like that right <laughs> i didn't realize that it was transmitting really well but it was just picking up maybe more noise because let's think about this a vertical antenna will pick it's got well we know it's got very low angle gain capabilities so if you've got a house a couple of doors away generating some sort of stuff from the back of his fridge or whatever your vertical is going to pick it up quite well whereas your low to the ground ish dipole isn't so much so i i challenge everybody these days to have a look at look at the back of your radio has it got a receive jack for 10 pounds five bucks <laughs> you can build a nice little receive loop you can pin it down on the grass outside no one will ever see it within about three weeks and it can give you a lovely option on receive and your radio is perfectly good enough without having a preamplifier the topic of antennas obviously is enormous we can go down yagis we can go down log periodics there are books to have um a half hour or so presentation about antennas to cover all the, all the topics of antennas it's gonna um it is impossible we'd have to play it a thousand times the speed um if you look at uh on4 un's book low band dxing book i think there's something like 18 chapters i've skimmed the surface of everything antennas are fantastic they're great fun they're the one thing in life that makes the difference between a reasonable station and a very good station and i encourage you all to go out there play with receive loops get an apple tree throw a vertical up it for 20 meters for instance a few radials on the ground <laughs> try low to the ground i went as low as four feet off the ground on 40 meters before i started noticing a difference that the receive was starting to die people could still hear me unless you do these experiments you'll never know and somebody once said to me i don't know why you're doing this it's already been done and it's been written in such and such a book the thing is i hadn't done it and there's a couple of topics i've now challenged and changed 
including, for instance, a very high sky loop in a triangle configuration has massive gain opposite the feed point. And I remember originally having arguments with this. I think I've finally won that one now, but just because it's been done before and you haven't done it doesn't mean to say you can't. So go and have fun. Enjoy your radio. Enjoy your antennas. And I'll see you on the next one. So from Callum here at World Headquarters in the bunker, a very good day. We've been expecting you, Mr. McGomack. <laughs> <laughs> that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, somebody... I enjoyed making it. Yeah, somebody said uh, this guy could make life inside a ping pong ball sound entertaining. I don't know, and maybe I... for about two minutes, Jim, and that's about it. And I've got, I can see a comment from Ray, N9JA, who should be on the other stream yeah. at the moment, saying, yeah. great presentation. Oh, no, he's not I'm watching so... himself, he's watching you. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course. You know, hey. But so, uh, I did, I did pick, I thought, lovely, really interesting question, actually. Oh, I'm taking, stealing your thunder, Jim. Yeah, because it's probably one of I those things down here. Uh, well, oh, go on, you, you ask the one that I think you're going to ask me. No, you, you ask me. You ask me. Because <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm still so, trying to catch up. There is so much going on on the chat since you came on. Oh, uh, right. So, have, you, have you seen the love on there? Yeah, fine. So but, I've been having so to I did a trick. write it down. Yeah, I, I, I went live 10 minutes before this show and showed the people the behind the scenes, what I was doing, what the screen was doing and everything else. Got me, put my lights on, changed the batteries for the camera. And then, and then I shut my stream down and asked everybody to come over here. So that's why we're up to 300 watching now. So I thought it was uh, just a little, well, I didn't want them to, I wanted them to catch the live uh um adrenaline you know it, it's pre-recorded is fine but you know live has a little bit more zip in it sometimes Absolutely. so andy oh. cowley i don't actually know the answer to this one but he said does the material thickness of the material uh, have an effect on the bandwidth I, th I think the answer is yes how much i don't know but i've got a great story now jim as a <clears throat> experienced radio foreman you'll know that Droitwich has got two 800 foot towers and I'll just do fire to the other camera at the minute. So these two uh, 800 and there's an antenna that basically does that across the top. This is the antenna bit here. It goes up here. It's purple, but anyway, I could use red. Red's better. That's the antenna. Now about a few years ago, Chris G zero E Y O told me that when they, the bandwidth wasn't enough. Now, I'm not quite sure what an AM carrier is, but I just while the stream was going, I worked out the 6 kilohertz bandwidth on a 198 kilohertz uh, transmitter. The bandwidth difference on that antenna is 46 metres wide, a, a difference. So, in other words, one edge, 3 kilohertz down to 3 kilohertz up, is the equivalent of 46 metres. So what they had to do is wide band it by putting four big, long wires up and, and literally multi, you know, making the, making the antenna big enough just to fit the AM signal in. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the, I, I say it's the magic of radio, but that's, to me, some of these, some of these problems, I mean... I think a lot of us who are into amateur radio, we love problem solving in a wonderful, weird way. I mean, some people just want to buy the radio and get it to work, but a lot of us like to buy the radio and get it to work. <laughs> we kind of quite like the thing the day when it goes, hang on a minute, it's not working now. <laughs> we spend a week, you know, solving all the problems, but we learn through that, don't we? Because mm. you can read all the books in the world if you don't fix these problems yourselves or have someone to help you and so you can see it, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's doing it that, that does it. Interesting thing about Droitwich, in the days when we could visit places, I, I, was, I was there and I've stood underneath one of those masts. And not only oh. can you feel the hairs on the back of your neck standing up with all the power that's, that's around, yeah. there's a lock on a gate because there's, there's lifts going up for some of those masts and there's a lock to stop you you know getting in there without permission that's and right you can hear the program you can hear the program <laughs> yeah, on, the lock, on the gate on the, on the gate yeah. i've been to that gate 
I've yeah. actually listened to Radio yes, 4 yeah. on a lock. Uh, that's right. And then there that's was right. a lady that complained because Radio 4 was coming out of a kettle. That's right. <laughs> of course, the, the, the feeders are not, not coax. I mean, it's plumbing, basically, isn't it? It's plumbing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think they're underground, two big underground cables, because that's a very high power transmitter, 400 kilowatts, I think, that's it. at it's 198 a kilohertz. Tremendous. And it's built on a kind of inland sea. It, it, the, the, there's something about the ground, isn't there? there? I didn't know it's that. Very salt, it's very salty or something. Ah. Because it's Detroit, which is a, it is a spa. Actually, talking about terrain, Mike, G4CDF, says, uh, he reckons terrain also matters. And he says, even on HF, go to the top of a hill. What do you reckon? Yeah. So the reason why you go to the top of the hill, I did a video about this. The slope, how does the the slope of the ground oddities but basically if you imagine this right if you were on a, a slope how are we off for time uh, we're all right we're all right I've got a few minutes if if you i mean i'll just exacerbate this or whatever it's called uh, we know that normally the, with the effect of the ground you've got this you know you know if if you're lucky you'll get a five degree takeoff angle but if it's running away from you what happens is this takeoff angle is relative to the ground, not gravity. So this comes down. So yeah, get up high because you're still gonna you still get the effect, not so much on the well, maybe on the ground. Well, you, your takeoff angle goes down relative to the slope of the ground in front of you. So even if you're just on a like you're on a field day or stuff, and you think, oh, most of my contacts are going to be Germany. And it's a bit of a slope. My Germany's not so bad because normally the takeoff is a bit hang higher. But like at Uplands Farm, for instance, it was a very, I'd say about four, four degree slant going up towards the US. That's going to add four degrees to my takeoff angle. So yeah, get up high or just consider where the slope is. Right, oh, and by the way, ZL1BD says lobes were the word you were looking for. Yeah, not for no. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a Zoom call with Roly uh, Monday night, his Tuesday morning. So he'll tell me off then, no doubt, because Roly checks through all my material <laughs> and then uh, sends me a sends me a message when I've got it wrong. It's actually going bonkers on the uh, thing at the minute. You you, you said that um, the DX commander came about as a pure accident. Yes, it was. Yeah. But so how did you then make the step then to becoming a manufacturer of? Because you had a business. You were running a business. I was running a business, and weirdly enough, Jim, it was about four years ago, you came to the Withal Rally, and I had about 10 prototype DX commanders. I thought it might be quite good fun, and I think I was selling them for about £80 each. I mean, they were quite chunky things. You bought one, Jim. I did. I still got <laughs> you it. You took it to France. I um, And it was just an accident. And then when I, as I got a bit older, because I'm 62 and a half now, I got fed up, you know, with a suit and tie brigade because I had this business that, you know, I just got completely fed up with it. I was burnt out and I, I thought, you only live once. Let's see if I can make DX Commander a bit of a goer. So, I mean, it was a, it was a kind of a planned out, but we got it to the business to the point now where I'm employed, my son's employed, Wendy's employed, we've got a small factory and, and I've got 40,000 people on the YouTube channel, but... I've obviously had to work hard, you know, every step of the way. Uh, but the product itself was an accident. The fact, I mean, there has been, I mean, I have seen designs since where somebody puts up a wire, you know, there's the ground, and then a feed point, and they put the verticals up like this, um, like genuinely like a fan. But um, I've never seen anybody do it on a pole. And I noticed some weirdies, depending on if if I spread the feed point out further, I was getting better bandwidth, basically, rather than the top for spread the bottom where the feed was. So, and I, I actually haven't finished all the experiments I want to do because I've been so busy, but, and I never will, I'm sure, Jim. Yeah. Well, look, Rob has just whispered in my ear, Rob is doing all the technicals with Don yeah. down in Cambridge. It's something about uh, your thoughts on, was it elevated half wave dipole? Halfway verticals, elevated halfway verticals. Elevated, well, you can model that. You don't need to do it. So this would be an end-fed halfway vertical. I think Tim's on the channel. I'm not quite sure if Tim 
uh, G5TM's done that. I do have, I think, nine 64 to 1 high powered. Mike made them for me. I've never told anybody about it. High powered. I wanted it to cope with about 800 watts SSB and feds. They're quite big boxes. And we're going to try uh, and do that. So I don't know the answer yet uh, how it works. Is it any good? <coughs> um, Modelling will we'll, we'll solve that problem, and I might do some models before I actually build it, Jim. Yeah, watch this space, eh? Yeah. How about the videos? Um, we've, we've got just got a few seconds before we have to uh, uh, yeah. wrap up and go to the NRC, but uh, what about the videos? You, you must be making 100 a week or something. <laughs> Quite a few anyway. So on average, it's two to three a week. I genuinely don't know how I do it. I... Try and film a lot of things that doesn't end up in any of the videos. Um, and I've just got all this footage. I think, oh, it's just me opening a box. I think, you know, uh, but some of the, if I can just film it good enough, it can end up. I mean, it's like a story, isn't it? So you will watch something on the TV. You'll watch something on YouTube. If the story's good, all right, so you've got the background, you know where it's going, the middle bit's quite good fun. You, you will just watch it because it's a good story. And I think the trick is, it doesn't matter if you're wiring up a plug. You can wire up a plug. Now, tell them a little while you're doing it. Tell them a bit of the history about a three-pin plug. You know, why is it? Uh, you know, whatever. And so and that's what I do. Now, two weeks ago, we did an experiment where I launched one video a day for 10 days, plus three live streams. <laughs> but I'd, I'd built them up. And um, I just, because uh, during the summer, my channel had not died. It, it, it slowed, the growth had slowed. And I'm a businessman. I, I want, and I'm driven down the road to get 100,000 subscribers because it's the only thing in my world that I can't buy. You get a little plaque from YouTube, you see. And I just, just thought it'd be fun. It's about three them, or four, three or four yeah. years away, I think. But Okay. So, well, sorry, I, mean, I keep that, moving that about because... Uh, I look like I'm being scanned by aliens. Uh, Jim, it's absolutely fine. We know you've got this special condition. <laughs> <laughs> right, time to go. Thank you. That's been brilliant, Callum. Thanks ever, ever so much. I uh, uh, hope to see you very My soon on, uh, on YouTube. And uh, the love is still coming in on the, on the uh, what do you call it, YouTube call, yeah. uh, chat facility. That's the word. I know. It's, it's been brilliant. a long day, Callum. Been a long day. Jim, oh, mate, you take, must you be, uh, you, you, you're going to need a medal. Hopefully they'll stick you on the front cover of um, of Radcom sometime. Oh, someone was suggesting you should be on the front cover of uh, Radcom. <laughs> That's when I get my CBE. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> or, when, or when I'm knighted. Yeah. All right, mate. Well, okay, well, guys. Thanks, thanks so much, thanks Jim, lot, and all thank the crew down at RSGB. Yeah. Great stuff. Well, um, as with all the others, Callum's uh, video presentation will be made available later in the week, although the video stream, the whole stream, will be released later later this evening. Uh, and while you're on the RSGB YouTube channel, <laughs> this look like I've been painted. Um, while you're on the YouTube channel, we'd love you to press the red subscribe uh, button where you'll get alerts about the uh, convention videos when when they uh, when they appear plus all sorts of uh, rsgb material including the tonight at eight uh, presentations they're starting again in, uh, the well the next one is in uh, november um and it'll be uh, ash ashar farhan vu2 ese talking about his bitx to s bit x uh, the journey and development of an exciting range of transceiver six watt ssb transceiver for uh, 14 megs together. So that's uh, Monday, the 1st of November. Right, well, coming up next at uh, three, about uh, five or six minutes away in real time, uh, Gene Spinelli, K5GS, will be giving us the lowdown on the VP8 PJ2020 D Expedition, last year's D Expedition to the South Orkney Islands. But for now, let's uh, return to the NRC at Bletchley Park, see how GB3RS and GB4RS are faring on the bands this afternoon. Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra. Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra calling CQ bike. <laughs> 
CQCQ, Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra. Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra, calling CQ 40 and bike. Golf Sorry, cut the station there. The Golf Zero, the Golf Zero, go ahead, please. I'm sorry, I've got a lot of QRM, lots of QRM. The Golf Zero, go again, please. Uh, is that the Golf Zero, Mike Juliet Kilo? Is that correct? No, I'm sorry, I'm struggling a lot there. Uh, can you confirm Golf Zero, Mike Juliet Kilo? Is that correct, please? Yes, I uh, got a break in the current there. Golf Zero, Mike the Zulu Kilowatt. Uh, you're five and five into us here at Bletchley Park. Name here Dan, Delta, Alpha, and Avenza. And this is the special event station we're putting on today for the RSGB convention. Oh, welcome back to the RSGB NRC again. I hope you're enjoying the convention. Uh, we've certainly been really busy here at the NRC. And at the moment on the radios, we've got Crassie is on 17 meters. And Dan, uh, it was Dan who did the soldering um, lecture earlier today. Dan's with us. He was taking his Q and A in the, uh, just at, at, at the back of the NRC here live. And he's operated on 40 meters at the moment. So we've got those two stations, both operating GB3 RS. Um, so I, I know the, the president, Stuart, who's just to my left here, has been operating GB4 RS during the day, has got a whole load of contacts in the log there, so that's gone really well. And GB3 RS is busy. We've been using that on multiple bands. We're not on QO100 at the moment, although we have been. We've been on VHF as well. We've been on two meters SSB. But at the moment, we're on 17 meters and 40 meters if you want to give us a call. For the RSGB convention, over. Roger, roger there, Dan. Uh, Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra, Mike 3, Golf you and Alfred Turn. You're also 5, 9, plus 20, Dan. Uh, I'm cracking in here to the town of Kings Lynn, County of Norfolk. And the operator name this way is Trevor. Like I say, fantastic signal and lovely audio there, Dan. Mike 3, Golf you and Alfred Turn to Golf Bravo 3. Romeo Sierra. Yeah, no problem, Trevor. Love me to get you in the log and uh, hope you enjoy the convention streams if you've been watching this. 73 from us here at Blackby Park and uh, have a good day. Okay, well, thanks very much for you and the crew to put on the call. All the very best here from Norfolk. 73, uh, George, please. Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra. Thanks, Romeo Sierra. Romeo Sierra. Romeo Sierra. Uh, Mike Zero, Radio India, I think it's Unicorn. Uh, is that correct? Uh, roger, roger, that's correct. Mike Zero, Radio India, Unicorn. Thanks for coming back to me. Watching you on the, uh, on the uh, preview for the live stream uh, right now. So just saw you call in so far. I'll give you a shout. Mike Zero, Radio India, Unicorn. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for that. Name here is Dan Delta Alpha November. Uh, my normal TPH is Cambridge, but I've come down to work to park and put the station on. Uh, great to get you in the log, and thanks for the call. You're a lovely signal here. Yeah, thanks very much. You're a solid 5-9 with me here in Big West Yorkshire. And my name is David, Mike Zero, Romeo, India, Uniform. Yeah, 73 David, great to get you in the log, and I uh, hope you're enjoying the stream. Uh, QRZ please, Golf Bravo 3, Romeo, Sierra. Thank you, Mr. Golf Bravo 3, Golf India Zero again. Golf India Zero, Victor, Golf Victor. 
Well, still going great guns at Bletchley. Uh, don't forget, if you're an RSGB member, you can visit Bletchley Park and the NRC for free, gratis and for nothing. Details on the RSGB website. If you're not a member, you get some details of how to join there. Club Log for Absolute Beginners is the talk about to get underway on the Introduction to Stream with its creator, Michael Wells, G7VJR. Meanwhile, welcome to the penultimate lecture for today here on the Learn More About stream. Now, our speaker is a DXer and a veteran of many high profile DX expeditions over the years, although that interest in DX doesn't stop him dabbling with repeaters and restoring old radio sets. Gene Spinelli, K5GS, joins us from home in Tucson, Arizona, to tell us about an expedition that took place. And I think I'm writing saying, Gene, just before the world ground to a standstill due to COVID-19 last year. Oh, yeah, it was a uh, very interesting returning home to a new world. <laughs> so I bet it was. It's so a good job uh, it didn't happen while you were uh, well, you stuck out there, uh, I would imagine. Anyway, sure. thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. What time of the day is it there? 7 a.m. All oh, right. Well, it's afternoon here. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, the, the floor is yours, Gene. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to take you all on a journey to South Orkney Island. I will uh, get started here. Hopefully, it'll work. There it is. the uh, The project was was developed by the Perseverance DX Group. Uh, we are a small group of uh, like minded DXers that uh, form this group after the 2012 ZL9 the expedition. We named the group after Perseverance Harbor on Campbell Island, and the group was formed for the reason all other DX groups have formed to activate semi-rare and rare entities. We've done four projects since 2014, and hopefully when the world reopens, we will have another project uh, on the way. So let's talk about South Orkneys. The, the, the question we always get is why, and the answer was pretty clear. After VP6D, Ducey Island in 2018, we were looking for a new target. We had a list of potential DX opportunities, and we sent that list to Nigel jo uh, Jolly, the owner of Braveheart, and Nigel responded very quickly that he would be near the South Orkneys in early part of 2020. Uh, so we, uh, we took that opportunity. The last project that was there was uh, 2011, VP8ORK. So everything came together and uh, it was number 16. So that was a good, good place to be, South Orkneys. And of course, after Ducey, which was hot and humid, we were looking for someplace cooler. And uh, quite frankly, not as cold as we had, but it is what it is. Uh, to remind you where the South Orkneys are, the very bottom of South America, approximately 850 miles to the South Orkneys and 375 miles from the tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, Falkland Island, South Georgia Island. So it's, it's, it's below 60 south in the Southern Ocean. We left from Punta Arenas, Chile. We took the Straits of Magellan to the north uh, east uh, exit into the Atlantic. And what you see here is a straight line to the South Orkneys from our personal locators that we had on the internet. So our family and the DX community can follow our progress. South Orkney Islands are a group of glaciated mountainous uh, islands. Uh, we operated from Sydney Island, which, which is this smaller island here. And in subsequent photographs, you'll see the surface is, is a mixture of open and of bare rock, dirt, ice, snow, and some mossy vegetation. So it was pretty interesting uh, geography. We knew the weather would be cold, um, and it was. The uh, precipitation uh, in the form of snow and rain, just about every day we had something or a mixture. And uh, we ran into some interesting winds, and you'll see the results of at least one of those windstorms and subsequent slides. The UK has a base on Sydney Island. It's a, a scientific uh, outpost. It's used uh, to host 
visiting researchers. It's staffed uh, from November to April by a, sta a team of eight, eight men. And uh, we had a great opportunity to visit with them uh, for, for a few hours. And it's built on the site of an old whaling station. And in this slide, you see some remnants of, of that, the uh, boiler floating there, or I should say uh, positioned in the harbor and an old slipway. Okay, there's also other remnants and historical artifacts scattered around the island. You can see some harpoons. Uh, those are on display at the station. And the lower left-hand side is a pumping engine. And that was just on the side of our campsite. And that was used to pump water. On the right-hand slide, you see a pipe. And that pipe used to extend from up the hill where there's a freshwater lake all the way down the water pipe beach, which is where we landed. And you'll see that in subsequent slide. Uh, water pipe beach was used for a, uh, a water tender would come in there, collect the water that was pumped down from the lake and taken over to the whaling station to use for processing uh, the uh, catch. Let's spend a little bit of time on this slide. Borga Bay, the Braveheart came into Borga Bay and anchored in this area. Now it didn't stay in any one position. It changed based on the, the winds and the, uh, and the, uh, the other uh, activities going on with the weather. You see three L's, an L here, an L here, and an L here. These are the designated landing positions where we would land equipment on these two upper L's in between, and we would land people at this L, and you'll see why in a little bit. It would almost make sense to land everybody in one place, but that wasn't really uh, feasible. There's a little hut here called Water Pipe Hut Number 13. That's a, an a emergency shelter for stranded seamen. It has everything you need to sustain human life. At the tip of the arrow, you see marble knolls. This is where our campsite was. It was surrounded by these marble knolls. And, it, and again, you'll see those in, in the next slides. Elephant Flats. And just keep in mind, Orwell Glacier. Okay, there's the Orwell Glacier. You'll see a lot of Orwell Glacier. So just put it in your mind that it's, it's almost due south, not quite, but almost due south of, of our campsite at the uh, Marble Knolls. And there is the UK base, a series of buildings. There was no way to walk between the two. So anytime the um, camp, uh, the visitors uh, visited our camp or the staff visited our camp, they took a small boat and we in fact did the same thing. So there you have it, Borga Bay, Braveheart, landing positions and where the campsite would be located. That's the team. We had a team of 14 DXers, nine Americans, and five from outside of America, a Ukrainian, a Australian, Hungarian, Swiss, and German. And we've been on projects uh, with these gentlemen before and, and different projects. And most of us on this team have been together before. So it was, it was a really fun to be with these guys again. Getting permission to go to South Orkney Island is an interesting experience. Since it's under below 60 degrees south, you have to go to the Antarctic Treaty System, which is made up of 54 countries. It was originally 12 when the treaty was initially signed in 1959 and ratified in 1961. But now there are 54 countries involved with the treaty system and the expedition is considered a form of tourism. So you're allowed to go assuming you get permission. And for Americans, we get permission by approaching the US State Department and filing an application. And then if it's approved, we go to the Environmental Protection Agency and the National Science Foundation and we created documents that explain who we are, why we're going there, what we're going to do, how are we going to get there, how are we going to live on the island, and uh, more importantly, dealing with waste. You're not allowed to leave any waste on the island, and that includes human waste. So we had to create a series of 
risk mitigation strategies in the event something spilled or something, some, some unusual situation. So everything had to be documented and approved by the various agencies. And, and that was done and they were relatively happy with what we created and they gave us a nine page landing permit that listed what we were permitted to do and not do. We knew we would need sturdy buildings. So we bought these weather port buildings. They may look familiar to you. We bought them from the VP8 ORK team that was there in 2011. These are the same buildings. We took them over to the home of W1SRD in California in July and assembled them, inventoried minor repairs, fabricated floor panels that you'll see a lot more of later and then cleaned and disinfected everything with an approved disinfectant. We labeled all the parts so we could put it together quickly in a less uh, pleasant environment, in a windy, cold, and raining environment. And this is Walt N6XG building floor panels. We uh, split four by eight sheets of plywood, and we did that to make it easier to carry in the wind because we knew it was going to be windy. We created a floor plan. Seven radio positions, each one numbered, equipment laid out to make sure it fit. This is 12 feet wide by 24 feet long. And the uh, you can see it, everything fit fairly well. It was uh, was interesting how, how Dave uh, laid this out, K3EL. And everything had an assigned generator. So we knew if we took off generator one, what stations would come offline. So that was all laid out beforehand. Okay, we went back to California in October of 2019 to the home of N6XG. We consolidated all the equipment, and this is just a subset of it, all of the equipment at Walt's home. And uh, this is W1SRD, uh, Steve and Dave K3EL integrating all the hardware and software uh, connected it to the satellite. We had to make sure the networking worked, and, and we didn't want we didn't want to be shooting bugs while we were on the island. So everything was implemented, installed, consolidated, tested in California, then repacked and disinfected. The cases had to be disinfected inside and out, so we don't introduce any um, foreign organisms to Antarctica. This is Walt who built a patch panel. You will see this uh, later on. Walt designed this panel uh, and, and built an antenna matrix panel. It, it looks rather imposing when you see it in, in operation, but it's really not. And again, just a subset of the equipment. We put everything into a container and put it uh, on a ship in Oakland, California. And it took about 10 weeks for that ship uh, to stop in uh, Panama, change uh, ships, and then it stopped again down in Chile, change ships, and everything wound up in Punta Arenas. Um, what plenty of time for us to uh, get down there and, and inventory everything. We used a company called Agunsa. Uh, Agunsa is a global logistics company, and we learned that they, uh, number one, knew Nigel Jolly and the Braveheart from another project. And they also are a uh, sub subcontracted at NASA. So we felt very comfortable with them and they, they were terrific. On the 14th of February, we went to the uh, Braveheart to help unload the shipment and place everything on the ship. This is the night before we sailed. This is the 14th. We had the team at a hotel in Punta Arenas. We uh, decided we had to bond with the crew. So we brought the Braveheart crew over to the hotel. This is Matt Jolly, the skipper. That's Nigel Jolly, his father. And the crew members inter interspersed around the table with our team. And it was uh, Thanksgiving, uh, not Thanksgiving, where am I going here? It was uh, St. Valentine's Day weekend. And uh, the, uh, it was a buffet, a wonderful buffet that I'm sure they lost money on because the Braveheart crew loves to eat. But it was a really good, good time and everybody bonded quite nicely. Uh, the next several days, the hotel allowed us to use one of their rooms and we would uh, have daily briefings as to what was happening. Because when you have 14 people from, from you know, six of different countries, everybody needs to know what's going on every day. So we had planning sessions and laid out a plan for the day. 
Hey, the next day on Saturday the 15th, you can see it was raining, it was windy, and quite frankly, it was miserable. And uh, we had a trolley behind the, uh, the van to bring all our personal gear. All the equipment was preloaded, and this was just our personal gear coming over. You can see the tide is out, so it's low tide. The gangway is up on a couple of truck tires. And this lady, Jacqueline, was our uh, interface to Agunsa. She did all the logistics for us. And here she is helping me onto the gangway. What's happening here, you don't see it, of course, is the ship is rolling. It's moving and the gangway is going up and down. The wind is blowing and it's kind of interesting. And I'm not as coordinated as I was 25 years ago. So I was a little apprehensive, but uh, Jacqueline took care of that by helping me. You can see a net down here. This was in the event something or someone went over the side. Nobody did. So we felt that was a success. We come aboard the ship, start get situated, and the skipper takes us through a safety drill. And he demonstrated the location and how to get into a cold water immersion suit in the event we had to leave this ship in, a, in, a, in an emergency situation. So everyone had one of these suits. That's my cabin. I shared a cabin with Rob in 7QT. You see a lot of stuff here. We, we carried down some equipment that didn't make the shipment. There's a couple of SPE amplifiers and a lot of other small items that uh, we decided to bring down later. Okay, so we left that same day, the 15th, and started our six day journey. It's, it's a navigation track. There's a depth finder and of course the radar. And as we entered the area of South Orkney Islands, those are icebergs, big icebergs and little icebergs. And of course the ship slows down and uh, they stationed a crew member on the highest part of the ship with a searchlight. And of course, what he's looking for are obstacles that the helmsman may not see and just alerting the, the, the bridge to what's, what he sees. When we arrived, unfortunately or fortunately, depending how you might look at it, we're not alone. There was this factory ship. It's a fish factory ship. Smaller ships uh, go out fishing. They bring their catch back to the factory ship. They uh, are processed on the factory ship, and then the smaller ships go out for another catch. We learned that this area is popular for krill fishing. Norwegian, Korean, Chinese vessels dot the area. I think there were two of them there when we, when we were there. This is a krill. It is a tiny little shrimp-like character. Uh, really interesting. Um, it's whale food. Could you imagine how many billions of these are required to feed a whale? And I also, and this is something new that I learned, it's also used as an alternative medicine, sold in uh, alternative health food shops <clears throat> for heart disease and managing blood fats, cholesterol, et cetera. I, and, and I never knew this until after this project. And then I saw this for sale in one of the shops I go to. So we learn a lot on the expeditions. The sun comes up after we uh, arrive in our anchorage, and this is what we saw. It's about 100 meters of ice. This is the upper L landing spot. This was the lower L landing spot, and this was the landing L for people. And there's water pipe hut number 13. So we sent out a recon team. This is a specially custom-made boat to operate around ice. And you can see there will not be any equipment loaded or unloaded today. And there's the Braveheart and one of the fish factories. Okay, so this was the recon team. They did get ashore. This is Water Pipe Beach. The upper L would be here, the lower L would be around here. And you can see some elephant seals. We are told the week before we were there, there were 400 elephant seals on this beach. And um, I guess they found out we were coming and decided to leave. 
whatever, it was perfect because they did not bother us at all. The uh, team hiked up to where the campsite would be. This is the Orwell Glacier. These are the marble knolls, and they actually go around. You don't see the ones in the foreground, but this campsite was really protected in this area. The, uh, the ice, surprisingly, had blown in a couple of days before we arrived. <clears throat> so we lost that one day, arrival day. But the, the uh, base commander at the UK base uh, told us that the ice would blow out that night. The winds were going to change. And sure enough, this is what it looked like the next morning. <clears throat> and we started bringing equipment over. Okay. So I'll take you through how we landed people and equipment. This is Dave K3EL. This is a cliff and you'll see it a different way in a minute. There's a cliff below here and Dave shimmied, and shimmied up the cliff and a line was thrown over so the other folks can uh, pull themselves up. So here's how Dave did that. Right in here is this gap. So it's possible to walk into this gap and then shimmy up, walk up, leg on each side. This is before the ladder and stairs, of course. You can see the line that was thrown over. So before the lines were there, we would grab that rope and pull ourselves up and one leg here, one leg here, you get the picture. The small boat would come in and go right up against these rocks. And that's a different view. That's me in the red and Dave in the yellow. And there's another view. You can see the small boat would come against this rock and the skipper would hold it there while we stepped out and then worked our way over to the, the stairway. The plan was we would, many of us, I wouldn't say everybody, but at least half the team wanted to sleep on the boat every night. And um, that turned out not to be possible. And this is why. you he didn't get in the, 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 the seas were too rough we couldn't do this every day uh, it was too dangerous um, this is a crew member i just want to alert you we were not allowed to do this this is strictly the crew okay so you can you can see it would be really difficult to move people back and forth so we all stayed on the island for the entire the expedition the crew would bring over food two meals a day, two hot meals a day, petrol and, uh, and water. But uh, the rest of us, uh, except for one break about seven days in, the weather was good enough to put people on the small boat, go back for a shower and then back to the island. So here we are, this is offloading equipment. This is as close as the boat could get and you'll see why in a minute. And there were four men here in hip boots or waders. They lay, went out into the cold water and set up a daisy chain to move the equipment over to the beach. This is what it looked like at low tide. So you can see the obstacles that prevented the boat from getting any closer. And uh, pretty interesting because it's so slippery. And with all these rocks, you had to really be careful carrying this equipment out. Staged everything on the beach. And then as these D expeditions go, you had to go up a hill, probably 300 meters to the uh, campsite. This is one of the crewmen, Porky Barlow. Uh, it looks like we're, we're working Porky like a hired uh, rented mule, but we're not. There's, there's guys behind there helping Porky uh, move that uh, trolley. So here's the flooring going together. You notice there are galvanized steel straps. We strapped all of these floorboards together because these rails would eventually hold the arcs that held the building top up. And these arcs would be under tension trying to pull out. So we thought that if these boards were not secured to one another, they would pull the boards out. And I think you get the picture there. There's less pounding in, uh, I think we had 20 some odds 10 inch spikes per building. 
And there's another one of Les doing the galvanized straps. That's what the sleeping tent looked like as we were getting ready to move in. These are disco beds, two beds per bunk. And these are the same beds that we used on the Heard Island, the expedition in 2016. This is what it looked like after we moved in. Uh, I wouldn't tell you we had a lot of space, but we had enough to uh, survive for a couple of weeks. This is what the radio tent looked like. This was the radio operating, operating tent, the seven stations. This, uh, at this picture, it is fully staffed. All the stations are on the air. That's uh, HB9BXE, Hans Peter, and Walt N6XG, Steve W1SRD, Ken N2, N, NG2H, that's me, Les W2LK, uh, Lassie HA0NAR, and way back in the corners, Rob N7QT. This was our kitchen area. Uh, the, the, team, the uh, crew brought over two hot meals a day. We had a supply of uh, breakfast cereals and breads and butters and jams and that sort of stuff. You don't see it in a photo, but there's a hot water boiler off to the side, hot tea and coffee 24 hours a day. We also had a three-day emergency supply of food and water and some petrol in the event the ship uh, couldn't supply us for some reason, mainly due to weather. Okay, so here's the antenna patch panel that Walt designed and built. It looks very imposing. It's, it, it's, it could be, but it, it, after you, you, you see it a few times, you realize your goal is to determine what radio position you're going to be at, select an antenna for the band that you want to be on, find an unused filter. There's 15 filters for different bands, and then plug accordingly to give yourself an antenna and a band. And here, you, this is just the tail end of the networking setup. We had two laptops on a desk uh, man monitoring the network. OK, we had a single camp, unlike Ducey, where we had two camps a, a kilometer apart from one another. We were not able to use the beach for antennas. And we wanted some way to get the ability to operate two or three stations simultaneously on the same band, which we did. And we did that by using cross-polarized antennas. And the, uh, and the uh, antennas were placed as far apart as possible. But we also knew we'd have to be dealing with wind. So here's a uh, image of the team. This was the first day, maybe the second day, putting together the, uh, the Yagi antennas. These were E antennas from Wemo. And I'm sure you guys know who Wemo is. And, Europe, very terrific D expedition supplier partner. This is the um, 160 antenna going up. It was a 24 meter aluminum spider pole from Spider Beam Germany. And you can see the Braveheart in the background. And this is a little winch arrangement and what's called, I guess, a falling derrick to pull that up. Very much simpler than what we've done in the past. Okay, here is the radio tent. Here's the sleeping tent. That little gray building there is the toilet. And this is our generator shed. You can see elephant flats here, elephant flats here, elephant flats. These are the elephant seals. You can see the marble knolls. These are the marble knolls. And you can see we have antennas on the marble knolls, but you can't see the antennas very well. So now you can. And there are three more antennas, actually four. One's not labeled. There was a beverage antenna out in this direction. So you can see we had a pretty good setup. We were surrounded by the knolls. We had some wind protection, although this was a wind tunnel here. And uh, being a wind tunnel, we had some interesting uh, uh, challenges. This is typically what it looked like in the morning. We'd have some snow, but uh, the days were interesting. The weather was amazing. This is the 40 meter four square. It was located in a wind tunnel. And by the end of the project, it was a single element 40 meter vertical and the rest of it was trash. So we, we scrapped it and replaced it. This is one of the Moxon, the work, bang, work band Moxons up on a marble knoll pointed to Europe. So you can see why Europe had so many contacts. 
This is another Mox Vaughn, Tribander, pointed to North America. Not, not the best position, but you know, we, uh, when you're on a de-expedition, you live with what you get, okay? This to me is the embodiment of Antarctica. It is foreboding, uninviting, cold, lots of wires and guy ropes and changing antenna direction and the pitch dark with an interesting challenge. You'll notice we did not run the antennas all the way up to the top because we knew we would have to be dealing with heavy winds. Okay, there's the beverage antenna. We heard you better than you heard us. This is the 80 meter vertical. This is the Orwell Glacier, 17 meter VDA. The same 17 meter VDA from a different angle pointed towards Europe. Again, you can see why Europe had so many more QSOs on this project. This was the results of the first windstorm that came through a couple of days into into the project. This is the uh, 17 meter VDA you just saw, and this is the 80 meter antenna that snapped in two places. So the antenna team went out to uh, work on that. Oops, has the UK base back there. There it is, okay. This is Haya, DJ9 Radio Radio, who is our generator czar and uh, power distribution czar. We used uh, three six and a half kilowatt generators. Uh, we bought this cable in Punta Arenas and we built a little weather protection shed. This is a natural rock outcropping. These stones were picked up around the area and of course plywood to cover the generators. Uh, when, when we left, all of these stones were taken down and put back, maybe not in the original position, but certainly back uh, where they belong on the ground. Refueling every six to eight hours, and this was a rather nasty job because the wind was always blowing and the fuel would be spraying and these guys would come back into the radio tent uh, and you know what they had just done. You can smell the petrol. We used the same schedule on this project that we used on Ducey Island. Uh, amazingly simple. We had three teams, five, five, and four. Each team member was given uh, a choice of what they wanted to operate, and we laid that out for them. You see five members here and four here. We had seven stations, so that meant there would be some vacant stations when the teams were active. And the rule was, if you're not on the watch or you're not on that team, and there's an empty station and you want to use it, go ahead and use it. Just tell the team captain you're going to do that. But the person on the team has priority over station, band, and antenna. In other words, if you are not on that team, you come and you get what's left over. And we pretty much propagation dependent had stations going all the time. Every four days, we would shift to the next slot. So after the end of the project, you actually operated in a 24 hour cycle. You get experience propagation uh, over a 24 hour cycle over 14 days. Very simple schedule that worked great. This is uh, Walt and 6XG, W1SRD, Steve and Ken, NG2H. We had a little whiteboard back here that we kept notes on. And here you can see it says shift change on Thursday. You can hear the generators. That was our constant friend. Even in the the, 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 radio, the sleeping tent was actually uh, a little closer, so we had that noise all the time. You can see the boiler, hot water boiler, the antenna patch panels. Okay, you got the picture there. Here's another one. This one runs for about two minutes. This morning, here's our toilet. Here's my good friend Lassie. Say hi, Lassie. Hi. <laughs> this is what we had to suffer through. Oh, food. <laughs> <laughs> this is the operating tent over here. We've got the 160 antenna in the back. We've got a couple uh, 30 meter, 40 meter 
four squares up there. The wind's howling. And uh, here's our 60 meter antenna, 18 and 12, 2015 and 20 Aggies as well. It's freaking cold. Over there's our uh, inverted 40 meter antenna. But uh, just uh, probably about 25 degrees and freezing. So let me show you our sleeping tent. <coughs> This is my bunk over here. Double bunks, as you can see. And here's the operating tent. Got some ST8 operation here. Here's the master. The master blaster. Master blaster. Steve, the SSB king. <laughs> He's got so many comments okay, about what a study okay, is okay. on 20. <laughs> All the SSB bands anyway. And there's Walt over there. Walt, say hi. Hi. What are you working on, Walt? FT8. Struggling with FT8. Struggling with FT8. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what a beautiful amp. Look at this thing. Piece of work. That thing just keeps on ticking. It, it hasn't, hasn't failed. Hasn't awesome. created any problems. Yeah, it's an awesome amplifier. Yes. We should bring more of these on expert. Okay, so you saw that. And when you first went into the sleeping tent, you may have noticed Rob said, that's my bunk. If you were quick and sharp-eyed, you would see that bunk was wet. And the reason it was wet was we didn't realize these buildings, these tents would have their own weather. And a lot of condensation built up on the ceiling and dripped in very strategic places uh, like Rob's bunk. And we lost one laptop on the network desk because uh, it dripped right into the laptop. So, but fortunately we had spares. There is a beautiful picture of the Braveheart at anchor with some icebergs in the background. There's the Orwell Glacier again. We use, this is the photo we use for the QSL card. Uh, W7XU, um, Arliss and Dave, K3EO, went out on a hike one day and they, they took this beautiful photograph of Moss Lake, but they also noticed the weather was going to change. So they just stood there for a few minutes and this is what they saw. The weather came in very quickly, which reiterated our rule that no one goes out hiking alone and preferably take VHF radio with you. There's another shot of the camp. You can see way out in the distance, there is the radio tent, there is the sleeping tent, Elephant Flats, the UK base. Really cool picture. These were our neighbors. Penguins, for the most part, stayed over at the other side of the UK base and only the stragglers came over to see us. The elephant seal, this is a leopard seal. It's a killer seal. It, it, it eats smaller seals. So they're very wary of this guy. And this was out on an ice flow. This is a phenomenal picture. Well, there we are, sunrise in Antarctica. But after 14 days, everybody was tired. And uh, we would sleep wherever we can grab sleep. Skipper brought this chart over on I think a Wednesday and he said our plan is to leave on Friday but you can see this weather coming in it'll be pretty nasty so why don't you guys stay an extra day we'll leave on Saturday so we did stay that extra day we gave you guys 24 more hours of operations which meant we had to tear down and load the boat on Friday in the rain and it was really raining and windy but what the heck we were able to do it and then we left at sunup and we're able to go through the ice, field, ice fields in the daytime, which was really helpful. This was the output 
of the project, just under 84,000 queues, uh, 20,500 unique calls, and Europe got the lion's share of the QSOs, almost 53%. The regular, the, the expected uh, production bands were 40, 30, 17, and uh, uh, 20, I guess. Yeah. So you can see the numbers were pretty good. FT8 came came uh, out very nicely. When, when the sideband faded and when RIDI faded, we go to FT8. Okay. Sponsorships without without companies like Elecraft and DX Engineering and Wemo and everybody else you see here, we would have a tough time doing these projects. They either donated outright, loaned, or heavily discounted equipment for us. 57 clubs and foundations donated money to us. There were 3,600 individual donors, 103 premier donors, 200 or more. The total cost was 327,000. The total income was 171,000 US dollars and the team made up the difference. And thank you to the RSGB for being one of our sponsors and um, children, the UK DX Foundation, of course. Had a number of partners out there. And I think you all know Tim M0URX, our QSO manager. The Braveheart crew, can't do this without them. We had a pilot team set up around the world and we set, used a, um, a group's IO reflector. So people around the world could input directly to, to the pilots and they would funnel everything to Glenn and he would get it to us. I wanna thank the DX community, the RSGB, and certainly uh, my teammates for this uh, wonderful project. And uh, that's the end of my presentation at this moment. Ooh, I don't know where to start with the questions. <laughs> okay that is fantastic um the preparation that must have gone into that how, how how long were you planning all that we 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 started the project planning when nigel sent us the email that said we can do it and that would have been in january of 2019 and we had to have everything ready to put on a ship in october late october early november of 2019 so everything was compressed Normally I like 12 to 18 months, but this one we did between January for the major work between January and um, the end of October to make the, uh, the shipment. We, needed, we knew we needed at least 10 to 12 weeks to get the equipment to Chile. And I know you're a veteran of quite a few the expeditions so presumably that experience uh, counts for a lot but when you get to a place like South Orkney do you then realize oh there was something we forgot you know I don't think we had that experience we we've had quite a bit of equipment from the previous projects we knew what we missed on the last projects and um, we keep us a, uh, a supply of gear some of it at my house, some of it at a storage facility in California. So, no, I, I can't think of anything that we didn't bring on this one. We really went overboard a little bit. We brought more stuff than we needed. Yeah. And, and the cost there was $327,000, was it? Um, yes. Total cost. And yeah. uh, it looked like there was a shortfall. Somebody spoke to me in my ear, so I wasn't quite sure how you covered the shortfall. Is that, is that between you? Yeah. The team members pick up the shortfall. Yes. Plus, the challenge with any of these the expeditions is you need cash up front. You have to pay the bills before you sail. So depending on OQRS and post-project uh, donations doesn't work. So we each put up 20,000 US dollars to get the major bills out of the way. It's not for the faint-hearted, is it? Yeah, yeah. It's in, my wife calls these jeans adventures. So how many have you been on then? And does it cost you... 20 grand every time? Well, it's, I've been on five, and this was the most expensive. Usually they run between 10 and 15,000. And then the, uh, the um, travel and hotel expenses are not in the budget. Those are incremental. So each member for this project probably, when it was all said and done, had between 18 and 20,000 spent. Mm. I mean, people perhaps don't realize what goes into this i mean sometimes you see complaints on social media that certain just in the expedition they're not listening they're not, they've got no ears you know they have <laughs> no idea what is going on at your end do they you know i did a presentation in uh, a short presentation in friedrichshafen a couple of years ago and then i redid that presentation at a dx convention in seattle 
and it was the what goes on behind a veil, the recipe for a de-expedition. How do you put one of these things together and what do you need to do? Of course, it was from an American perspective, but I think most global de-expedition teams go through the same tasks. So it was interesting. People get a different view, different opinion when they see how much work actually goes on with these. Uh, you know it for two weeks. We know it for, what, 12 to 18 months. Hmm. Well, earlier in the day, we were talking to a chap who'd been on a de-expedition. The other end of the world, well, the top end of the world, you were at the bottom, oh, yeah. in, in, in the Arctic. And uh, you didn't mention that you had to take guns or uh, or dogs <laughs> to see off polar bears. And uh, <laughs> that, uh, um, But there were wild animals around you, but you were reasonably safe from those, were you? Yeah, we were. We, we've all been trained how to deal with the uh, the wildlife uh, and we know absolutely not to get near them um, keep your distance uh, a wild a, a seal bite would be devastating because there are apparently quite a bit of bacteria in their mouth and they will mm -hmm. cause an infection so we stayed clear of the the uh, wildlife but of course that's something else you've got to compare with because you had slippery rocks and snow and ice what would have happened in the case of a medical emergency we have a doctor on board. Arliss uh, W7XU is an emergency room, retired now, emergency room physician. He had a medical kit with him. Uh, the Braveheart has a fairly well-stocked dispensary. So, you know, for basic falls, slip and falls, um, uh, lacerations, uh, the docs can handle that. Yeah. And it seems you depended quite heavily on the crew of the, the Braveheart as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at the photograph, it's no secret that most of us are pretty old guys. And uh, all this heavy lifting, uh, the Braveheart crew um, pitched in and, and did most of the heavy, in fact, all of the heavy lifting. Did any of them show any signs of being interested uh, in amateur radio after all that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Probably thought you were all mad. Uh, could... yeah, there, were, there were other words they used. <laughs> Just a second, uh, Gene, because uh, Rob was trying to tell me something there and I couldn't quite hear what you were saying, Rob. Is it yeah. uh, relevant to this? Oh, yeah. Um, it reminded me that, of course, uh, towards the end of this, you would have uh, been coming home to a world um, that was shutting down from, from COVID. How, how did that affect things? When we got to Chile, back to Punta Arenas, uh, um, you know, the first thing we had to do is get the equipment off the ship and get it back to Agunsa. And, and we did that. And then we realized uh, there was a lot of uh, unrest going on in Chile at the time. And uh, airline reservations had to be changed a lot. Several of us decided to get out of there early because of the chaos uh, in, the, in the air travel system. We were getting reports of major delays and cancellations. Uh, one of the team members had planned to go to Patagonia for a camping trip, and he did. But when he came back, he found his airline reservations were canceled and had to scurry to figure out how to get back to the U.S., but um, I left two days early. Uh, I, I couldn't get out on the airline I was scheduled on. I didn't want to wait, so I just rebooked on another airline. And I got home, very uneventful trip. Were you aware while you were on the island that something was brewing? Yeah, we were. You know, we were in contact 724. We had uh, SMS capabilities through our navigation device, our personal locators. So we knew, we knew stuff was going on. But quite frankly, I didn't really want to know. We had our own challenges to deal with and worrying about what was going on back home and what we were going to be facing on the island. It, it just didn't want to do that. Well, nobody could foretell what was to come, could they really? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, just, just before we go, I see, is, is that a telescope in the background there? Uh, That's one of my uh, future hobbies. I bought that at least three or four years ago with the intentions, because I have a beautiful night sky here. There's no there's no light and i can see amazing stars and planets but that's that's for when i retire from de-expeditioning <laughs> and, and is um somebody's asking me uh, is braveheart still uh, still operating with, with no owners? it's not what uh, we know right now is braveheart was sold uh based on the information it would be moved to uh, punta arenas uh, chile or somewhere in the south south america area that's what we were told 
I don't know how true it is. Um, I don't know if it's going to happen, but at this moment, it's not available. Yeah, that question came from Martin Atherton, G3ZAY, who's a great DX over here. Well, Jean, our time is almost up. Thank you very much. It must be uh, breakfast time for you, is it? Uh, Just about, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Coming up to what, eight o'clock or something, is it? Yes, well, it is. It's great of you to have passed on your experience and uh, told us all about that and for answering all the questions. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a great rest of uh, Saturday. Perfect. Uh, Thanks. In, Thank you again. Tucson, if, Arizona. Anybody, if anyone has a question, just shoot it to me on my QRZ.com address and I'll get back to them. Good idea. Thanks a lot. Cheers, Jim. Perfect. All the best. Okay. Um, well, if you came in partway through uh, Gene's talk there, it will be available as an individual talk later in the week. Uh, all of today's streams, both streams, will actually be available later this evening when the chaps have sorted out all the technicalities. So it's almost time for our last speaker of the day. That's Bernd, DF2ZC, who's uh, sticking with the subject of uh, de-expeditions, actually, but this time on VHF and how to be successful at the other end of the pileup. Um, so we've just got time to uh, nip back to National Radio Centre at Bletley Park, see what's going on there. 0 Hello, we're still here at the uh, RSGB convention uh, coming from the National Radio Centre and all the way through the convention and a long time before we've been working with a great technical team um, from multiple locations and we're going to try and do something really stupid now. Uh, I'm going to try and interview the two guys who have been working on the technical team here at the NRC today live while we're still streaming and they're running their own interview, switching the cameras, switching the audio, what could possibly go wrong? Um, so first of all, Lawrence, uh, the, the guys are on my left here, so I'm going to look that way. Uh, but Lawrence, you've been looking at the, or looking after the video this time and getting the, uh, the video stream out to the viewers. Um, do you want to just tell us a little bit about how that's been working? Uh, yeah, well, it's a little bit unusual talking to a camera that you've actually set up, which was looking at radio operators a short while ago uh, to catch them while they're making QSOs as GB3RS or when Stuart was on as GB4RS. And now interviewing yourself feels a little bit strange. But anyway, uh, a selection of cameras running full HD uh, set up in the NRC's radio room here. Uh, those all streaming back into a Blackmagic Design ATEM video switching unit. Great bit of kit. Um, that's then streaming via a web streaming device, one of the ATEM Blackmagic streamers, uh, over 4G uh, via YouTube, back to our two studios in Cambridge and in Norfolk, uh, where our two streams then pick that feed up and take it out, mix it in with the rest of the video and feed it to the audience out there uh, on, the, on the web. So um, yeah, back to you, Steve. Yeah, it's been going fantastically well as well. So uh, thanks, Lawrence. And we've also got John here. John's been looking after the audio, not only for the microphones, like I'm mic'd up, um, but also the audio that's been coming from the radios for GB3 and GB4RS. So, John, do you want to tell us a little bit about the audio setup? 
Yeah, Steve. So um, we've been working here with um, a couple of uh, microphones for the interviews and things like that. Uh, obviously, Lauren has got one now. You've got one on you, and I've got a third one. Uh, we've also got direct audio feeds from all the radios. So we're pulling audio straight from them for both the transmit and receive audio where we can. And of course, we've got a backup feed as well from one of the SDRs just to make sure that we get some nice clean audio from everything. Uh, that's all running into a mixer desk that we've got here to the left of me. Uh, I've got all the controls over there, but uh, obviously I'm looking at the camera right now, which uh, Lawrence has set up earlier. Uh, but yeah, we're mixing it all together and then providing a single output feed over to Lawrence to add into the video stream, which then of course gets pushed to the web for everybody else. So it's a bit of a complicated setup on the input, but then when it all comes together, Lawrence gets a single feed, that goes out to everybody else, and then the world gets to see it from there. Yeah, well, it's been fantastic, as always, working with you. We couldn't do anything like we do without you and the help of all the technical team. So you know we appreciate it. It's, it's fantastic. And we always work with you at the face-to-face -face conventions as well, but that's normally just for recording video. And doing it live just add that, adds that extra level of complexity and preparation and everything. But it is hugely appreciated by ourselves at the RSGB and I'm sure by every watching the, everybody watching the convention. Thanks very much for what you do. It's great. Cheers. Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra. Golf Bravo 3, Romeo Sierra. Okay, 
uh, Golf 7, Lima Whiskey Victor. Sorry, I made a bit of a mess of that. Uh, five and five here in Blatchley Park. Uh, name here, Dan, Delta Alpha November. And we're operating for the... Well done, Dan. Um, looking over at the screen here, 40 metres is looking very lively uh, at the moment. And we'll make one more visit to the NRC in about an hour for the RSGB President's closing address. Well, welcome back to what is the final live session of the RSGB Online Convention 2021. And yes, we are still live um, and it's all been going reasonably well. And I have to say that is all down to the brilliant efforts of Rob Chifferfield, Dem Zero BFC and Dom Smith, M0 BLF who are holed up in their Cambridgeshire video den. Uh, we saw the Backroom Boys at the um, uh, NRC just now. I think if I do that, we can see what's going on there. Hello, Dom. Hello. Hello, Kim. <laughs> hello, Dom. Has it been going at your end? It's actually, touch wood, been going very, very smoothly. Uh, we had a couple of technical problems, of course, last year when we did this, but uh, this year it seems to be OK. Um, yes. Well, one of those problems was me because my uh, internet kept dropping out, didn't it? But it's all been fixed now that we've got fibre. So well done. Thanks to you and uh, thanks to you and Rob. And a quick reminder, by the way, to let us have your comments about the convention. Uh, www.rsgb.org forward slash feedback is the place to go. And while you're doing that, please do uh, subscribe. There it is. So please do subscribe to the RSGB YouTube site. OK, well, intro to Ham Radio Satellites is about to get underway. The final offering over on the Introduction 2 stream now. Our final guest is, uh, um, well, he's joining us from Germany, actually. Um, it's Welcome Bernd, DF2ZC. It's uh, great to see you. I I've been checking up on you, Bernd. Uh, you and your mate, Frank, DH7FB. Apparently you're known as the X team when you go out together on your D expeditions. Uh, and uh, in the days before the repeater was in place on the International Space Station, uh, the X team oh. found a way to bounce <laughs> signals off its solar panels, I gather. Um, in fact, I've heard them. You can actually hear some of the recordings on Bant's website. So uh, the Doppler shift must have been a nightmare trying to bounce signals off the, the solar panels. Yes, that's, that's true. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Yeah, yes. that's that's yeah. usual usual question in, in a Zoom meeting. Can you see me? Can you hear me? <laughs> very good after, very good afternoon from Germany, and uh, thank you for inviting me to give a presentation on VHF the expeditions being successful from the other end of the of the pileup. And uh, speaking of bouncing signals of the ISS, yes, well, that was one of the days where I wished I had three hands because with one hand I had to uh, uh, transmit with ECW here. With the other hand, I had to adjust the vertical rotator, the horizontal rotator. The ISS is driving very fast across me, across the QTH. And the third hand was for making good of the um, of the Doppler shift by using the, the RIT. Luckily, we were on two meters, so the Doppler shift wasn't that bad. But uh, still, it was a, a, a challenge. And uh, after some tries, we were happy we had completed this. Actually, since it's so long ago, maybe we should try it again. The ISS is still there. But uh, since then, I've only watched it uh, crossing my house uh, visually. Yes, but uh, today, we are not dealing with the ISS. We are dealing with VHFD expeditions. And uh, since this is a Zoom meeting, I'm sorry, I have to apologize in the beginning because we have no small children in our house today. So no ch small children will crash the meeting here by waving and talking to me. Um, my XYL is still at work. Um, I've switched off the doorbell and I'm even wearing a pair of trousers. So I could even stand up and nothing would happen. And uh, the only thing which would, was a bit risky is our Tomcat, who is always hungry, but uh, he's been locked out. He's outside in the garden chasing mice, I hope. Anyway, you see the uh, main reason for going on a expedition now. You see a 
pile up, which has been taken by Kilo Alpha 6 Uniform, my friend Peter in the United States, who was traveling the eastern states in July, August and in September. And uh, he was activating a number of very much uh, wanted squares. If I count correctly, I count some 20 things. 20 stations were calling him in the pileup. And uh, the main reason for going to uh, the expedition is working down the pileup, not being one of 20 or on HF being one of 120 or even more being the single one that the, the half of the world is uh, uh, shouting for. This, of course, also puts some stress on you because you always have the ambition to work every station. You assume, you rightly assume, everyone who is calling you wants a QSO with you because you mean something new to him, something special, a new square or a new DXCC. And uh, this is... Uh, to some extent scaring, this is to some extent putting stress on you, but positive stress, and you, you will really like it once you've experienced it. Um, let me say some words about myself first. I'm born 1962, so in roughly four months I will turn 60, and I'm amazed by this because uh, when I remember my father celebrated his 60th birthday, that there were all these old people around him. I can't imagine. This has obviously changed since I still feel like uh, 30 years or so. Um, I uh, passed my first license in 1976 and received the call sign Delta Delta Zero Zulu Hotel. After one year, I upgraded to Delta Fox Two Zulu Charlie by passing my CW exam. And uh, very soon I learned to love the two meter propagations. The only disadvantage, by the way, being a radio ham at such an early age is that you can't impress girls in the discotheque or in a pub by asking them, well, can I show you my QSL collection? The old fashioned way with showing the stamp collection still worked better. And so I did not meet my wife in a discotheque or in a pub. I met her in the street because I was just standing in her way. Well, sometimes strange uh, things happen. But uh, amateur radio has had an influence on all of my life. I studied electrical engineering. I graduated from Hamburg Technical University Hamburg uh, um, as a diploma engineer. Um, most of my business life, I was a senior manager with uh, Deutsche Telekom in the international department, in the business sales department, and in the whole sales department. And in that the context, I was also, I also worked three years from the UK, from 1994 to 97. We lived, um, many of the Londoners and also those who are not from London will sure know uh, where we lived. We lived next to the Katisak in Greenwich. And most importantly, we lived seven steps, I once counted this, seven steps away from the Gypsy Moth pub, which was very convenient, as you can imagine. Um, I'm also active as DARC frequency manager. So DARC, the German correspondent of the RSGB. And as I said before, my focus has always been on the axing on two meters. Why two meters is so well, in my perspective, this does not need to be everyone's perspective. In my perspective, two meters has, is so interesting with such an abundance of different propagations. Most of the time you can work stations at 300 or maybe 400 kilometers. Sometimes you can work stations 2000 or 4000 kilometers. And uh, when I met my wife, I told her, well, there will be, I will behave strangely at times when we have some, something special happening on two meters. And after the first sporadic e-opening, she said, well, I had expected it would be bad, but I did not expect it would be that bad when she had witnessed me sitting there shivering with, with excitement. And I told her, well, it is exciting if suddenly you hear a uniform Alpha 6 station 2,600 kilometers away. And even if you can work it with just 100 watts and the nine elements. Well, since 2006, um, my friend Frank and I, we form the so-called X team. Why X team? Because there are some Dutch colleagues forming the A team. So we thought we'd go to the other end of the alphabet and form the X team. That's the story behind it. And uh, if there's no Corona, um, 
pandemic, we go on a, the expedition mainly now on uh, EME two meters once a year. So last time we stayed at Golf Juliet in March 2020. And right before it was not possible to leave the UK and the Channel Islands anymore, we uh, were lucky to get back home. And uh, uh, another funny thing about uh, the axing on two meters is, I, I just forgot to mention it earlier, is uh, the tropa openings. Um, I still remember when I worked my first tropa DX to Romania back in two, 1977. It was on 14th of October. And that is the reason I will never forget my wedding anniversary, which is next week. And that's something my wife does not know. <laughs> She's still impressed by my memory. Okay, let's speak about the expeditions. What constitutes a the expedition? It's uh, very simple. What is a the expedition? It, it sounds big, but it doesn't need to be big. If you go some to some place where nobody is active, but this place is very prominent uh, uh, because it's a, a DCC that nobody has worked yet, or only few stations, or on two meters a wanted square. Of course, you can also go to an island, to a lighthouse, to a summit. But at the end of the day, that what counts most to many amateurs is the XCC or Wanted Square. You need to travel a lot on HF on two meters uh, or, or on six meters. It's not that uh, far you need to go. So the other... Uh, thing on two meter the expeditions is it's generally not a battle of materials you can very easily become qov from a wanted location without uh, having to invest too much in equipment too much in travel it could even be a a weekend project if you are married for more than 10 years you can make your wife and your family very happy when you say oh next weekend i'm going to expedi to an expedition i have to travel 200 kilometers and i will be back on sunday evening they you, you will see her eyes uh, uh, smiling and not just the eyes i think it can also be a holiday style activity you go on holiday at least uh, when our children were, were, were little, we always did this. And just by coincidence, it, we always uh, got a holiday a cottage in a square that was wanted or very close to that square uh, that was wanted. I don't know how this could happen, but so it did. What did you do you need to bring? You need to bring just a transceiver. Uh, Yagi, usually most of them take a small Yagi, nine elements, eight elements. I'm quoting nine element Yagi here because, well, the old Fox 9, Fox Tango, nine element portable Yagi is uh, very convenient if you want to go with that antenna uh, with a car. You need a sliding mast, ground socket, anchor and support ropes to fix that mast. You can do this by car, tent, or uh, even field day style that is with a generator or battery. When you look at the pictures there, you have uh, a photo of me working from JM87. JM87 Alpha or Bravo Quebec, I don't recall, but it doesn't matter anyway. Well, JM87 is a square in southern Italy where you mostly have water only. And uh, that explains why so many people are interested in working it. It's being surrounded by, by big hills and, uh, well, by coincidence, we were spending a holiday in autumn, I think some 15 years ago or 20 years ago in JM89. And one Sunday morning, I packed my ham gear into the car, drove off at 3 a.m., 250 kilometers to this place in JM87. And uh, in the dark, in the pitch dark night, I set up my station. And uh, in the morning dawn, I started to uh, operate. I would not have found this uh, location without the help of my friend Frank, who was on holiday in summer one uh, year earlier. And uh, he was driving around in that area and looking for a convenient place to become QOV. And in fact, we even worked from there on Meteor Scatter when uh, he was QOV from there two hours. So in the night, I just picked my GPS receiver. And with the help of the GPS receiver, I really found back to that place. And once again, if you look at the picture below, it has been taken in the India November 77 square in Brittany. All of 
coincidence. I can't. I only can repeat myself, uh, which is also a very much wanted uh, square. And to that square, I brought the famous nine elements. I brought the sliding mast and the, the ropes and etc. Well, you see, you don't need much and you don't even need a preamplifier, which you see here on the photo in the southern Italy. But uh, I'll get back to that later anyway. If you live in the UK, you don't have to drive to southern Italy. Certainly, it's a nice place. Uh, but in the UK, well, I would say within 200 kilometers or 300 kilometers drive, still in your own uh, country, you can uh, access quite a number of interesting DXCCs or squares. Golf Delta, Golf Juliet, and Golf Uniform always qualify for the expedition. There are some stations, permanently QRV there, but, uh, well, the demand is always that high and some people would like to work that square order that DXCC again and again. Um, you have a number of squares in the Hebrides or on the Shetland Islands. Shetlands uh, don't form uh, their own uh, DXCC, but still are very much wanted, particularly if you have access to one of the small islands around who are in India, Papa 80, for example. Um, you have uh, India Oscar 69, the Scilly Islands uh, in the southeast of Corn uh, southwest of Cornwall would work well for a family holiday. And you would make many people happy if you went there. The same applies to uh, India Oscar 65 or and even India Oscar 73. That's amazing. But well, uh, the Anglesey area, apparently there's nobody QOV or uh, uh, not on two meters. Many of my ham friends still ask me, well, have you worked in the Oscar 73 yet? And I say, no. If you, if you look at the map, you would also see India November 79, uh, which looks very rare, but it is not because Dave G7 RAU is more or less permanently QOV from there. So a lot of the people of the stations who uh, were missing India November 79. The, uh, the Lizard Point have already worked and confirmed it. And uh, if you have access to a boat, well, you should perhaps consider going to Juliet Oscar 04. It's not far from the coast, as is India Oscar 96. And uh, by the way, if anyone uh, thinks about going to India Oscar 96, please be so kind and drop me an email. It's one of the only squares in the north, southern North Sea that I still need. So I would be very happy to get uh, some reward in form of a new square. Of course, this observation is a current observation. It's subject to change in four or five years. The, the number or, or the, 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 the squares which have a huge demand can be very much different. How do you find a suitable location? It's not so easy. You can uh, easily uh, access websites which show you holiday houses, holiday cottages, but uh, you can't say, well, is this possible to uh, uh, put a, is it possible to put an antenna there? Is it in the valley? Is this on, on top of the hill? So what I always say is uh, proper preparation is key to success. It's, it's such a standard sentence, but what do I mean? If you prepare properly, and if you don't think you need to invent the wheel again, you will be more a uh, successful, more successful than um, people uh, uh, who uh, come from the other, uh, uh, from, from a different approach. Well, if you search the web, you will find a number of the expeditions, also HF ones, which have taken place in the past. So ask those the expeditioners for help, for support, for guidance. They can maybe bring you into contact with uh, people who own a house, a holiday house, with people who uh, know someone who knows someone. And at the end, it always works out fine. It also works fine uh, when they can uh, suggest to you a particular hotel or someone from the management staff, as long as they have not left uh, burnt soil behind. But uh, that's something which I generally do not expect from radio hams. Of course, um, you can always contact local hams. Uh, generally, they are very willing to support 
Some of them even rent uh, cottages or fl holiday flats, which makes uh, a lot of things much, much easier. But uh, particularly in, uh, well, uh, Mediterranean countries, or to, to uh, make it clear, in, in Rome, if you want to go to the Vatican, it's very hard. Even at the time where we had a German Pope, we sent a letter to him. And uh, I got a nice reply from his ambassador to Germany that amateur radio is not possible in the Vatican. And uh, um, you need to be very lucky to get uh, a support, support down there because I understand some people want to keep their uh, uh, exotic status of uh, being an exotic uh, DXCC and uh, radio stations in the whole world calling after them. Um, when you when it comes to uh, evaluating possible QTH, this you can also have a look at Google Maps Street View. It's so much easier nowadays compared to 20 years ago. On the internet, you have a web application called Hey WhatsApp, where you can use a path profiler, uh, show the path between two uh, locations, so you can evaluate the the takeoff, and you can also evaluate the takeoff by uh, uh, working uh, by, by using radio mobile uh, by Victor Echo 2. Mm, I don't get the exact call sign, but it's in my annex anyway, the, the web link. And with that, I've taken the example of my own QTH. With that uh, um, application, you can easily have a look at uh, 360 degrees uh, takeoff angles. And you'll see my QTH in JO30 Radio November in the southeast, some 30 kilometers southeast of Bonn. Well, I'm quite fine to 340 degrees. And the, the worst takeoff is one degree elevation to 100, 140 degrees. But uh, well, this still had no uh, negative impact, luckily. And my wife always says, and that's the third and last time I'll quote her, hopefully, we only bought this house because of amateur radio, and I have to confess she's right. Well, after the location is found, of course, you must always make sure that you have the consent of the landlord of the hotel, of the campground management, before you go. The worst that can happen is that you... Uh, um, communicate, I'm going on the expedition to this or that place, to this or that DXCC, and then you cannot be QOV because on site they tell you, no, amateur radio, we dis disapprove of this. The same applies when you go with a ship. And I think when, when REC G8VHI once traveled the, at the, the North Sea on a cruise ship some, some years ago, he was QOV with the four elements on his uh, on the balcony uh, of his uh, uh, room, and uh, I, I think he once mentioned it would nowadays would be much harder to get the permission from the cruise company or from the captain to set up even a small antenna and work with some 25 watts. That is bad because these ships uh, cross a lot of uh, very interesting squares, and once you are on the North Sea, you can still make uh, very nice QSOs, even if you run a, QRT, a QRP station only. Um, but um, as I just mentioned, if you have made a firm booking, uh, you should consider communicating your plans. The platform for the best platform for communicating VHF the expedition plans is www make more miles on VHF triple m on VHF dot de. On the other hand, if you are going somewhere for the first time, maybe you should not communicate it because well, there's so much which can go wrong, particularly if it's the first time you're going to the uh, the expedition. And of course, you don't want to run the risk of being regarded as somebody. Well, he's announcing and announcing and not delivering. But, well, you need to decide on your own. It's always a bit risky uh, uh, when you don't uh, uh, have the uh, experience. And therefore, I always suggest, well, go to, um, well, activity. I wouldn't say the expedition. Go to and make an activity just for training from a nice place at the coast or somewhere and uh, try 
to uh, note your lessons learned. Um, I've also mentioned the Wi-Fi and the phone coverage on site. Nowadays, I sometimes have the impression that without Wi-Fi access, you cannot operate any D expedition, which I don't understand. It's not true. And the best, or from in my perspective, the best D expeditions are from places where they do not have Wi-Fi coverage. Um, there is no need to be QRV on O and 4 KST chat or other chats more or less permanently. Uh, it will only distract you from operating and it will also uh, annoy you to some extent because there are some stations, please move up 10 kilohertz, uh, 10 hertz, please move down 500. I have a birdie here, I have a birdie there. Oh, I, I'm calling you now, which is already at the edge. Or I, uh, can you hear me is also already at the edge because you should not convey information to the other station uh, while you are trying to work it. So. Uh, what we now do, if we are uh, together, Frank and I, we, we have one person from time to time going to a chat saying this and that, well, we have a noise issue, or we start uh, operating at that and that time, or we terminate operations now and we'll be back in three hours, but we uh, try not to be QRV permanently on a, such a chat. It distracts, and as I said, uh, you, you waste so much time discussing with people uh, which is not necessary. Now we come to the equipment. I have already said something about the equipment. Uh, you don't need a lot to be QRV from. Today, the standard rig, standard from the perspective most people who go on two meters, the expedition use it, is the FT-857. Sadly, this uh, is no longer pro being produced, but well, you can still get it at a good price on uh, the uh, uh, ham, ham market, on the used equipment market. It weighs two kilograms and uh, weight is always the issue, particularly when you travel by plane. You need a sliding mast with n times one meter fifty. Why one meter fifty? Because as long as it does not exceed one fifty or one sixty, I don't recall exactly. I think it's even one sixty. It does not qualify for bulky baggage. So you can still take a, a golf uh, equipment uh, uh, suitcase, a golf equipment box where you can put it in, and you can also maybe. Uh, um, label it sports equipment because uh, some aircraft carriers uh, uh, charge sports equipment differently from other equipment and it is not added to your baggage allowance it depends you must you must ask uh, if you go fast uh, just for tropo or meteor scatter a nine element yagi weighing some three kilograms is okay if you go for eme well you need a little more but uh, generally you are then uh, two people anyway, and you can split it, uh, the weight. You have a switching power supply or a battery if you go by car, but beware when you go with a battery. The car battery is not the very best solution since the car battery is made for high currents at short times, but not a steady uh, 30, 40, 50% current over a long period. The second risk with the battery is well, you should always make sure that you can leave, uh, that you can switch on the car after operation, and <laughs> that you don't need to, to call the road assistance. You need an amp or you don't need an amp if you go for some tropo or little uh, uh, meteor scatter activity for by car, for example, a TS2000 with the 100 watts is fine. If you uh, want to be a little more serious, this means uh, running QSOs over longer distances or, e or even an EME try, even with a single Yagi and 1KW or 800 watts, you can run EME. Then uh, you should consider uh, going for an amplifier. Coax cable is also uh, always an issue. Uh, for example, if 25 meters has been has proved to be a good uh, distance, when you go to uh, your the expedition location, it could well be that the distance is 20 meters or 15 meters, but to our experience with 25 meters, you still have some some spare length uh, uh, that you don't uh, have to sit out in the in the in the weather and operate. But if you go for the Ecoflex 15, this is five kilograms, 0 0.8 dB. 
So you lose about 20% of the power, 0.8 dB. Or you go for Ecoflex 10, which weighs uh, only three kilograms. You lose 1.25 dB, which is third, uh, just uh, roughly one third of the power. So the difference is not that much, but if you travel by plane, it makes a huge difference whether you have two kilograms above your allowance or, uh, 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 you, or five or six kilograms. Do you need an antenna preamplifier? It depends. I would always suggest to bring one, particularly when you uh, go by car, because the antenna preamplifier does not only make good for the loss in the cable, it also reduces the system noise figure, which is usually with uh, well state of the art transceivers between six and eight dB uh, uh, down to some two dB, so uh, a six dB difference, which is huge. And then you need just a tripod fastening material, of course, laptop computer. So at the end, you easily reach 30 or 35 kilograms. And uh, if you go somewhere by plane, this can be quite costly. So what to do? We'll speak about this later. What you should do before you go to the airport or to the, to the, the expedition site is set up everything at home without time uh, stre pressure, without stress. Like my friend Erwin, uh, DK5EW, has done uh, some uh, two, two or three weeks ago. He will travel to uh, the Isle of uh, Crete on October 13th and will stay there two weeks, uh, being QOV on two meters meteor scatter and also on EME. And by coincidence, he, is not, uh, he has not chosen a holiday location in the main square, Kilomike 25, no, Kilomike 15, which is much more needed. And what he did, he set up all the antennas, uh, the antenna equipment at home in his garden, or well, this even doesn't look like a garden, it's more like somewhere in the field. He checked it, it all worked, and then he put it back in the box, being sure he did not uh, leave anything behind everything was working, so he brings a working and complete uh, setup to Greece. And that's what I would always suggest, because the biggest fear, at least for us, is always, did we leave something behind? Did we forget something? Uh, you could be somewhere in a remote place, and uh, you could perhaps not become QOV because some connector, some cable or something which is worth five pounds sterling or even, even less is missing. And if you are in the middle of nowhere, well, there is no amateur radio shop around the corner or no uh, other radio hams who could help out. So this is always a nightmare, but so far we have always, uh, uh, no, not quite always. Once we had to buy some tools in Luxembourg, I think, but uh, in the uh, places where we had no access to DIY markets, we have always had a complete uh, setup of equipment with us. The same also applies to the indoor setup. Here you can see this was after a de-expedition. Even after a de-expedition, I still take a list of all the cables and connections we, we had. This is the complete indoor setup of the X team, except for the uh, switched uh, power supply, which is not on the picture. And so I stood there and took a note, well, laptop computer connection, laptop to USB, uh, access box, uh, mouse, uh, uh, 230 volts cable from our small amp. This Typhon 1000 amp, by the way, is, let me just have a look, it's roughly 27 times 30 times 11 centimeters. So it weighs only five and a half to six kilogram roughly. So this is a transistor amp running 800 to 1000 watts, and it even fits in a, in a suitcase. It's not big. When I remember in the old days when you had to bring a tube uh, amplifier, when we were QOV from IS Zero Land, uh, Frank and I brought one of my tube amplifiers weighing 45 kilograms. So <laughs> this always was the equivalent of one person sitting in the front of the car. So it's amazing what is possible today. And even if you have already a list of equipment, you should still check it after uh, you are ready with a working system. And what you should also not forget, you see here on the on the table, uh, is a, a a clock that you are not always dependent on the internet uh, uh, clock because sometimes you don't have uh, internet access. The other thing is 
you should take a note of every thought. When you are on the, the expedition side, there is so much coming into your mind. Oh, we should have had brought this. Oh, we should have brought th that. Oh, we should have developed this. So every new thought, every wish, or any idea concerning improvement. For example, when uh, Frank, DH7FB and I were uh, working from Sugar Victor 9, Alpha November Juliet, uh, um, we developed the uh, uh, scheme for a switching box between vertical and horizontal polarization right there. Well, in some, you, you, you don't always work on the band. So sometimes you, you just sit, drink beer or what, whatsoever. And we were sitting there and uh, Frank was uh, developing the uh, idea how to switch safely between hurt vertical and horizontal polarization, how to avoid hot switching, etc., etc. Until then, we were only working EME uh, with a single polarization with horizontal. And since then, we were uh, running with uh, x pulse, which is very beneficial. But once again, this is nothing you need to have at the start. You can start small. You don't need to start at the very best uh, or the, the optimum uh, uh, setup, which you will never reach anyway. Checklists. Personally, I'm always a friend of checklists because also checklists help you forget something at home. Well, this is all in German. It's also not necessary to translate uh, word by word. But when I just start uh, station setup, Typhoon amplifier, you need the power cord. You need the cable from the amplifier to the power meter. Uh, actually, you don't need a power meter. If you want to reduce weight, you can go also without power meter. You, you better bring a, a antenna analyzer, which is much more helpful when you think you have a problem with the antenna. The cable from the uh, amplifier to the transceiver. Here's an, a note, still at my home station, so I still need to take it away from the home station. 1KW uh, hit, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, such a checklist is always a living organism, so it can always be improved. For example, um, once we had uh, it improved when we rented a house in Echo Alpha 9, which only had one bedroom. And uh, the lesson learned was go with earplugs. We both need some, not, not ju just me or not just Frank. We both need some earplugs, not only because uh, we also had the station set up uh, in, the, in that room, it was a combined uh, living room and sleeping room, but also well, sometimes at night, uh, apparently both of us made uh, strange noises. Um, some people call it snoring, I don't know. I do not snore, at least that's what I say. My wife has a different opinion on this. And uh, also, well, how tweezers. I think tweezers is also something you should always bring. And you only miss it when you need it on site and you, don't, uh, you can't get hold of it. This is a photograph of my suitcase. Uh, I think it was in, at Delta 44 Tango uniform. The uh, headline is preparing for the airport. When you prepare for the airport, of course, the best thing is you need an info paper to put it into the suitcase. Here you have an info paper, which explains this is amateur radio equipment. It's a, a, my name, my address is on it, my then uh, mobile telephone number just in case the people at the airport open the suitcase and think, hmm, so many cables, so strange stuff, strange, what, what is that? Are those, uh, are, is this a terrorist person? Therefore, I put this in. I also put in a copy of my license. And so far, it has never, ever anything happened. And I, I was aware, because you, you know, Sometimes, well, the cable is uh, on the other end of the uh, uh, suitcase. Yeah, so you can see they had opened it and they looked at it. And when traveling to a Delta Four country, we even put it also in a Portuguese language in, and it was no problem. Generally, at the airport, you are always a bit scared when you come with equipment that the staff at the airport at the security check don't always see, but never ever has this been a problem? Of course, you sometimes need to explain what is this, what is that, but never ever has this been a problem. The only thing I once experienced was a swipe for explosives, but this can also happen when you go there with your laptop computer. 
and uh, what uh, uh, else? Oh, yeah, uh, this is my only suitcase, by the way. You, you don't see much more than amateur radio equipment. And one rule for going on the expeditions is, well, equipment is always, has always priority. And uh, a, a second T-shirt or third T-shirt has only second priority. I was tempted to say here, well, one set of underwear is okay for a week, but no, a, a little, it should be a little more. But what I want to say is, okay, you must, uh, concern, you must uh, uh, concentrate on the really necessary things. And if you exceed the limit of uh, weight, well, I have a jacket with 10 put, uh, pockets and uh, you can put in a lot of heavy uh, antenna, uh, heavy uh, adapters or other things that don't qualify as a weapon in that uh, as long as it's in the jacket, it does not uh, go into the weight balance. The problem is if you have a jacket with 10 pockets and you need something particular, you can, if you're unlucky, you can search a, a long time until you find it. The other thing is that uh, I, I wrote, be kind at check-in. Well, that's a general rule. Um, if you are kind to people they who are in charge of something, they are much more eager to go to their limits when it comes, for example, to weight. If you have a weight allowance of 23 kilograms and you come with 25 kilograms and you are friendly to the person at the check-in, that person is much more willing to uh, accept the 25 kilograms without sending you to pay for excess uh, baggage. But that's a rule which uh, applies to everything in the life. If you come there with your with a stiff upper nose and your nose up, uh, upper lip and your nose up here, you will not be so successful. Sensitive things go to carry on luggage, uh, which I uh, what I wrote here, which means, well, I always brought my FT857 in the carry on luggage because it's also easier to explain what this is. And uh, uh, sometimes I have the impression if there's a microphone on a piece of equipment, it's much easier for the security staff to understand than if they have, for example, only a, 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 a antenna amplifier. This picture shows what is possible. You see our setup uh, in spring, in March 2020, the antenna set up in, uh, uh, in Jersey. You can see the shack in Jersey. That is the complete EME setup. And this all goes into one suitcase, one golf bag or fishing bag, one, uh, no, two uh, back uh, packs and uh, another uh, uh, back plus my pilot's case. That's all. Except for, of course, when we were in, uh, uh, Ju in, in Golf Juliet in Jer on Jersey, well, then we were coming by car and we could afford the luxury of bringing a rotor. You don't need a rotor if you go somewhere. You can easily work without a rotor. Uh, a rotator. When you look at the moon, it's hidden behind the tree on that picture. This is also a lesson learned. Uh, 10 years ago in 2010, we had already worked EME successfully from that place. But uh, well, in 10 years, a tree can, cry, uh, can, can grow quite a lot. So in 2010, we had no problems with the tree blocking the direction to the moon at the moon set. But, uh, well, this year it was different. And, of course, we had much more noise this year, sadly. But that's also a general development. Therefore, I would um, like to say maybe better than bringing a preamplifier is also, or at least the same value of a preamplifier has a, a filter. Um, in the first week of September, I was QRV in a Kilo Nancy 55 with some friends in Ukraine. And... Uh, this was in the middle of nowhere, but we still had some noise issue. We later found out it came from a lighthouse in 500 meters distance, which, which had some, um, some uh, how, how to say, some uh, sun uh, collectors uh, on, and apparently they were not uh, mounted properly. So this caused a huge uh, noise rise at uh, moon rise, but then, a filter would not have helped since it was white noise. Uh, 
if you are uh, in a place where you have a local transmitter TV or radio close by, then a filter at the input of the receiver would perhaps help you um, minimizing or maximizing your uh, um, uh, receiving uh, cap capability. So organizing, also one of the catchwords when it comes to the expeditions. If you are on your own, it's simple, you do all the work, just like Kilo Alpha 6 uniform, he is on his own, he has his setup in his car, and he his uh, indoor setup and his antennas, he only needs some 30 minutes, uh, but of course not the first time, the first time he needs some 60 to 90 minutes, but well, you are getting uh, used to it, you're getting trained, you see potential of uh, improvement, and now he can set it up in 90 minutes. Usually you put rocks on the bottom of the, of the uh, tripod, but uh, if you have three buckets of water and have water uh, close by, you, uh, this would work uh, almost as well. With teams of two, it's very simple. You should discuss before you go and you should make clear uh, the responsibilities with the DH7 FB we uh, always uh, have split it between indoor uh, and outdoor setup. I do the indoor setup, Frank does the outdoor setup. Sometimes you have an argument with one another and it gets loud, uh, but uh, which always, which, which also led uh, to one of our tenants saying, are you sure you are friends with one another? Yes, we are, but sometimes it gets loud, but it's still, still fine. And most importantly, if everyone has finished his part, the other one needs to control this. Because, well, we have an internal uh, uh, thing, which we call Zulu Bravo 2 mode, ZB2 mode. Frank, I know, is listening. We always said we will not communicate this, but, well, uh, it's nothing where you need to feel ashamed. Zulu Bravo 2 mode is what we once experienced when we were QRV from Gibraltar. And we connected the amplifier. We noticed the amplifier was switching, but no power was going out. What was the reason? Input and output of the amplifier had been swapped, and I confess it was my fault. Uh, if we had uh, checked uh, crosswise, it would have perhaps not have happened. But what was the reason? When you arrive at a location for the expedition, you often uh, want to start setting up very quickly. With big teams, it's much more difficult. You need a detailed task list uh, because um, when you have a group of 10, you can not everyone can work at every place at the same time. On the other hand, nobody wants to stand around and give the impression I'm not doing work and the, I let the others do work. So you need to have a big list who is in charge of this antenna, who is in charge of the 70 centimeter antenna, who builds up inside, who builds uh, up the power, the, 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 the mass, et cetera, et cetera. Before you start operating, um, well, you need to find out about north, sea, uh, south, east, and west, so that you know where you have to point your antenna to. Best is, of course, with beacons. You know your location, you know the location of the beacon, you can calculate the direction of the beacon, and you can uh, uh, then know, well, if the beacon direction is 270 degrees, you know, okay, when I point the antenna to there, it's 270 degrees, you uh, know the other direction is 90 degrees and so on. And uh, if you don't have beacons available, well, today you have so many applications on the mobile phones, you can just calculate where is the sun and you know the shadow line of the mast is the direction of the sun plus 180 degrees and you can still work out the north, south, east, west. Then you go uh, put some sticks and stones to these directions that you always know where the uh, north and south, etc. is. Uh, double check, I already mentioned. I've marked red one thing, uh, one very important thing. Always find out about location of electrical fuses box before you start transmitting. It's not so good uh, if you run with a torch in the dark looking in the house that you don't know where they have hidden the electrical fuses when one fuse went off because maybe uh, you, draw, you drew too much uh, current. What is possible with just a simple setup displays my, a photograph of the antenna of my friend Yuri, Uniform Tango 1, Fox Road, Germany. He made uh, many meteor scatter QSOs with just 100 watts or less at the antenna, which is a five element Yagi. 
even at the distance of 2000, 2100 kilometers, which once more uh, confirms if you start your first year expedition, you don't need to go with a big antenna, even a four elements Yagi would qualify. When operating, and now I'm uh, close to the end, when operating, always write down the details of the QSO in the very moment you make the QSO, not, ah, I have something else to do, I will write down later on. No, you are tending, you, you sure will forget to write it down. And it's much more effort than uh, later working out who did you work when and when. Therefore, a paper notebook is always fine. If you run WSJT modes, please set save all and more importantly, store all data on a second storage medium. Why? Well, we, Frank and I, have bad experience from our Stain Sugar Victor 9. We were stolen. Uh, the uh, Someone had stolen our uh, laptop computer, my, my old uh, netbook and my old uh, tablet. If I hadn't stored all data on an SD card, we would have lost all data. Why do I mention take photographs? always consider writing a report about this. The people at your local club at, uh, uh, are very happy for a presentation. The people of the, for example, RSGB magazine, magazine will also be very happy for a presentation on your experience. But because nothing is so much liked when reading is experience of others, what they have achieved. After the fun comes the QSL card. I can uh, uh, go through this very quickly. Uh, it's always a question of uh, money. When you have made 50 QSOs, it does not, uh, it, it, it's too expensive to have QSL cards printed. I do this by drafting a PowerPoint slide with all the QSL designs, just like those you see here. I have uh, printed, uh, I have it saved as JPG and have it printed as a postcard size photograph, which a 10, 10 centimeter size photograph costs roughly 10, 15 uh, euro cent or the equivalent in pound sterling. On my website, you can download uh, a, a, at the DXPD, Side, you can download a PowerPoint uh, presentation with just one of those QSL cards, and if you want to, you can uh, append it to your the, uh, the, uh, to your needs. What I also want to quote is: Don't fear or don't be afraid of asking for support. When you look at the Sugar Victor Nine card, you see we were being supported by Beko, by UKW, UKW Berichte, by SSB Electronic. Well, in our team, I'm always the person who writes the begging letters, but it's quite successful. Some companies, some ham radio uh, stuff companies are very willing to support. SSB provided the phasing lines for free. UKW Berichte charged us only one antenna, uh, one, two and nine SSB instead of two. And Beko had a 1KW amp on his uh, um, costs shipped to Sugar Victor 9 and also collected from there. If you want to find out more, feel invited to send me an email. I can also provide you with contact details of uh, stations or of, of uh, uh, holiday house owners in Golf Delta, Golf Juliet, Golf Uniform, or in Delta Four, or in Charlie Uniform, or other places. On my website, you can see, you can download the monthly EME newsletter where I'm notoriously late. So when uh, I'm finished today, I will, Today and tomorrow finish the um, October version. On QRZ.com and on his blog page, I would strongly recommend reading the experience of uh, Kilo Alpha 6 uniform. He has also quoted uh, a lot of uh, um, information about his setup and his experience with different, different setups. XTM DSP is our own website, a very basic one. And the last two uh, links are uh, the radio mobile, which is free software, and the path profiler, which is a, a web uh, uh, application. When you want to go for the expedition, don't plan, just do it. And as I always said, um, you don't need to be perfect. Just go and uh, pick an antenna and a transceiver and a stick and uh, go somewhere. Uh, and it doesn't even need to be a, a much wanted square if you just want to evaluate your setup. But I warn you, no, come on, you could become addicted. Once you started, well, you, 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 you're hooked and you cannot uh, stop it so easily. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I'm a 10 minutes uh, 
above my time uh, uh, allocation, but I think uh, I, I, I still uh, made it quite interesting for you. And now I'm looking forward to questions from your side. Well, unfortunately, uh, Bent, those 10 minutes have used up the uh, question time. We have, <laughs> we have to go very quickly now to the uh, National Radio Centre for the uh, closing uh, words from the President. But thank you. It was fascinating. And uh, we, we started off by talking about the International Space Station and I've just had a, an alert and I've no reason to doubt this, that at 12.14 BST on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, the International Space Station will be having a um, contact with uh, a school for deaf children at Newbury in Berkshire. That's this Tuesday at 12.14 BST. Ben, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your evening uh, over there. Um, it's early evening in the UK now. We'll be uh, closing down and uh, uh, handing over to the NRC. But thank you very much for all your questions, your comments and your feedback through the day. Uh, there's still time. If you haven't fed back, go to RSGB org slash feedback and a reminder that today's online convention streams will be available in their entirety later this evening individual talks will start appearing in due course so to formally close the rsgb online convention for 2021 we're returning to bletchley park to hear shortly from the rsgb president stuart bryant g3 ysx from me dom and rob goodbye and 73 Romeo Sierra calling CQ on by. This is Oscar Echo 8, Mike for Kilo. Oscar Echo 8, Mike Oscar Kilo, good afternoon, uh, 59011. CQ for the man, uh, my call is Oscar Echo 8. Yeah, Oscar Echo 8, Mike Oscar Kilo, 59011. Oscar Echo 8, go again please. Oscar Echo 8, Mike Wolf Kilo is my colleague. Good evening. So it falls upon me to draw a to draw the proceedings today to a close. This is the close of the RSGB 2021, its second virtual uh, online convention. And I hope that you have all enjoyed the talks and the activities that we have put on today. Some statistics. So far, there have been at least three and a half thousand views online of our activities. That is as many as we had last year and hopefully when the final numbers come in, we will do even better. So thank you to everyone who has watched. I know that we've had radio amateurs from Los Angeles, Louisiana, Malaga, South Africa, India, uh, Slovenia, New Zealand, uh, the, the Australia, and of course, all parts of the United Kingdom join us today. So thank you very much for, enjoy, for joining us and I hope you've had uh, a good time. Certainly, if you have suggestions for future um, talks, then we would be really interested to hear them. We have, of course, also been incorporating on-air activity with the convention. So GB4RS, its first outing for quite some time, the president's uh, call sign, has had about 190 contacts today. Of these, uh, roughly nine were on Q0100, and these are genuine first unique um, uh, contacts. This is the first time that it would have been possible for that call sign to operate on that satellite. So thank you very much to the nine people who um, uh, taught this beginner uh, how to use Q0100, the first time I have ever used it myself. GB3RS, the uh, normal call sign for the convention centre, the National um, Radio Centre, has, ha has been busy also with several hundred uh, contacts to here. We've had approximately 450 visitors to the, um, to the uh, NRC today, and we've engaged those in the proceedings. We've been showing them what we've been doing, and uh, we've interviewed a few of them, and uh, hopefully you saw some of those interviews earlier the day. It falls upon me to give many, many thanks to the presenters, 
to the technical teams in Cambridge, in Norwich and here, who put a huge amount of effort in, uh, to making this work behind the scenes. The staff of the RSGB have been busy moderating and spent hours and hours putting this presentation um, together and putting this, uh, this convention together. So thank them and th also thank the volunteers uh, of the, at the NRC, not only for their normal day-to-day -day work, but for the extra work they put in this weekend to make this so successful. Uh, lots of people have told me on air that they enjoyed the talks. So as I was working the, the 190 contacts, many people said that they had popped away from looking at the technical um, lectures and the other uh, lectures to come and uh, work the uh, work the centre, work the um, the um, NRC. Particular thanks go to Professor Catherine Mitchell, M0 IG, IBG, um, who. Uh, gave us a talk about the importance of mixing amateur radio with uh, mainstream uh, science uh, and engineering. And that's something, as, as you may gather from the introductory chat I had with the general manager, that is particularly dear to me. I think there is much to be said for, move, for, for, a lap, for putting together amateur radio with the professional scientists and engineers. I'd like to talk to you about the construction competition. Construction is a really important part of amateur radio. Um, it is in addition to operating. There's space for people to operate, there's space for people to do all the traditional things, but construction and technology, I, I have a particular place in my, uh, in my heart. Um, you will have had uh, RADCOM appear on your mats, uh, either already or just about to appear, and it's got details of the construction competition this year. It's going to be an online event like it was uh, last year and that's really important because it allows many, many people to engage in it. So please, as you go over, uh, uh, as you get into the cold winter uh, months, think about building something and submitting it to the construction competition. Um, that will be judged um, in time for the, uh, the, the awards, the winners, to be announced at the, um, at the RSGB AGM in April. Uh, you'll note, by the way, that I'm looking for someone to chair the, uh, the judging panel. I've done it for the last eight years, and I think this year it should be someone else. So um, if, you, uh, if you would like to help there, please let me know. Um, next, um, so it now falls upon me um, to announce a, uh, a, the winner of an important RSGB trophy. This is the Rotab Trophy, and it is awarded each year for outstanding DX work. And this year, the winner is Chris Tran, GM3WOJ, who I had the pleasure of working earlier today on 40 meters under my president's call sign. So Chris, congratulations, and I look forward to shaking your hand uh, when we meet face to face at um, some DX convention soon. Finally, um, we need to talk about next year. So next year, we hope, will be a hybrid event, a mixed event of people present at the convention wherever uh, we manage to hold it face to face so that we can uh, meet each other and say hello to old friends and new friends as we have in previous years. But it's important, three and a half thousand people watching online, we cannot possibly ignore. And so next year, we hope to stream some, most of the events out so that people can join us remotely if that is where they're able to, uh, any way they're able to watch it, or uh, join us face to face um, to all of the really lively convention activities. So um, that really um, brings it to an end. I will say one more thing, that if you uh, want your uh, fix of watching RSGB streamed video, then the Tonight at 8 series continues to run. We are planning it for the next season, and we're always interested in suggestions as to what we might put into the proceedings. So, um, that's it for this year. I've really enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have enjoyed it. Many, many thanks to all who put it uh, together. And I look forward to seeing you next year. So it's 73s from GB4RS. <laughs>